Blackstone Publishing presents The Death of Hitler's War Machine The Final Destruction of the Wehrmacht by Samuel W. Mitchum, Jr. This book is read by Grover Gardner. Introduction The purpose of this book is to write the military history of Nazi Germany from the latter part of 1944 until May 23, 1945, the period in which Hitler's empire was finally and totally destroyed. From June 6, 1944 until early September 1944, Hitler's Wehrmacht was smashed on both the eastern and western fronts. It nevertheless made a desperate last stand and checked the Anglo-American armies in a series of battles along the Siegfried Line while simultaneously administering a stinging defeat to the British Army at the Battle of Arnhem. At the same time, it almost miraculously created an entire new Panzer Army, which it unleashed in the Ardennes on December 16, 1944. It was Germany's last chance offensive, and it gave the Americans in particular some very bad moments. On the Eastern Front, the main focus was on Poland and Hungary. In August 1944, Romania defected from the Axis and Germany lost most of its Sixth and Eighth Armies. Hungary was wavering and in September was invaded by the Soviet Union. Against seemingly overwhelming odds, Hitler's generals desperately tried to prevent the collapse of their southern flank. That they succeeded was one of the minor miracles of the war. This is where our story begins. Since 1960, there have arisen in the Western world what might be termed social military historians. They deal with war from a sociological, or in some cases pseudo-sociological, point of view, without discussing battles and campaigns, which are dismissed with a wave of the hand if they are mentioned at all. I believe war has its sociological and philosophical elements, but it also involves strategy, operations, and tactics, as well as logistics, training, the inclination of a people to wage war, and the warrior himself, be he general or private. In other words, this book will follow a more nuts-and-bolts approach, in which strategy, battles, and campaigns are emphasized, rather than sociological motivations. I wish to thank all those who helped in the researching, writing, and producing of this book, especially my wife Donna. Thanks also go to the archivists and other employees at the National Archives, Washington, D.C., the Bundesarchive, the War College, the Center of Military History, and the Imperial War Museum, as well as the late Friedrich von Stauffenberg and anyone else who shared information, advice, photographs, or memoirs with me. Dr. Samuel W. Mitchum, Jr., Monroe, Louisiana, February 2020. Chapter 1. Setting the Stage the Nazis came to power on January 30, 1933. At that time, Germany lived under the restrictions imposed by the Treaty of Versailles, which ended World War I. Its military force, the Reichswehr or armed forces, was limited to 115,000 men, 100,000 in the army, Reichsheer, and 15,000 in the navy, Reichsmarine, which left Germany unable to defend itself or threaten its neighbors. Adolf Hitler changed all that, and he had an excellent foundation upon which to build. The notoriously efficient general staff was officially abolished in 1919, but its de facto replacement, the Truppenamt, Troop Office, secretly continued to train top-level general staff officers. Germany also continued to maintain its Wehrkreise, sometimes spelled Wehrkreisen, or German military districts, which were the heart of the German army. Each Wehrkreis was a core-level territorial command responsible for recruiting, 
mobilization, supply, administration, logistical support, and all military political and military civilian matters within its area. After Hitler renounced the Treaty of Versailles, the Wehrkreise were responsible for implementing conscription for the German army. When the war began in September 1939, they were placed under the Home Army, also known as the Replacement Army. Their field components were designated Corps headquarters and sent to combat zones. Their territorial elements remained in Germany, where older officers, often extremely capable administrators, focused on keeping the badly outnumbered German army well-trained and in the field for the duration of the war. Initially, there were seven Wehrkreise. By 1939, there were 15, numbered 1 through 13, and 17 and 18. Later, Wehrkreise 20, 21, and General Gouvernement were added to the occupied territories. They never approached the importance of the earlier German Wehrkreise. In February 1938, Hitler set up the machinery for running his war. It consisted of the high command of the armed forces, Oberkommando der Wehrmacht, or OKW, the high command of the army, Oberkommando des Heeres, or OKH, the high command of the Luftwaffe, Oberkommando der Luftwaffe, or OKL, and the high command of the navy, Oberkommando der Kriegsmarine, or OKM. The military SS, Waffen SS, was also important by 1944, but its combat divisions remained under the operational control of the army, and there was never an Oberkommando der Waffen SS per se. OKW was headed by Colonel General, later Field Marshal, Wilhelm Keitel, whom Hitler once declared had the brains of a cinema usher. That was precisely what Hitler wanted a mindless yes-man who would relay his orders to the forces without too much thought. Keitel initially tried to establish an actual high command, but OKL and OKM refused to cooperate with him, and Hitler, who practiced the political principle of divide and rule, was fine with that. By 1941, an unofficial dual command of the German ground forces had evolved. OKH directed the Eastern Front, OKW directed everything else. The real military brains at OKW was its chief of operations, Colonel General Albert Jodl. He often suppressed his intelligence and knowledge, however, to remain loyal to the Fuhrer. The chief of OKH was Field Marshal Walter von Brauchitsch. He had made a deal with Hitler in 1938. Ralkich was allowed to quietly divorce his wife and marry his mistress. The wife was paid off with Nazi party funds. In exchange, Braukich accepted the new command structure with the Army High Command subordinate to OKW, that is, Hitler. As part of the bargain, he also forced 19 senior generals into retirement and transferred other anti-Nazi or non-Nazi sympathizers to less important posts. In this manner, the Fuhrer basically gained control of the army. Needless to say, he did not have much respect for Braukitsch. When the German offensive of 1941 stalled in front of Moscow, Hitler blamed Braukitsch for it and sacked him on December 19, 1941. The Fuhrer then appointed himself head of OKH and commander-in-chief of the army. OKH was directed by the chief of general staff, although Hitler interfered with its operations on a daily basis. OKL was directed by Hermann Göring, a former World War I flying ace and an early Nazi. He had some military talent, but not much. By 1944, he was in deep disgrace for his mishandling of the Luftwaffe. Grand Admiral Karl Dönitz was the commander-in-chief of the Navy, OKM. He experienced less interference than any of the other service heads. Hitler, a former corporal, was less inclined to interfere in naval matters about which he knew nothing. Dönitz was also a loyal Nazi supporter, so Hitler generally left him alone. 
After rebuilding the German Wehrmacht, armed forces, and winning a series of bloodless victories, Adolf Hitler ignited World War II by invading Poland on September 1, 1939. At first, there were only victories. The Wehrmacht overran Poland, Denmark, Norway, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Belgium, France, Yugoslavia, Greece, Crete, and most of North Africa. Only over the skies of Great Britain were the Germans checked, and that was a close-run thing. The war reached a turning point on June 22, 1941, when Germany invaded the Soviet Union. Although it won some spectacular victories, the Wehrmacht could not conquer Stalin's empire. The German armies were severely damaged in the Soviet winter offensive of 1941-42 and suffered decisive defeats at Stalingrad, 1942-43, and Kursk, 1943. Meanwhile, the United Kingdom recovered and defeated the Africa Corps in Egypt and Tunisia. The United States entered the war following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. The Western Allies destroyed two German armies in Tunisia, May 1943, defeated the German U-boats in the Battle of the Atlantic, May 1943, conquered Sicily, July 1943, and invaded Italy, knocking her out of the war, September 1943. By the spring of 1944, the Allies had defeated the Luftwaffe over the skies of France and Germany and were reducing the cities of the Third Reich to rubble. The stage was set for another decisive battle, the invasion of Western Europe. In late 1943, the war was going badly for Nazi Germany, but an unbiased observer could still come up with a plausible scenario in which the Third Reich could, if not win the war, at least survive it. This strategy was adopted de facto by the German high command and by the German people, simply because it was based on common sense. It would involve, one, delaying the Red Army and avoiding defeat in the East, two, obstructing the Anglo-Americans in Italy and holding them south of Rome, and three, defeating the Allied D-Day invasion. If Germany could repulse the British-American cross-channel invasion, the Allies would not be able to mount another one for a year. This would free more than 30 divisions for employment in the East, including Germany's entire armored strategic reserve in the West. These forces amounted to 10 Panzer and SS Panzer divisions. With such a powerful command, Germany could conceivably force Stalin back to the negotiating table. He had already shown a willingness to negotiate behind the backs of his Anglo-American partners in 1943, but these talks broke down because Hitler had insisted upon territorial concessions. Stalin might have changed his mind in 1944 if the cross-channel invasion had failed. It is even possible that Hitler might have mitigated his demands in 1944, though this is much less likely. In any case, German scientists would have been given another year to perfect Hitler's wonder weapons, new and improved tanks, anti-tank weapons, U-boats, and jet airplanes. We know that the improved U-boats could have reopened the Battle of the Atlantic, and the jets, in sufficient numbers, would have fundamentally shifted the air war in Germany's favor. It is even conceivable that German scientists might have invented a workable atomic bomb, though this too seems less likely. It is reasonably certain, however, that a few hundred jet fighters would have swept the Royal and U.S. Air Forces from the skies, and the new U-boats would likely have reimposed an economic blockade on the United Kingdom. At that point, anything would have been possible. But Germany was able to do none of the three things mentioned above. Rome fell on June 4, 1944, and the Allies landed in Normandy on June 6. By mid-June, Anglo-Americans had a secure foothold in Europe and were reinforcing it at an incredible rate. The German Mobile Strategic Reserve was committed to battle in Normandy, where it was being ground to bits. The German field commander, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, 
was able to check the Anglo-Americans but not defeat them in the hedgerow country of Normandy. The Desert Fox begged Hitler for infantry divisions, but Hitler would only send him Panzer and SS Panzer divisions. By the time the Allies finally broke out of the hedgerow country at the end of July 1944, the German Panzer divisions had lost more than 80% of their armor. Normandy was excellent terrain for infantry. Most of the rest of France was exceptionally good terrain for armor. When the Allies broke out of Normandy, Hitler had little left with which to defend France but non-motorized infantry. These forces, called marching infantry by the Germans, were quickly swamped by the highly mobile British and American forces, especially those under the command of General Patton. The war was going so badly for the Third Reich that a segment of the German officer corps, led by Colonel Count Klaus von Stauffenberg, the chief of staff of the replacement army, launched a coup against the Nazi government on July 20th, 1944. Although Hitler was wounded in an assassination attempt, the plot failed, and Stauffenberg and several hundred others paid for the failure with their lives. Colonel General Friedrich Fromm, the commander-in-chief of the Home Army, was fired on July 21st and replaced by Reichsfuhrer SS Heinrich Himmler. So the army came even more under the control of the Nazis, and Hitler's already rampant paranoia grew by leaps and bounds. Fromm was eventually executed for cowardice. Once Stalin was sure the Panzer divisions were committed in the West, he launched Operation Bagration, a massive offensive in White Russia, on June 22nd. By the beginning of August, he had virtually destroyed the German Army Group Center. The German Army was being pushed back on all active fronts with no prospect of reversing the situation. By this time, there was little hope for the Third Reich. August 1944 was the month of victory for the Allied armies. The German Army Group B, 5th Panzer and 7th Armies, was largely destroyed in the Falaise sector, and the British advance cut off the 15th Army in the coastal sectors of France and the Low Countries. The other German armies in France, 1st and 19th, were reduced to remnants by the Allied invasion of southern France. The headquarters, 1st Parachute Army, was also in the west, but it was nothing but a training command at this time. The Allies seemed on the verge of crossing into Germany and seizing the Ruhr industrial area without which the Third Reich could not wage war. There was widespread talk among the Allies of ending the war by Christmas. The Allies' strategy of isolating the Normandy battlefield by destroying the French highway and rail networks was a good one. However, it proved to be a double-edged sword. The Allies were unable to supply all their divisions and maintain their momentum. Meanwhile, the German army rallied. The Anglo-Americans were engaged in what they later called pursuit thinking. They were, however, facing an opponent who had a remarkable talent for staging swift recoveries. The German Lancer, the companion in misfortune to the English Tommy and American G.I., had not lost his will to resist and was on the fringe of his own territory, which further encouraged him to hold on. Montgomery came up with a rather brilliant but risky plan to finish off the German Wehrmacht. Dubbed Operation Market Garden, it called for the Allies to lay down an airborne carpet and seize the bridge at Arnhem. It failed, mainly because luck was on the side of the Germans during the Battle of Arnhem. Market Garden depended upon the Germans reacting with average speed. The British did not know that Field Marshal Walter Model, the new commander-in-chief of Army Group B, had established his headquarters only two miles from the easternmost British drop zone. He reacted with lightning speed, far more quickly than the Allies anticipated, and wiped out the Allied airborne bridgehead at Arnhem. Because Modell was a Nazi sympathizer, Western historians tend not to give him credit for the German victory at Arnhem. While it is true that Modell almost certainly would have been hanged as a war criminal, and deservedly so, had he not committed suicide in 1945, 
He was primarily responsible for checking Montgomery at Arnhem and deserves credit for it. While Montgomery and his generals were trying to bounce the Rhine, they failed to finish off the 15th Army. On September 4th, 1944, when the British captured Antwerp, the 15th Army had only one escape route left, and it was unguarded and within 15 miles of the spearheads of the British Guards Armored Division. The British, however, were engaged in pursuit thinking and did not cut off the 15th Army or clear the Scheldt River when it was theirs for the taking. By the time they decided to turn their attention to the west, three weeks later, it was too late. Antwerp, located 70 miles up the Scheldt River, is one of the best ports in the world, and the British had captured it intact. Not even its giant cranes were destroyed. That port alone could supply all of Eisenhower's divisions. Without control of the Scheldt, however, it was utterly useless, a fact that the German general staff grasped several weeks before Eisenhower and Montgomery. In September, the Germans reinforced their positions along the Scheldt, and it would take the British and Canadians months to clear them. Meanwhile, in early September 1944, Hitler had one of his flashes of military inspiration. He would check the Allies at the Siegfried Line, hold the Scheldt, and marshal his reserves for a major offensive through the Ardennes to Antwerp, with the objective of destroying Montgomery's armies and much of the U.S. First Army. Such a decisive blow might end the war in Germany's favor. In August 1944, as the Wehrmacht streamed back to the German border, the Home Army, Ersatzheer, known as the Replacement Army, faced the task of reforming smashed divisions and creating new ones. They no longer had the manpower or equipment to create the standard Type 1939 units or even the Type 1944 divisions, which were reduced in size. So they began turning out Volksgrenadier, People's Infantry Divisions. The 1939 Infantry Division consisted of three infantry regiments, a reconnaissance battalion, three companies, an artillery regiment, three medium artillery battalions of a dozen 105mm guns each, one heavy artillery battalion of nine 150mm guns, and a motorized forward observer battalion, Beobachtungsabteilung, an anti-tank battalion, four companies, an engineer battalion, three companies and a bridging column, a signal battalion, a field replacement battalion, and assorted service support elements, including medical, ambulance, workshop, anti-aircraft, veterinary, military police, bakery, and other units. Each infantry regiment had three battalions, an infantry gun company, and an anti-tank, Panzerabwehr company. In all, the standard authorized strength of an infantry division in 1939 was 17,734. The Volksgrenadier Division was much smaller. It included three grenadier regiments of two battalions each. The regiment also had an infantry gun company, equipped with a dozen 75mm guns, and a tank destroyer, Panzerzerstörer Company, giving the division six infantry battalions as opposed to the nine of most earlier infantry divisions. Its artillery regiment was also smaller. Most artillery regiments in Volksgrenadier divisions had two medium battalions instead of three, and each battalion had two gun batteries instead of three. Both the Type 39 and Volksgrenadier battalions had a staff battery. The Volksgrenadier unit also had a fusilier company instead of a reconnaissance battalion, and it was usually mounted on bicycles instead of trucks or armored reconnaissance vehicles. The anti-tank, signal, and other units were also smaller. A Volksgrenadier division could theoretically be produced from scratch in three months, but this process was often speeded up, and a decent division could be put together in eight weeks. A battered and depleted veteran infantry division could be ready for action as a Volksgrenadier division in six weeks. 
The People's Infantry Divisions were well equipped with automatic weapons, shoulder-fired anti-tank weapons, and mortars, but they lacked motorized vehicles, horses, and heavy equipment, including artillery, assault guns, and crew-served heavy machine guns. Almost all of them suffered from equipment deficiencies, many lacked trained personnel, and their effectiveness was mostly as defensive units. The theoretical strength of a Volksgrenadier division was around 11,250 men, but most of them weighed in well short of this figure. Some of them were barely half that, even before they met the enemy. To compensate for a lack of manpower, the Home Army relied on increasing the number of automatic weapons given to the troops. Each grenadier company contained three platoons, one equipped with Mauser rifles and two with machine pistols. The Maschinenpistol of 44, MP44, was gas-operated and fired a short 7.92 by 33 mm Kurtz cartridge. It was excellent close up, but its maximum effective range was only 400 meters when in single shot mode, and only 150 meters at full automatic. It featured a curved 30 round magazine. Adolf Hitler initially opposed the serial production of this weapon because he believed it would lead to a wasteful expenditure of ammunition. Some major manufacturers produced them anyway. Hitler reportedly discovered this during an inspection tour that fall. He was so impressed by the weapon that he ignored the fact that the manufacturers had disobeyed his orders and made only one alteration to the weapon. He changed its name to Sturmgewehr 44, STG 44. The trademark weapon of the Volksgrenadier and the entire Wehrmacht in late 1944 was the Panzerfaust. It was a shoulder-fired, single-shot, disposable anti-tank weapon. It weighed about 11 pounds and could penetrate any tank armor. Many new recruits and home guard, Volkssturm troops, were issued Panzerfaust as their only weapon. After they fired it, they were unarmed on a battlefield, which prompted some German generals to jokingly recommend using the disposable firing tube as a club. Another relatively new, deadly weapon then in mass production and issued to both the new and veteran divisions was the Panzerschreck anti-tank gun. It was an enlarged copy of the American bazooka and it fired a deadly 88 mm rocket. From July to September 1944, the Home Army and its subordinate Wehrkreise, military districts, cranked out or were in the process of completing the formation of 82 Volksgrenadier Divisions and one Volkssturm, People's Storm Division. This was the equivalent of around 10 armies. Chapter 2 Defeat in the Ardennes On December 16, 1944, Hitler launched the Battle of the Bulge and caught the Western Allies, especially the Americans, flat-footed. The U.S. Army was staggered, but it was not the knockout blow upon which Hitler was counting. By December 20th, the veteran 2nd Panzer Division had, as usual, outdistanced every other unit and gone to the forefront of the German Army, just as it had during the Battle of Moscow three years before. After winning a vicious little battle at Novi, it had pushed on to the Urt River and seized a bridgehead at Urtuvi. Fuel shortages and troop exhaustion kept it stalled on December 21st, but early on December 22nd, it started moving again, driving north toward Namur. Led by Colonel Meinrat von Lauchert, it continued heading for the Meuse, pressing through a seven-mile gap between the U.S. 84th Infantry Division at Marsh to the north and the U.S. 335th Infantry Regiment at Rochefort to the south. General of Panzer Troops Baron Hasso von Manteuffel, the commander of the 5th Panzer Army, of which the division was a part, energetically did what he could to support his spearhead. He ordered Lieutenant General Fritz Beyerlein, the commander of the Panzerlehr Division, 
to capture Rochefort in order to widen the gap, and commanded Major General Siegfried Waldenburg's 116th Panzer Division to siege Marsh for the same reason. Meanwhile, the 2nd Panzer Reconnaissance Battalion of the 2nd Panzer Division pushed to within four miles of the Meuse River. There it ran into increasingly heavy resistance from the American armored cavalry, so Lauchert ordered a halt. Part of the division was at Foix Notre Dame, and the rest was between Cell and Conjou. More than 40% of the division would be killed within the next 72 hours. On December 23rd, Bayerlein attacked Rochefort but could not clear it until the following day. At the same time, Waldenburg's division was stopped cold near Marsh, and the leading elements of the 2nd Panzer were running into American armor at Foix Notre Dame. General of Panzer troops Baron Heinrich von Lütwitz asked Manteuffel to withdraw the division, but Manteuffel, knowing what Hitler's reaction would be, refused. By the end of the day on December 24th, the 2nd Panzer Division was increasingly isolated, practically out of gas, and in a situation even more serious than Lauckert realized. At Avalanche, just ten miles north of his division, lay Major General Ernest N. Harmon's fresh U.S. 2nd Armored Division. Belgian civilians informed the aggressive American commander that the Panzers were out of fuel. At eight o'clock on Christmas morning, Combat Command B, CCB, of the U.S. 2nd Armored Division struck southwest to Sell, intent on destroying the German tank concentration at the western tip of the bulge. He was joined in this effort by the British 29th Armored Brigade. At the same time, Combat Command A of the U.S. 2nd Armored Division drove southeast toward Rochefort, to stop any further German units from advancing toward the Meuse and perhaps rescuing the 2nd Panzer Division. The slaughter lasted three days. 2nd Panzer was pounded by colossal artillery concentrations and attacked repeatedly by rocket-firing British typhoons and American fighter bombers, not to mention American tanks. To the east, Panzerlehr was unable to fight its way through Combat Command A and swarms of typhoons and yabos, as the Germans called Allied fighter bombers, while the 116th Panzer Division suffered heavy losses in failed attempts to break through the U.S. 84th Infantry Division. Meanwhile, at Celle and Foix Notre Dame, the 2nd Panzer Division was annihilated. The 304th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, the 2nd Division 3rd Panzer Regiment, the 74th Panzer Artillery Regiment, and two-thirds of the 273rd Panzer Anti-Aircraft Battalion were wiped out. About 2,500 German soldiers were killed or wounded, and 1,200 more were captured. Some 82 tanks, 81 artillery pieces, and 450 trucks and other motorized vehicles were lost in the carnage. At the same time, less than two miles to the northeast, the British 29th Armored Brigade and the U.S. 82nd Reconnaissance Battalion struck the 2nd Panzer Reconnaissance Battalion at Foix Notre Dame. It was also destroyed. From the main body of the 2nd Panzer Division, only about 600 men, led by the indomitable Major Ernst von Kochenhausen, managed to break out of the pocket and eventually reach German lines, on foot. Not a single vehicle or tank escaped the American encirclement. Colonel von Lauckert did escape, but he no longer had a division to command. After Sell, all roads led backward for the German army in the west. Clearing the Bulge With the destruction of the 2nd Panzer Division, Hitler's last great offensive in the West failed. The Fuhrer, as usual, refused to recognize this fact. He ordered that Bastogne be captured at all costs, despite the fact that Lt. Gen. George S. Patton, Jr., the commander of the U.S. 3rd Army, had attacked from the south, pushed through the German 7th Army, established a corridor to the town on December 26th, and reinforced it. 
On December 28th, the 26th Folks Grenadier Division, the Fuhrer Beglight Brigade, and the 115th and 901st Panzer Grenadier Regiments attacked Bastogne. Before the day was out, the 1st SS Panzer Division, the 3rd Panzer Grenadier Division, just released from OKW Reserve, and the Fuhrer Grenadier Brigade began arriving in the Bastogne sector. Patton reinforced the garrison with the U.S. 6th Armored Division, and Eisenhower released the U.S. 87th Infantry and 11th Armored Divisions from Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force, Shafe, Reserve, and committed them to the Battle of Bastogne. Before the siege was over, the 9th and 12th SS Panzer and the 340th and 167th Folks Grenadier Divisions also joined the fighting, but they could neither cut the corridor nor take the town. On December 30th, the newly arrived U.S. 87th Infantry and 11th Armored joined the battle and ran straight into an attack by the veteran, but depleted and exhausted, Panzerlehr and 26th Folks Grenadier, west of Bastogne. At the same time, the 1st SS Panzer and 167th Folks Grenadier Divisions struck the U.S. 35th and 26th Infantry Divisions, which were supported by elements of the U.S. 4th Armored. They were beaten back thanks in large part to the efforts of the Allied fighter bombers. Nazi Germany lost another 55 tanks that day, plus hundreds of men it could no longer replace. The German divisions in the bulge were now used up formations without any hope of trained replacements, the 26th Folks Grenadier, for example, had lost about three quarters of its authorized strength and numbered fewer than 2,000 combat effectives. And the Allies were coming after them. Eisenhower assigned the fresh and exceptionally well trained U.S. 17th Airborne Division to Patton on December 25th. And after being delayed by weather, it was able to reinforce the Bastogne Corridor by the end of the year. Like a gambler who does not know when to quit, Hitler committed the last of General of Fighter Pilots Adolf Gallant's fighter reserve to the battle early on the morning of New Year's Day, 1945. Flying at treetop level, all available units attacked Allied ground targets and airfields in the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg. The Germans destroyed or severely damaged 800 Allied airplanes, most of them on the ground, but lost 150 themselves, as well as some of the Luftwaffe's best surviving pilots. With their vast reserves of air power, the Allies could absorb the blow, but Germany could not. The Luftwaffe received its death blow in the Ardennes, Gallant said later. On January 3, 1945, the U.S. First Army launched a major offensive from the north into the bulge. The attack was spearheaded by Lieutenant General J. Lawton Collins's U.S. 7th Corps, which included four divisions, two of them armored, a hundred thousand men in all. SS Colonel General Zepp Dietrich's 6th Panzer Army met the attack, with Colonel Rudolf Langhäuser's 12th Folks Grenadier Division, Major General Rudolf Bader's 560th Folks Grenadier Division, and SS Lieutenant General Heinz Lammerding's 2nd SS Panzer Division, a formidable force on paper. Actually, the 560th Folks Grenadier Division had only 2,500 men remaining, and the 2nd SS Panzer Division had only 6,000. All totaled, the forces facing Collins numbered fewer than 15,000 men. The entire Ardennes sector was controlled by Field Marshal Walter Model's Army Group B, which directed the 6th Panzer, 5th Panzer, and 7th Armies, north to south respectively. Since his attention was focused on Bastogne, this offensive took Model by surprise. The following day, Hitler ordered Dietrich reinforced, but the American advance was slowed as much by the terrain and the freezing cold weather as by the Germans, though they resisted fiercely. The winter of 1944-45 was one of the coldest on record. Baron Hasso von Manteuffel was ready to retreat, 
but the tough, profane, and hard-drinking modal would not hear of it. On January 2, 1945, he ordered SS General Hermann Price's 1st SS Panzer Corps to attack Bostonia again on January 3rd, this time with the 9th SS Panzer Division, most of the 340th Volksgrenadier Division, and part of the 12th SS Panzer Division, Hitler Jugend. SS Major General Sylvester Stadler, the commander of the 9th SS, however, refused to attack in daylight hours because of the Yabos. Modal insisted. The result was a screaming contest. Remarkably enough, Stadler won. The field marshal stalked off in a rage, but the SS Gruppenführer got his way. The officers present were amazed that Modal did not relieve Stadler of his command on the spot. Price's attack achieved little. On January 4th, the Germans finally admitted defeat and went over to the defensive. To the north, the U.S. 18th Airborne Corps joined the offensive, and village after village fell to the Americans. On January 7th, the critical Barak de Freture crossroads, Parker's crossroads, was lost, and the German generals were acutely concerned that the U.S. 1st and 3rd Armies might soon link up and sever the bulge near its base, trapping much of the 5th and 6th Panzer armies. Even Hitler recognized the danger. On January 8th, he gave Modell a rare authorization to withdraw. The next day, the Fuhrer tacitly admitted defeat by ordering Dietrich's 6th Panzer army out of the Ardennes. He also issued an order to withdraw the General of Waffen-SS Willy Bietrich's 2nd SS Panzer Corps including the 1st SS, 2nd SS, 9th SS, and 12th SS Panzer Divisions, plus the two Führer Brigades and two Werfer, rocket launcher brigades, to the rear of Army Group G for rehabilitation. Hitler was not the only one to recognize that the German armies in the Ardennes were defeated. George S. Patton realized it, too. On January 9th, he struck the 5th Panzer Army with a massive offensive, employing all eight of his available divisions in the attack. Again, German resistance was determined and American progress was slow. A gain of two miles a day was considered a good advance. But the German soldiers were no longer fighting for victory or for a cause they believed in. They were fighting desperately just to keep their escape routes open. Hasso von Manteuffel and Zepp Dietrich extricated their forces as rapidly as they could, but not as quickly as they would have liked. The lack of fuel, the yabos, and the constant rearguard actions delayed them considerably. They nevertheless managed to get almost all their formations out of the trap before General Courtney Hodge's First Army and General Patton's Third Army linked up at Ufalese on January 16th. By this time, the German officers were facing a heretofore almost unheard of difficulty, low troop morale. It had occasionally surfaced in green, hastily formed units, but now it was affecting the veteran divisions as well. Physical and mental exhaustion set in. To make matters worse, OKW had to reduce their rations. Because most units needed every man, home leaves were cut, causing further drops in morale. Mail services were thoroughly disrupted, and the lack of news from home caused consequent mental anguish. When letters did arrive, the news they contained was usually bad. Leaves to East Prussia and some of the other frontier provinces were no longer allowed. They were in the combat zone. Those who got leaves often wished they had not. They spent much of their time searching for their families and relatives who were evacuated from bombed-out cities. Many men had the heartbreaking experience of returning home only to find their neighborhoods reduced to fields of ruin and their homes destroyed. Others, unable to find their loved ones, spent their furloughs in the local barracks. By now, John Eisenhower wrote, the German troops were tired from long commitments without breaks. Replacements were of low quality and lacked training. Forces were poorly supplied, 
and rations were being cut. The news from the Eastern Front and home had reached them. The American forces were far superior on the ground, and every clear day Allied planes were supreme in the skies. After the high hopes at the beginning of the offensive, failure now stared every soldier in the face. Not even the SS divisions fought with their previous Elan. The 12th SS Panzer Division Hitler Youth is a good example. Arguably, no division on either side fought as well as it did during the Normandy campaign, but it was smashed in the process. The replacements it received were mainly former Luftwaffe ground crewmen and excess naval personnel, and all too few of the young volunteers who had been its trademark a year before. The 12th SS Panzer Division was no longer an elite unit. It had suffered too many casualties and accepted too many inferior replacements. In the Battle of the Bulge, 9,870 of its men were captured, including 328 officers and 1,698 NCOs. Such a statistic would have been unheard of even six months before. On January 14th, Hitler announced his decision to transfer Dietrich's 6th Panzer Army from the Western Front to the East. He was planning yet another offensive, this one in Hungary. The following day, he gave Field Marshal Gert von Rundstedt, the Western Commander-in-Chief, O.B. West, permission to withdraw the German forces in the Ardennes salient back as far east as Chirin, seven miles northeast of Ufalese. It was January 22nd, however, before the 6th Panzer Army could completely extricate itself from the Ardennes. It handed over its few units remaining in the bulge to Monteufel. The next day, Sunday, January 23rd, the U.S. 7th Armored Division retook Saint-Vite. Only three houses in the town were still inhabitable. The Battle of the Bulge was over. During the Ardennes Offensive, the American forces suffered 80,987 casualties, including 10,276 killed, 47,493 wounded, and 23,218 missing. German losses are not known so precisely. German sources place their casualties at more than 76,000 men as a minimum figure. Most Western sources generally estimate German casualties at 103,000. They also lost 600 tanks and assault guns. The American victory in the Ardennes offensive was not tactically decisive. When the battle ended, both sides were back roughly where they started. But psychologically, it was. As General von Manteuffel pointed out, for a while, the spirit of duty, self-sacrifice, and comradeship made it possible to carry on. But then the will to resist finally collapsed. Helplessly, the man at the front was forced to recognize that the superiority of the enemy on land, in the air, and at sea was now so great that there was no longer any chance whatever of putting up a successful resistance. As the Allies approached the borders of the Reich, the Home Army also churned out new panzer divisions. In terms of size, they did not resemble the original panzer divisions of 1935. When Germany invaded Poland on September 1, 1939, the German army had seven panzer divisions. The first panzer, 309 tanks. The second panzer, 322 tanks. The third panzer, 391 tanks. The fourth panzer, 341 tanks. The fifth panzer, 335 tanks. The tenth panzer, 150 tanks. And the ad hoc, Panzer Division Kempf, 164 tanks. Except for Panzer Division Kempf, they had an authorized strength of more than 17,000 men. From that point, they were steadily downgraded in strength to produce more tank and motorized infantry divisions. By 1944, the Type 44 had an authorized strength of fewer than 12,000 men and 168 tanks. 
Most of them had about half that many or fewer. After the Battle of the Bulge, the replacement army created the Type 45 Panzer Division. It had three regiments, a Panzer Regiment, a Panzer Grenadier Regiment, and a Panzer Artillery Regiment. The Tank Regiment consisted of a staff and staff company, a Panzer Battalion, and a Panzer Grenadier Battalion. It had an authorized strength of 54 tanks, a far cry from the force that so confidently overran Poland and Western Europe in 1939 and 1940. Some of the divisions did not even have that. These new divisions also had fewer than half the mobile infantrymen as their predecessors. Their tanks, especially the Panthers, Panzerkampfwagen 5 or PZKW 5, and Tigers, Panzerkampfwagen 6 or PZKW 6, were considerably better than the 1939 tanks. On the other hand, the enemy's tanks were also much improved, although they were generally inferior to both the Panther and the Tiger. Chapter 3 Operation North Wind and the Battle of the Colmar Pocket As strange as it may seem, the Battle of the Bulge only whetted Hitler's appetite for further attacks. The Americans, he told his generals, had been forced to withdraw something like 50% of the forces from their other sectors to save their divisions in the Ardennes. Therefore, he declared, their line in Alsace must be extraordinarily thin, and there we shall find a situation which we could not wish to be better. Near the end of December 1944, he ordered an entire new offensive to be made ready in the south. Its objectives would be to capture the Severn Gap, cut the U.S. 7th Army in two, and destroy half of it in the strasbourg beach Lauterburg Triangle. The Allies were in fact vulnerable in Alsace, but Hitler picked the wrong man to command the offensive when he named Reichsfuhrer SS Heinrich Himmler commander-in-chief of the newly created OB Upper Rhine, Oberbefehlshaber Oberrhein, also called Army Group Upper Rhine. Why was Himmler appointed to the Army Group command? Heinz Guderian and SS Colonel General Paul Hauser said that Martin Bormann, Hitler's secretary and the chief of the Nazi party, arranged Himmler's appointment in order to ruin him, or more accurately, to help him ruin himself. Others thought Hitler was letting his generals know that he could get along without them. Both are probably right. To Himmler, on the other hand, it represented the achievement of one of his military ambitions, and he had been lobbying Hitler for such an appointment for months. On December 10th, the Fuhrer gave it to him. As he took up his position, Himmler began organizing two new corps in his sector, the 14th SS and the 18th SS. They were led respectively by the heroes of the Warsaw Uprising, Police General Erich von dem Bokselewski, and Police Lieutenant General Heinz Friedrich Reinefart. It included frontier guards, battalions of Eastern and German workers, Volkssturm, police, and other miscellaneous units. The only unit in OB Oberrhein with any muscle, however, was the 19th Army. The 19th was well led by General of Infantry Friedrich Wiese who exhibited considerable skill in extracting it from the south of France in August and September 1944. After his army lost the Bedford Gap and Strasbourg to the Anglo-French forces in November, Visa fell back a short distance to positions along the Rhine River, where his forces linked up with Hans von Obstfelder's First Army to the north. From north to south, Visa deployed Lieutenant General Helmut Tum's 64th Corps, two static infantry divisions, and two assault gun brigades, Lieutenant General Werner von Ermannsdorf's 90th Corps, two infantry divisions, and Lieutenant General Erich Abraham's 63rd Corps, 106th Panzer Brigade Feldherrnhalle, 
and five infantry divisions. All of these units were badly under strength, and many of the infantry divisions had only two infantry regiments. In addition, they were short on artillery, ammunition, and equipment of every kind. Even so, Heinrich Himmler was soon looking for an excuse to assume the offensive. There was, after all, no glory in holding a quiet sector with a ragtag collection of units. Himmler's murderous tendencies disguised that he was basically a colorless technocrat with little military training and no combat experience. He joined the Imperial Army in 1918, at the age of 18, but never rose beyond the rank of Fahnenjunker, officer cadet, and could not abide the sight of blood. As a commander-in-chief, he set up his headquarters near the former tourist resort of Treberg in the Black Forest, where he kept his special train near a railroad tunnel in case of air raids. Here he held dinners as if he were on peacetime maneuvers and bothered Visa and his corps and divisional commanders with trifles. According to Rundstedt's chief of staff, General Westphal, Himmler issued a deluge of absolutely puerile orders. He was hag-ridden by a pathological distrust and never hesitated to saddle army officers with the blame for his own impractical schemes. Among the officers sacked by Himmler was Friedrich Wiese, who was relieved of his command on December 15, 1944, and never re-employed. Wiese was replaced by Siegfried Rasp, an officer who had been promoted to general of infantry only two weeks before. Rasp was a surprise choice. He was known to have a drinking problem and had never commanded a corps, much less an army. But he led the 3rd Mountain Division, the 335th Infantry Division, and Elite 78th Assault Division on the Eastern Front with considerable success, sober or not. A surprise choice is not necessarily a bad one, as Rasp was to prove in the weeks ahead. Visa's capable chief of staff, Walter Butch, was also transferred to Führer Reserve, that is, without an assignment, on January 1, 1945, despite the fact that he had been promoted to lieutenant general only four months before. Butch had been chief of staff of the army since it was created, and no one knew more about the strengths and limitations of the 19th than did he. Yet he was relieved the very day a major offensive began, not exactly a recommended procedure for a successful army group commander. General Westphal also charged that Himmler was wasteful of the supplies sent to him and was in any case receiving greater quantities than were allotted to other sections of the front because, otherwise, it was feared he would ring up Hitler and have all munitions trains diverted to his sector. Yet he fired off every shell that was sent to him and then simply asked for more. It is almost superfluous to mention that Himmler never visited the front himself, but issued his orders from the safety of the rear. Himmler's chief of staff, SS Major General Werner Ostendorf, an East Prussian who served in the Reichsheer and the Luftwaffe before joining the Waffen-SS in 1935, partially made up for the deficiencies of his commander-in-chief. Himmler got his chance to launch his offensive during the latter stages of the Battle of the Bulge, when Field Marshal von Rundstedt tried to obtain Hitler's permission to launch a diversionary attack south toward the Moder, using the 10th SS Panzer Division. The Reichsfuhrer SS seized upon this request to persuade the Fuhrer to expand the diversion into a major offensive against the 1st French Army aimed at recapturing Strasbourg and Alsace. It was codenamed Operation Nordwind, North Wind, and was under the general command of Himmler himself. The northern wing of the attack, against the right flank of the U.S. 7th Army, came under the direction of General of Infantry Hans von Obstfelder's 1st Army, which was part of Colonel General Johannes Blaskowitz's Army Group G. The operation was indeed a rushed affair, 
In fact, due to the sorry state of the heavily bombed German transportation system, three of the main divisions earmarked for the attack, the 10th SS Panzer, 6th SS Mountain, and 7th Parachute, had not arrived when the offensive began. Operation Northwind began on New Year's Eve night, when Blaskowitz attacked the U.S. 7th Army's 79th Infantry, 12th Armored, and 36th Infantry Divisions, with the 36th Volksgrenadier, 47th Volksgrenadier, 1st Parachute, 21st Panzer, 25th Panzer Grenadier, and 17th SS Panzer Grenadier Divisions. SS Colonel Hans Lingner's 17th SS Division, which spearheaded the attack, was specially reinforced with the 653rd Heavy Panzerjäger Anti-Tank Battalion, which was equipped with 20 Jagdtigern and two companies of special flame-throwing assault guns. The Jagdtiger was armed with very heavy 128mm main battle guns mounted on a Panther chassis, and was perhaps the best anti-tank assault weapon produced in the Second World War. Unfortunately for Nazi Germany, it was only just now going into series production, and only 400 were ever manufactured. They operated very effectively in Operation North Wind, however, and the Germans were soon pushing the Americans back through the Agno Forest in the direction of the Moder River. Several American units were overrun, and the U.S. 70th Infantry Division suffered especially heavy losses. We feasted on captured U.S. rations, resupplying our losses in clothing and taking American rifles to supplement our weapons, one SS man recalled. We were astonished to see how well American soldiers lived. U.S. Lieutenant General Jacob L. Devers, the commander of the Allied Sixth Army Group, was a good commander, and his troops were not taken by surprise. Unlike in the Ardennes, the American retreat was an orderly one. Devers nevertheless considered Strasbourg as good as lost, and on the afternoon of January 1st, 1945, he telephoned Eisenhower to ask permission to fall back to the eastern slopes of the Vosges Mountains and to the Belfort Gap, abandoning the plain of Alsace. Eisenhower approved, but General Charles de Gaulle, who was now Premier of France, strongly objected and ordered General Jean de Latre de Tassigny, the commander of the French First Army, to defend Strasbourg to the utmost, even if the Americans withdrew toward the Vosges. He did not intend to risk subjecting the 150,000 inhabitants of Strasbourg to Nazi reprisals. General de Latre also had no intention of abandoning Strasbourg. During the night of January 2nd to 3rd, he reinforced the city with the 3rd Algerian Division a solid unit under the command of General Augustin Léon Guillaume. The following night, Eisenhower yielded to political considerations and instructed Devers not to fall back beyond the Moder. The U.S. Sixth Corps was digging in at the Agno Forest, north of this river, on January 5th, when Rasp's 19th Army suddenly went over to the offensive to the southeast. General Toombs 64th Corps attacked across the Rhine at the junction of the American and French armies, and the 553rd Volksgrenadier Division soon had a sizable bridgehead over the Rhine at Gamsheim, north of Strasbourg. Meanwhile, Abraham's 63rd Corps, spearheaded by the 198th Infantry Division and the 106th Panzer Brigade Feldherrnhalle, attacked the 1st French Army south of Strasbourg and pushed the 1st Free French Division northward between the Ile River and the Rhone-Rhine Canal in the direction of the city. The situation became critical for the 1st French Army as the 553rd Volksgrenadier captured the village of Kilstedt, 20 miles north of Strasbourg, while the Feldherrnhalle, and the 198th Infantry attacked out of the northern edge of the Colmar perimeter and drove as far as the Erstein Heights, less than 13 miles south of Strasbourg, and Ermansdorf's 
90th Corps threatened to take the city by frontal assault. During the blizzard on January 4th, the 17th SS struck at the junction of the U.S. 44th and 100th Infantry Divisions, using captured Sherman tanks at the point of their assault. They captured the village of Gros Redeshing before the Americans rallied and contained the assault. Fortunately for the Allies, the U.S. 6th Corps was able to hold most of its positions north of the Moder, while Himmler wasted the strength of his divisions in a series of uncoordinated piecemeal attacks. To the north, Blaskowitz's Army Group G fared little better. Despite continuing his attack for days, he was unable to break the American line north of the Moder. SS Colonel Lingner, the commander of the 17th SS Panzer Grenadier, was captured by the U.S. 44th Infantry Division on January 9th. He was replaced by SS Colonel Fritz Klingenberg. On January 13th, Blaskowitz tried again. The 10th SS Panzer, 25th Panzer Grenadier, and 7th Parachute Divisions struck the newly arrived U.S. 12th Armored Division in the Agano sector, while Himmler struck out of the Gamsheim bridgehead with the 553rd Volksgrenadier and 21st Panzer Divisions. The corrupt and incompetent Lieutenant General Edgar Feuchtinger, who had commanded the 21st Panzer since the summer of 1943, was at last arrested for dereliction of duty in late December 1944 and replaced by Major General Werner Marx, a brutal Nazi. Despite repeated Yabo strikes, the Germans were able to knock out 70 American tanks in a single day and virtually wiped out the U.S. 43rd Tank Battalion. Devers, commander of the Allied 6th Army Group, and Lieutenant General Sandy Patch, the commander of the U.S. 7th Army, fell back to the motor on January 21st and reinforced their sagging front with three fresh American infantry divisions. Here they made their last stand and brought the German offensive to a halt. Blaskowitz continued to attack until January 25th, but was not able to break the American line. Meanwhile, to the south, Himmler pushed to within eight miles of Strasbourg, but failed to dislodge the French First Army, which tenaciously defended the capital of Alsace. For the Wehrmacht, Operation North Wind was an expensive failure and Helmut Thum, the commander of the 64th Corps, was made the scapegoat. He was relieved of his command on January 20th, less than three weeks after he had been promoted to General of Infantry, and never re-employed. Himmler was not long for the Western Front. On January 21st, despite his failure in the West, he was promoted to Commander-in-Chief of Army Group Vistula on the Eastern Front, where his task was defending Berlin from the Russians. He was replaced as commander-in-chief of Army Group Upper Rhine by SS Colonel General Paul Hauser, who had just recovered from the wounds he suffered in Normandy. The next day, however, Army Group Ober Rhine was dissolved and its units were absorbed by Army Group G, which was now also commanded by Hauser. Its former commander-in-chief, Colonel General Blaskowitz, was on his way to Holland to replace Colonel General Kurt Student, an officer in whom the Fuhrer had little confidence, as commander-in-chief of Army Group H, which was activated on November 11, 1944. Under Hitler, it seemed at times as if the Wehrmacht was playing a game called Musical Commanders. The dance would get even faster in the next four months. The Battle of the Colmar Pocket Insofar as possible, General Eisenhower wanted to eliminate all German strong points west of the Rhine before crossing that river in strength. The largest position was the German 19th Army's zone south of Strasbourg in the area known as the Colmar Pocket. Eisenhower reinforced the French First Army with two of his best American divisions, as well as the fresh but inexperienced 12th Armored Division. De Gaulle also reinforced De Latre with the French 2nd Armored Division under General Philippe Leclerc. 
This gave Delatra a strength of twelve divisions, four of which were armored. General Rasp faced them with seven infantry divisions, none of which had 7,000 men, and the depleted 106th Panzer Brigade, which had only four companies of tanks at its maximum strength. Unlike Himmler, Rasp suffered a severe supply shortage, and as of the eighth day of the battle, he was strictly limiting his artillery gunners to 15 105 mm shells per gun per day, while his heavy batteries were limited to a dozen 150 mm shells per gun per day. On the other side of the line, Delatra protested when he was limited to 120 105 mm shells and 90 155 mm shells per gun per day. For the main attack, Delatra concentrated four divisions along a 14 mile front between Tan and the Nunenbruck Forest on the southern side of the pocket. His advance began at 7 a.m. on January 20th, but the drive progressed slowly because of tough German resistance, well-positioned minefields, and snowstorms that eliminated Allied air support and limited the visibility of artillery battalion forward observers. Despite continued snowstorms on January 21st and 22nd, the French attack made progress. General of Infantry Eric Abraham launched a counterattack with his 63rd Corps on January 22nd, and in the muddy terrain, the German Panther tanks and newly manufactured Jagdpanther and Nashorn tank destroyers outmaneuvered the French Shermans and M10 tank destroyers because the German armor had wider tracks. In addition, the German PZKV-5s, Panthers, and tank destroyers were equipped with long-range 88mm guns, which blew apart the American-made Shermans before they could even get within range of the Panthers. Émile Betoir's 1st French Corps suffered severe casualties, and on January 22nd, Betoir wanted to call off the offensive. Latre ordered him to continue the attack. The next day, he threw General de Montsabert's 2nd French Corps, U.S. 3rd Infantry and 1st Free French Divisions into the battle on the northern face of the pocket. The Anglo-French offensive gained ground at first, but Lieutenant General Max Grimeis counterattacked with his 64th Corps reserves and prevented de Montsabert from outflanking Colmar to the north. As the Allies slugged their way forward through the snow, their overwhelming numerical superiority finally began to tell. Hitler, however, would not authorize a general withdrawal, so the battle continued in the increasingly constricted pocket. Meanwhile, at Delatre's request, Devers sent him the U.S. 21st Corps and the fresh U.S. 75th Infantry Division. On January 30th, the Allies fired 16,438 105mm and 155mm shells in support of the U.S. 3rd Infantry, which managed to cross the Colmar Canal. The U.S. 28th Infantry then pushed into the suburbs of Colmar, where Major General Norman D. Cota halted and diplomatically gave the honor of liberating the city to elements of the French 5th Armored. The U.S. 1st Armored Division was then thrown into the pursuit and, on February 5th, linked up with the French 1st Corps at Rufache and saint croix en plaine Several thousand Germans, more victims of Hitler's hold-at-all-costs orders, were thus encircled in the western half of the Colmar pocket. After the latest disaster, General Rasp was at last given permission to fight a delaying action across the Rhine. At 8 a.m. on February 9th, his engineers blew up the Rhine River Bridge at Chalamp on the moulouse freiburg Road, leaving behind only a few rear guards trapped in the La Art Forest. These were mopped up the following day. The Battle of the Colmar Pocket was over. It had lasted 20 days. General Rasp inflicted 20,505 casualties on the 420,000 Franco-Americans engaged in the battle. 
In the process, he lost 22,010 men, mostly prisoners, 80 guns and 70 tanks, assault guns, and tank destroyers, but he succeeded in escaping across the Rhine with roughly 50,000 men, 7,000 motorized vehicles, 1,500 guns, and 60 armored vehicles. The fact that the 19th Army still existed as an effective combat force is a testimony to the outstanding generalship of Siegfried Rasp. Hitler, of course, did not see things that way, and another scapegoat was needed to explain away his latest defeat. Rasp was relieved of his command on February 15th and replaced by General of Infantry Hermann Furch. Germany had lost another excellent commander. Chapter 4 the Battle for Hungary With some brief exceptions, the German armies in the east had been in retreat since the original Sixth Army was destroyed in Stalingrad in February 1943. On August 20th, 1944, Romania defected from the Axis, and the Red Army launched a massive offensive against the German army group South Ukraine, pouring through gaps left by the 3rd and 4th Romanian armies. As a result, the reconstituted German 6th Army and much of the German 8th Army were trapped in two huge pockets on the Prut River. By August 29th, the pockets had been cleared and 180,000 Germans had been captured. Constanta, the Romanian Black Sea port, fell that same day, Ploiesht and its vital oil fields were lost on August 30th, and Bucharest fell the next day as the remnants of the German army fell back into Hungary. The 6th Army had only two intact divisions left. Colonel General Johannes Friesner, the commander-in-chief of Army Group South Ukraine, was given a respite of several weeks as the Soviet armies overran Bulgaria, and Tito's communist guerrillas captured most of, and the Soviet Union invaded, part of, Yugoslavia. Sofia fell on September 16th, and Belgrade was taken on October 20th. Meanwhile, Army Group South Ukraine was redesignated Army Group South on September 23rd, and was reinforced with a few new formations, including the 23rd and 24th Panzer Divisions, the mediocre 4th SS Panzer Grenadier Division Police, and the headquarters 57th Panzer Corps under General of Panzer Troops Friedrich Kirchner. By the end of the month, General of Infantry Otto Wöhler's 8th Army had three German and three Hungarian divisions, while General of Artillery Maximilian Freter Pico's 6th Army had four German and six Hungarian divisions. On October 6th, the Soviets launched a massive offensive against Army Group South. They planned a giant envelopment aimed at encircling and destroying the Army Group and Army Group Heinrichsi, First Panzer and First Hungarian Armies, on its left flank. An Army Group was a temporary formation as opposed to an Army Group, Harris Group, which was a permanent headquarters. The attacking forces included Rodion Malinovsky's 2nd Ukrainian and General Ivani Petrov's 4th Ukrainian fronts, which were coordinated by Marshal Siemen Konstantinovich Timoshenko. Malinovsky alone had six Soviet rifle armies, a tank army, and two Romanian armies, 42 Russian rifle divisions, 22 Romanian divisions, 500 tanks, and 1,100 airplanes. Although the Germans were badly outnumbered, the Soviet plan was far too ambitious for its logistical abilities. Because of the differences in gauges, the Romanian railroads were of little use to the Soviets, and everything had to be brought up by truck from west of the Dniester River. The overextended Soviet supply lines simply were not able to properly supply an offensive of this scale. On the first day of the offensive, the 4th Ukrainian Front on the Soviet right routed the 3rd Hungarian Army. After that, however, Petrov had to deal with Germans. 
Performing with his usual brilliance, Colonel General Gotthard Heinrichsi took maximum advantage of the excellent defensive possibilities in the Carpathians and quickly checked the 4th Ukrainian front in the mountains. Friesner, however, had less suitable defensive terrain and less reliable troops. He was soon in serious trouble. On his left, the Russian 53rd Army and General Isapliev's mechanized cavalry group broke through the 3rd Hungarian Army and gained 50 miles in three days. Fortunately for him, Major General Josef von Radovitz's 23rd Panzer Division put up a magnificent defense at Oradea, on the northern shoulder of the 3rd Hungarian, and stopped the entire 6th Guards Tank Army cold, forcing the Plief group to come back to assist it. Even so, Friesner realized that his front could not hold indefinitely, and on October 8th warned Colonel General Heinz Guderian, the chief of the Army General Staff, that it would take Wöhler's 8th Army six days to withdraw behind the Theiss River. Hitler, however, would not allow a timely retreat. When Radovitz finally lost Oradea on October 12th, most of the 76th Infantry Division was cut off and destroyed. In the meantime, Friesner decided that he could wait no longer, and on October 12th ordered a retreat. Cluj was abandoned, and much of the army group fell back toward the Theiss. Malinowski was slowed by supply problems, but, on October 17th, launched an attack aimed at cutting off the retreat of the German 8th and Hungarian 1st and 2nd armies east of the Theiss. The Germans made their stand at Debrecen, the third largest city in Hungary, which did not fall until October 20th. Then the Plief group, which included the 1st Tank and 2nd Guards Cavalry Corps, knifed into the rear of the 8th Army and captured Nirajaza on October 22nd, cutting Wöhler's main line of retreat. This time, however, Friesner was ready for them. Acting on a plan originated by Major General Helmut von Grohlmann, the Army Group's Chief of Staff, General of Panzer Troops Hermann Breit's 3rd Panzer Corps of the 6th Army, spearheaded by the ever-reliable 23rd Panzer Division, struck from the west on October 23rd, while Wöhler attacked from the east with Lieutenant General Kurt Rübke's 29th Corps and part of General of Mountain Troops Hans Kreising's 17th Corps. The 4th Ukrainian Front tried to break up the impending encirclement by launching heavy counterattacks against Wöhler, but without success. Wöhler recaptured Nirajaza on October 29th and linked up with Radovitz's 23rd Panzer, cutting off the Plief group. Some of the Russians managed to escape in small groups, but by the time the pocket was cleared, the Russians had lost 25,000 men and 600 tanks. The entire operation resembled the Blitzkrieg operations of old. When they recaptured Nirajaza and the surrounding villages, the Germans got an ample opportunity to see how the Soviets were going to behave in occupied Axis territory. Hungarian women of all ages had been raped. Afterwards, many had been murdered. Mothers and fathers had been nailed to doorposts and forced to watch as their children were raped, mutilated, and murdered. These horrific sights redoubled the determination of German soldiers to prevent the Russians from reaching German territory. Meanwhile, Hungary's regent, Admiral Miklos Nikolas Horty, was secretly trying to negotiate an armistice with the Soviet Union. The Hungarian cabinet and parliament, on the other hand, were pro-German, as was at least half the army with many generals wanting to continue fighting as German allies against the Soviets. Hitler was in a much better position to foil Hungary's attempted defection than he had been Romania's six weeks earlier. The commandant of the Budapest garrison was one of Horty's leading military supporters. On October 8th, the Gestapo arrested him. On October 15th, Hitler's most famous commando, SS Major Otto Skorzeny, kidnapped Admiral Horty's son. Skorzeny reportedly rolled up the noted playboy and armistice negotiator in a carpet 
and sent him back to Germany. That same afternoon, Radio Budapest broadcast Horty's declaration of an armistice with the Soviet Union, and the cabinet promptly resigned in protest. The next morning, Skortseni seized the royal palace. Apparently hoping to avoid being captured by Skortseni, Horty surrendered to General of the Waffen-SS Karl von Pfeffer Wildenbruck. As his last official act, Horty was forced to appoint Ferenc Salashi, the leader of the Aero Cross Party, the Hungarian version of the Nazi Party, as his successor and request asylum in Germany. According to military historian Earl Ziemke, Salashi's chief claim to distinction was his incoherence both in speech and in writing. He promptly named himself Nador, Führer, with all the powers of the Prince Regent. The Wehrmacht's problems in Hungary remained pressing. Its flat terrain made it well-suited for Soviet mobile operations against German Army Group South, which was badly under strength. The Sixth Army, for example, had four Panzer and two Panzer Grenadier divisions, the 1st, 13th, 23rd, and 24th Panzers, and 4th SS and Feldherrnhalle Panzer Grenadiers, but all totaled, these divisions had only 67 tanks and 58 assault guns. In short, Friesner's armies now held a continuous front, but it was weak, thinly manned, and could not hold long against a determined attack. Friesner also did not have firm contact with Weix's Army Group F, since elements of the 2nd Ukrainian Front had already taken advantage of the weak 3rd Hungarian Army, crossed the lower Tice, and occupied much of the Hungarian plain between the Tice and the Danube. Hitler nevertheless commanded Friesner to fight for every foot of soil and refused to allow voluntary withdrawals. The fall of Horty and the advent of Salashi also hurt Hungarian morale, which was already low. Hungarian soldiers began to desert in large numbers. In some places, entire units went over to the Russians. Colonel General Janos Vurush, the Hungarian chief of staff and minister of war, defected, crossing the lines in a Mercedes Heinz Guderian had given him a few weeks before, as did Colonel General Belamiklos, the commander of the 1st Hungarian Army. Colonel General Lajos Veres, the leader of the Hungarian 2nd Army, was arrested on Friesner's orders. Of the senior army officers, only General Joseph Heslenyi, the commander of the 3rd Hungarian Army, remained in office. On the afternoon of October 29th, Malinowski attacked the Hungarian 3rd Army again. The German elements of this army, under the command of Kirchner's 57th Panzer Corps, held their positions, but the Hungarians scattered almost immediately. The Russians captured Ketchkamit on the 31st and were halted only a few miles from the suburbs of Budapest. Meanwhile, German defenders were reinforced by the 8th SS and 22nd SS Cavalry Divisions. Elements of the 8th SS and the Feldherrnhalle Panzer Grenadier Divisions counterattacked and recaptured the town of Vecesh, just southeast of the city. The Soviets, mindful of the disaster they had recently suffered at Debrecen, withdrew to the southeast. During the first week of November, Timoshenko regrouped his forces and prepared for an offensive on a much broader front. On his left, Fyodor Tolbukhin's third Ukrainian front, which had captured the Yugoslav capital on October 19th, entered Hungary from the south with three armies and an independent tank corps. East and northeast of the Hungarian capital lay Malinovsky's second Ukrainian front with six armies. The Axis forces available to meet this threat included the 2nd Panzer Army of OB Southeast and Army Group South, which deployed the remnants of the 2nd Hungarian Army, Army Group of Freter Pico, German 6th Army plus a few Hungarian units, and Army Group of Wehrler. German 8th and 1st Hungarian Armies. 
The Soviet offensive started on November 7th, when the third Ukrainian front attempted to cross to the west bank of the Danube near Mohach, Batina, and Apatin. Most of this area was flooded and easily defended. For two weeks, the Second Panzer Army foiled Tobuchin's advance until he finally broke through on November 22nd. The Russians, aided by a miners' revolt, overcame the fierce resistance of SS Major General Gustav Lombart's 31st SS Volunteer Grenadier Division, Bohemia Moravia, and took Petsch on November 29th. The 31st SS Volunteer Grenadier Division was a mixed German Folkdeutsch unit, which had been in the process of forming in southern Hungary when Tolbuchin's offensive struck. It managed to evacuate 80,000 ethnic Germans from southern Hungary and fell back to Lake Balaton to reform. Friesner met the latest Soviet offensive in a manner that had become standard operating procedure for senior German generals. He rushed his armored and motorized units from crisis point to crisis point, losing ground while valiantly trying to keep his front from collapsing. On December 8th, Malinovsky captured the city of Vats on the Danube Bend, about ten miles due north of the capital, while Tolbuchin pushed to the Lake Balaton Lake Belensa line, southwest of the city. It was now clear that a Soviet encirclement of Budapest was in the offing. With Hitler's permission, OKH reinforced Friesner with two panzer divisions and three Tiger battalions for a counterattack, but they were slow to arrive because Allied bombers had crippled the German transportation system. On December 14th, after the Russians captured the town of Ipolisag, north of Budapest, and began working their way through the small Bersenyi Mountains northeast of the city, Friesner had no choice but to defend Shahi with the Dierlewanger Brigade, led by the notorious SS Oberfuhrer Oskar Dierlewanger, which had recently come down from Slovakia. This brigade consisted of the scum of the German army. Most of its men were convicted criminals, and most of the rest were communists. The army group commander visited it on the 14th, and what he saw amazed him. Dierlewanger, who was responsible for many of the terrible atrocities committed in putting down the Warsaw Uprising a few months before, was sitting calmly at his desk with a monkey on his shoulder. Neither he nor his staff knew anything about the situation in their sector of the front, but Dierlewanger nevertheless wanted to withdraw. Friesner ordered him to stay put. Then Friesner visited the 24th Panzer Division and, returning to his headquarters that evening, passed through the Shahi sector again, where he narrowly avoided being captured by the Russians. Dierlewanger had ignored his orders and pulled out. No one knew where his brigade had gone. On December 18th, the situation deteriorated to the point that Friesner was forced to commit the 8th Panzer Division, part of his counterattack force, to the northern wing against the Russian 6th Tank Army. Friesner and Guderian, meanwhile, were having another series of arguments because Friesner did not want to use his Panzer Reserve to attack right away. The weather, rain and above freezing temperatures, was too bad for the use of armor, and the plain southwest of Budapest was a giant field of mud. On December 14th, Friesner categorically refused to assume responsibility for the attack until the ground had frozen, but still Guderian persisted in ordering him to strike. Their arguments became so heated that on December 18th, Friesner flew to the headquarters of the High Command of the Army in Zosen, about 30 miles south of Berlin, to straighten out the matter. Friesner discovered that Guderian and his operations officer, Colonel Bogoslav von Bonin, agreed with him but had been repeating Hitler's orders. Friesner argued for Budapest's evacuation. Hitler wanted the city defended house by house, even though it was utterly unprepared for a siege. Guderian said that he would relay Friesner's views to the Fuhrer, but could promise nothing. The next day, the Dierlewanger Brigade mutinied and effectively disbanded. Several companies went over to the Reds, while other units merely shot their officers and deserted. 
Meanwhile, the Third Panzer Corps' counterattack, ordered by Hitler, failed, and the Soviets closed in on Budapest. By December 22nd, the city was in danger of encirclement. Once again, Friesner called for the abandonment of the Hungarian capital, and he and General Freter Pico were subsequently sacked. Wöhler was given command of Army Group South, General of Panzer Troops Hermann Balk was transferred from the Western Front to assume command of the Sixth Army, and General of Mountain Troops Hans Kreising succeeded Wöhler as commander of the Eighth Army. Guderian signaled the new commanders that they should have but one battle cry, attack, whether by patrols, locally, or on a large scale. Wöhler called Guderian and argued that, historically, Budapest had always been defended from the West Bank. Listening to his arguments, Guderian agreed to speak to Hitler about abandoning Budapest. Three hours later, he relayed the Fuhrer's decision to General Wöhler. The city, including the bridgehead on the eastern side of the Danube, was to be defended. OKH would launch a rescue attack using the 4th SS Panzer Corps, 3rd SS and 5th SS Panzer Divisions, from Army Group Center, and Wöhler had permission to withdraw two divisions from the city. It was already too late even for that. By December 24th, Budapest was encircled. The Siege of Budapest From early November 1944, Budapest was defended by 33,000 Germans and 37,000 Hungarians under the direction of General of Panzer Troops Hermann Breit's 3rd Panzer Corps. The tone for the battle was set on November 10th, when a Russian armored force took the key town of Vecesh from SS Major Walter Drexler's 8th SS Panzer Reconnaissance Battalion. SS Major General Joachim Rumor, the commander of the 8th SS Cavalry Division, Florian Geyer, launched an immediate counterattack and retook the town in bitter house-to-house -house fighting. They found that most of the citizens of the town had been killed. Most of the women had been raped before they were murdered. Survivors cried to the SS cavalrymen, My God, my God, why did you leave us? Several Waffen-SS men who had been captured were also found, but their bodies were so badly mutilated that they were difficult to identify. After Vecesh, quarter was seldom given or asked for, and the SS men never gave up a position voluntarily. The Soviets were not able to retake Vecesh until the end of December. The 8th SS and 22nd SS Cavalry Divisions, now fighting as infantry, barred the direct route to Budapest and were subjected to repeated attacks, which they repulsed except for one. On November 17th, the Soviets broke through the German trenches and barreled into the western sector of Vecesh, but were quickly surrounded by a counterattack. The SS cavalrymen then wiped out the attacking force. On December 4th, 5th, and 6th, the Soviets penetrated the Hungarian lines in several places. Most of these penetrations were liquidated by counterattacks by Major General Gerhard Schmidhuber's 13th Panzer Division or by Colonel Günther Papa's 60th Feldherrnhalle Panzer Grenadier Division, but the Panzertruppen lacked the strength to seal the holes in the Hungarian lines and had to fall back into the Budapest bridgehead positions on the very outskirts of the city. By December 11th, the Russians were hammering Budapest with 10,000 artillery pieces that ringed the city north, east, and south. On December 13th, 3rd Panzer Corps withdrew and 9th SS Mountain Corps took charge of defending the Hungarian capital. This corps had been formed in the summer of 1944 to oversee the training and operations of the 13th SS and 23rd SS Volunteer Mountain Divisions, Hanshar and Kama. Most of its troops were Croatian Muslims who were not particularly interested in serving the Greater German Reich. Indiscipline and lack of training time led to the dissolution of the 23rd SS, and the 13th was scaled back to regimental size, 
which left the 9th SS Mountain free for employment at the front. In early December, SS Lieutenant General Karl Gustav Zalbertzweig was replaced by General of SS Karl von Pfeffer Wildenbruck, who was also a general of police. As commander of the 9th SS Mountain Corps, he led the German forces throughout the siege. A tough veteran, he had already lost both of his sons in the war. The oldest was killed in action as a Fahnenjunker in North Africa in 1941, and the youngest, an Army Second Lieutenant, was killed in France in 1944. Despite his SS status, Pfeffer Wildenbruch was accepted by his Army colleagues and was considered competent by the Army commanders in Hungary. He was to prove them right during the siege of Budapest. Budapest, a city of a million people, tried to treat the siege as a minor inconvenience. The 8th SS Cavalry Medical Battalion, for example, set up its main dressing station in the wine cellar of the elegant Hotel Britannia. Affluent Hungarians ate in the dining room and ignored the mud-covered German medics carrying filthy wounded SS men. The streetcars still operated, Christmas festivities continued, shops were open, and many Hungarian officers spent their nights at home and commuted to the front. There was relatively little fighting in the trenches around Budapest during the week of December 17th to 23rd, and the troops tried not to think about the deteriorating strategic situation. By December 24th, however, Budapest was surrounded. Pfeffer Wildenbruch wanted to launch an immediate breakout and sent the Florian Geyer SS Cavalry Division to Buda, on the western side of the pocket, to lead the way. Then came the order from Fuhrer headquarters. Budapest must be held under all circumstances. Instead of attacking, the 22nd SS Cavalry dug in to defend the western approaches to the fortress. Unfortunately for the defenders, their supply depots were located to the west of the city, and the staff of the 9th SS Mountain Corps did not start moving them east until it was too late. Most of their 450 tons of ammunition and 300,000 rations were lost to the Russians on Christmas Eve. Once again, the Waffen-SS demonstrated its major weaknesses as a combat force a lack of trained general staff officers, and faulty staff work. The fighting escalated when the Soviets tried to batter their way into Budapest on December 25th. The siege was constant now, and the civilian population was driven to cellars by air and artillery bombardments. In most quarters, the electricity, gas, and water services failed in the first days, and city authorities had made little provision for food or medical supplies, leaving thousands to die of cold and illness. On Christmas Day, the FHH division held the suburb of Budaersh in fierce fighting. The next day, the Russians suffered heavy losses at Budakesi, which was held by the 8th SS Recon Battalion. In the Danube, the Soviets managed to capture the main heights on Chepel Island. The Russians were attacking everywhere, and disaster was frequently averted only by counterattacks by the last battalions. All Pfeffer Wildenbruck had left in reserve was a Kampfgruppe, battle group, from Oberfuhrer Helmut Dürner's 1st SS Police Regiment. Oberfuhrer was an SS rank between SS Colonel and SS Major General. It has no direct English translation. He signaled Führer headquarters that he wanted to evacuate the east, Pest sector of the pocket, so he could concentrate his forces on the western side of the Danube. Needless to say, permission to retreat was not forthcoming. The situation deteriorated. On December 27th, Drexler's 8th Panzer Reconnaissance Battalion was finally pushed out of Vecchisch, and the Reds looked to gain further ground. By now, the defenders were outnumbered about five to one in men and much more than that in guns, tanks, and airplanes, and German supplies were running out. 
The 9th SS Mountain predicted that it would be out of ammunition by January 3rd and out of food by January 12th. Even so, on December 29th, Gerhard Schmidhuber's 13th Panzer Division launched a vicious counterattack and wiped out the Russian penetration from the day before. The 9th SS depended on resupply landings or airdrops at the Budapest racetrack. 27 HE-111s and JU-52s landed during the night of December 29th to 30th and deposited 75 tons of ammunition and 10 tons of fuel. Another 45 tons were airdropped, and another 29 supply planes landed on December 30th during daylight hours, though several were shot down by Soviet fighters. Near Chermer, Soviet attacks broke through the 10th Hungarian Division, and the 13th Panzer was not able to close the gap completely. The two divisions had to retreat to a shorter defensive line to the west. Soviet Marshals Rodion Malinovsky and Fyodor Tolbukhin had been sure that they would capture Budapest within three or four days after completing the encirclement, but the German-Hungarian resistance was stubborn, tying down more than a quarter of a million Soviet troops, including 19 Soviet and Romanian divisions, three mechanized or tank brigades, and several specialized artillery and assault units. The Russian generals therefore tried diplomacy. On December 29th, a team of four parliamentarians crossed the line under a flag of truce. They were first taken to the command post of SS Colonel August Zeander, the commander of the 22nd SS Cavalry Division, who contemptuously rejected the very idea of surrender, refused to look at the offered terms, and sent the emissaries packing. What happened next is disputed. One witness, an SS man, said a Hungarian anti-tank gun, hidden near where the Buda Orsi Road crossed the Hamsabegi Railroad line, fired on the Soviet jeep, killing all four of its occupants. The Hungarians denied the charge and said the jeep must have struck a mine. The Soviets accused the Waffen SS of murdering the men. Via loudspeakers and radio broadcasts, they swore revenge for this serious war crime, which only stiffened German and Hungarian resistance, and the siege of Budapest became one of the bitterest battles of the Second World War. By December 30th, the Germans had concentrated their flak guns in the zone of the 13th Panzer Division around Chermur, where the racetrack airfield was located. To the west, the 8th SS Cavalry was hard-pressed by repeated Soviet attacks, and by December 31st, the 15th Cavalry Regiment of the 8th SS had been pushed back to within a half-mile of the Margaretten Island Bridge on the Danube. During the night of December 31st to January 1st, the Soviets launched a massive attack. At many points, the Germans were forced to commit their last reserves, the 13th Panzer near Chermer was forced back, and in several areas the fighting was hand to hand. My wounds are not so bad, a soldier from the 18th SS Cavalry Regiment wrote to his parents in Dusseldorf. On the 29th, I received a splinter in my left foot had it bound up and went back on duty. On the 30th, I got a shell fragment from a Russian anti-tank gun in my left thigh, which was worse. There were five floors in the Hotel Imperial, all full of wounded. The situation in the city is crazy. The Hungarians have really lost their heads. We must fight in the streets. The Russians are shooting with their artillery from all sides. The last days forward at the front were terrible. We never stopped fighting. Three times the Russians broke through a little bit with tanks, and each time we had to counterattack with units made out of thin air. My platoon has gone from 42 to 14 men. We don't get much food, only a loaf of bread for each 18 men. The Russians are coming ever closer. The streets are fully blocked up. Dead men, horses, animals, and ruined cars are all over. The man who wrote this letter was more fortunate than most. The next day, he was flown out of the pocket to Papa Hungary by a JU-52. 
Inside the pocket, however, his comrades continued to fight and die. Of the 33,000 German soldiers trapped in Budapest, approximately 2,000 had been killed and more than 700 wounded. The Hungarians had also suffered heavy casualties, and about one-third of them deserted to the Soviets by the time the battle was over. The Reds helped speed up this process by promising Hungarian deserters that they could go home if they lived behind Russian lines. During the night of January 1st to 2nd, 56 HE-111s dropped 73.5 tons of ammunition and supplies into the garrison, as well as a small quantity of fuel. Then the rescue operation began. To save the garrison at Budapest, Army Group South was given 4th SS Panzer Corps, 3rd SS Panzer Division Totenkopf, and the 5th SS Panzer Division Viking, commanded by Waffen-SS General Herbert Giller. The operation began on January 1, 1945, and the 4th SS Panzer Division, supported by Colonel Hermann Harendorf's 96th Infantry Division, initially made good progress along the Komarno-Budapest Road. The Soviets reacted quickly, however, and prevented a decisive breakthrough. Soviet fighter bombers were particularly effective in slowing the advance of the panzers. On January 6th, the 4th SS Panzer was stopped near Perbal, about 15 miles from the Budapest perimeter, and the 6th Guards Tank and 7th Guards Armies launched a powerful counterattack to the north, threatening its rear. The next day, General Hermann Balk, the commander of the 6th Army, struck the Russian lines to the south with the 1st Cavalry Corps and gained several miles, but the Russians again reacted quickly by sending in the 4th Guards Army. By January 7th, both attacks were stalled. Balk signaled that he needed to withdraw the 6th Army, but Hitler refused to allow it. General Wöhler, as commander of Army Group South, had no choice but to continue trying to punch through the Russian lines, hoping to relieve the garrison at Budapest, though he knew it was probably futile. Meanwhile, inside the pocket, the defenders absorbed blow after blow. As one historian has noted, front lines as such no longer existed. Machine gun nests and foxholes in the ruins provided the key points of resistance, and wherever they were located, there was the front. House-to-house -house fighting with hand grenades, revolvers, machine pistols, bayonets, and spades was the order of the day. The streets were so shell-cratered and plowed up that tanks and vehicles could no longer move through most of them. Behind the front, the Russians and their Hungarian communist counterparts went on a rampage of murder, rape, and plunder. No civilian was safe from their reign of terror. By January 7th, food was in critically short supply, and the garrison's main source of water was melted snow. On January 12th, the Russians broke into the eastern parts of the city of Pest, but were wiped out in bitter street fighting. The next day, another breakthrough took place to the south at Kishpesht, but again it was eliminated by a prompt counterattack. On January 15th, the Reds launched an all-out attack, but only managed to gain a few blocks in eastern Budapest. It was, however, becoming increasingly evident that the German positions east of the Danube were doomed. Most of the bridges across the river had already been destroyed by the Red Air Force. The Germans had lost most of their heavy weapons, were almost out of food and ammunition, and their air squadrons were out of fuel. Pfeffer Wildenbruch practically begged Army Group South and Führer Headquarters for permission to pull back across the river. Hitler finally relented at 7.25 p.m. on January 16th. The evacuation began at 10 p.m. on January 17th, and continued until after daylight on January 18th. German engineers destroyed the Elizabeth Bridge and the last pontoon bridges at 7 a.m. on January 18th. The eastern side of the Danube was now clear of Axis forces. 
Meanwhile, the 4th SS Panzer Corps turned north and advanced up the western bank of the Danube to a point only a dozen miles south of the Budapest perimeter. Pfeffer Wildenbruck would have broken out had he been allowed to, but Hitler's orders were firm. For him, the rescue of the Magyar capital was the only solution to the problem. So, as was the case with Stalingrad, the garrison of Budapest was forced to pass up its last real chance to break out and escape. By January 19th, the Budapest pocket extended about one mile along the Danube and was no more than a mile in depth. The men were reduced to eating horse meat or cats when they were available. Survivors later stated that cats taste better than dogs or horses. The garrison held no more airfields, which made resupply problematic. Supply canisters dropped by parachute frequently landed behind Russian lines or in no man's land, and sometimes provoked savage little battles. On January 27th, the Soviets launched a series of counterattacks against the 4th Panzer Corps' salient, using the 26th Army as well as the 23rd Tank, 1st Guards Mechanized, and 5th Guards Cavalry Corps. Gilla was forced to retreat, but Hitler still would not allow a breakout attempt. That day, the last members of the 9th SS Mountain Corps Staff Company were thrown into the battle as infantrymen, fighting to seal off the numerous Russian penetrations. Losses were heavy on both sides. Two days later, the Corps reported that it would soon have more wounded than effective combatants. Daily rations were reduced to 5 grams, 1.7 ounces of lard, a slice of bread, and one piece of horse meat per man per day. These rations were supplemented by large quantities of schnapps and wine, of which Budapest had an abundant supply. On January 30th, 9th SS Corps signaled, Famine and disease are spreading. The people have lost all faith and hope. The situation is very critical. The last battle has begun. With the garrison nearing the end of its endurance, the house-to-house -house fighting remained savage. On February 3rd, for example, the starving defenders destroyed eight Soviet tanks, two anti-tank guns, an anti-aircraft gun, and an armored car. And so it went day after day as the Russians cleared one block at a time. By February 6th, there were 11,000 wounded in the cauldron. Several squadrons of the 8th SS Cavalry Division were surrounded in the area of the main railroad station on February 7th, and the 8th SS Flak Battalion, which shot down 75 enemy airplanes during the siege and received a special commendation from General Guderian, abandoned its empty guns on the grounds of the university at Castle Hill and went into the battle as infantry. On February 9th, in fierce fighting, the Russians tried and failed to drive a wedge between Castle Hill, the former seat of the Hungarian government, and the Budapest citadel. But the end was obviously not far off. Pfeffer Wildenbruch again signaled Führer headquarters for permission to withdraw and planned a breakout for the night of February 11th. As the men prepared, their mood became strangely relaxed, almost carefree. One SS cavalry squadron ate its first hot meal in days, meatballs made from horse meat and gravy. If this was their last meal, the attitude of many was that there was nothing more to worry about. When a dispatch runner from the 8th SS cavalry entered the command post of SS Major General Rumor, he saw several high-ranking officers seated around a conference table. The runner recognized General Schmidhuber, the commander of the 13th Panzer, among others. But no serious discussions were going on. The table was piled high with schnapps bottles. Come and drink up, my boy, a smiling General Rumor greeted the runner. Once we leave here, we'll be dodging the shit soon enough. The breakout attempt began at 8 p.m. on February 11th. After leaving their wounded with the papal nuncio and destroying their heavy equipment and everything else they could not carry, approximately 16,000 soldiers moved out. 
The Soviets were ready and hit the Germans with every gun in their arsenal, including the dreaded Stalin organ rockets. Within minutes, the first wave of the infantry assault elements of the 13th Panzer and 8th SS Cavalry Divisions were slaughtered. General Schmidhuber tried to lead the second wave of his division across the open terrain northwest of Vienna Strasse, but ran into a hail of bullets and artillery fire. He was killed and his troops were dispersed and later captured. Still, despite heavy resistance, Pfeffervildenbruch's main attempt succeeded in clearing the built-up area of Budapest, which was now a field of ruins. Making surprising progress, they advanced about 12 miles and reached the area of Perbal, near where the 4th SS Panzer had been halted a month before. But then on February 12th, they were scattered by Soviet armor, and very few survivors made it back to the German lines. Budapest has been called the Stalingrad of the Waffen-SS. Only about 700 Waffen-SS soldiers returned to the Axis front. Most of the rest, at least 25,000 men, were murdered by their Soviet captors or died in death marches or in slave labor camps. SS General Pfeffer Wildenbruch was wounded and kept as a Soviet prisoner until 1955. He died in a traffic accident in Bielefeld, Westphalia, West Germany, on January 29, 1971. Joachim Rumor, the commander of the 8th SS Cavalry Division Florian Geyer, and August Zeander, the commander of the 22nd SS Cavalry Division, were both killed in the breakout attempt, although there were unverified reports that Rumor shot himself to keep from falling into Russian hands. Both had been promoted to SS Brigadefuhrer und Generalmajor der Waffen SS, SS Major General, in the last days of the siege. They and Pfeffer Wildenbruch were awarded oak leaves to their knights' crosses. None of the three commanders of the cavalry regiments of the 8th SS Cavalry Division escaped. SS Lieutenant Colonel Oswald Kraus and Major Hans von Schack, the commanders of the 15th and 16th Cavalry Regiments, respectively, were reported as missing in action and never found and SS Major Hans-Georg von Charpentier, the commander of the 18th Cavalry Regiment, was recorded as killed in action on February 11th. But the wounded commanders of the horse regiments of the 22nd Cavalry Division, SS Colonel Karl Heinz Reitel of the 52nd Cavalry, and SS Reserve Lieutenant Colonel Anton Ameiser of the 54th, were flown out of the pocket near the end of the siege. Both were given regimental commands in the new 37th SS Cavalry Division Lutso, which was formed using the horses given up by the then-defunct 8th and 22nd SS Cavalry. SS Oberfuhrer Helmut Dörner, the commander of the 1st SS Police Regiment and a holder of the Knight's Cross with oak leaves and swords, was killed near the Boyne Academy on February 11th. Once again, Adolf Hitler had needlessly sacrificed tens of thousands of desperately needed German soldiers, but their courageous defense of Budapest gave tens of thousands of people the opportunity to escape the Red Flood that was about to engulf Central Europe. Finally, on February 12, 1945, the guns ceased firing in Budapest, SS Captain Peter Neumann wrote. An oppressive silence suddenly hung over the city like a curtain of lead, a silence even more tragic than the deafening roar of bombs and street fighting. Budapest had not surrendered, but there were no men left alive to stop the screaming hordes who now poured into the city. Drunk with fury and vodka, they murdered, raped, pillaged, and set fire to what remained of the ruined buildings. The next battles against the Red Army would be in the Reich itself. Nazi Germany was entering its death throes. Chapter 5. Stalin's January Offensive 
North of the Carpathians, the overall situation on the Eastern Front had not changed significantly since the Soviets isolated Memel in October. On October 19, 1944, the Russians scored a minor breakthrough into East Prussia and captured the districts of Gumbinen and Goldop. The German Fourth Army, under the command of the brilliant but hard-headed General of Infantry Friedrich Hosbach, launched a series of vigorous counterattacks between October 22nd and November 5th, smashed the Soviet 11th Guards Army, and recaptured most of both districts, including the village of Nemersdorf. What the Germans found turned their stomachs. All of the inhabitants, including women, children, and babies, had been tortured and murdered in the most bestial manner. Many of them had been crucified. Some had been raped, nailed to doors, and left to die. Young girls who had not yet reached their teens had been raped repeatedly, as had women in their seventies. Then they had been murdered. More than fifty French prisoners of war who had been sent to the district to work on the farms had tried to protect the German families. They were also murdered by the drunken Russians. Afterwards, the very word Nemersdorf invoked fear in Germany and became shorthand for the Soviet butchery of German villages. General Hosbach was outraged by the Russian atrocities, but also livid that he had been forbidden to evacuate civilians from the area. He was told that such proposals smacked of defeatism. Hitler responded to such proposals as Hosbach's with towering rage and ordered Gauleiters, chiefs of the Nazi party in the provinces who were, in effect, governors, to keep the civilian populations in place. With the Gauleiters in charge, the German army had authority only within six miles of the front lines, barely enough depth to deploy a division, and lost its powers of requisition. Hitler's Gauleiter order severely hindered the army and had terrible consequences for German civilians. In December, Major General Reinhard Galen, the chief of the Foreign Army's East Department of OKH, estimated that the Soviet forces opposite East Prussia and the Vistula totaled 225 rifle divisions and more than 22 tank corps. Guderian calculated that the Soviet superiority in this sector was 11 to 1 in infantry, 7 to 1 in tanks, and 20 to 1 in artillery. The first Ukrainian and first Belarusian fronts alone had 163 divisions. Hitler, however, refused to believe it. He scoffed at OKH's figures and called the Russian buildup the greatest bluff since Genghis Khan. But the real bluffer was Hitler, who had repeatedly reduced the size of German divisions to create the illusion that there were more of them. Some of his new Volksgrenadier divisions had only four infantry battalions, as opposed to nine in the 1939-type divisions. They often had engineer, signal, and anti-tank companies instead of battalions, and had fusilier companies instead of reconnaissance battalions. Fusilier units generally had bicycles instead of motorized vehicles, and were sometimes combined reconnaissance anti-tank units. Older infantry divisions were frequently reorganized to include a mobile battalion, a combination reconnaissance anti-tank unit, that incorporated old reconnaissance and anti-tank battalions. The armored divisions were even more drastically reorganized. The 1945-type Panzer Division had only one Panzer Regiment with one Panzer Battalion, 64 tanks, and two Panzer Grenadier Battalions, which meant it had approximately one-fourth the combat value of a 1940-type tank division. Hitler assumed that Stalin was engaging in the same type of self-deception, so he angrily rejected Galen's estimations. He refused to take units from Norway, Finland, Courland in the Baltic, or from the West to reinforce the East. The Russian front, he told Guderian, would have to take care of itself. According to Soviet figures, the Red Army had 55 armies, 6 tank armies, and 13 air armies, 
500 rifle divisions, 94 artillery divisions, and 149 independent artillery brigades. Their total strength was 15,000 tanks, 15,000 airplanes, and at least 6,800,000 men. These numbers understate their actual strength. They were so abundantly supplied that they mustered additional artillery divisions, anti-aircraft divisions, a rocket launcher division, and a number of independent artillery brigades. Their rifle divisions were motorized, many of their cavalry units were re-equipped with American quarter-ton trucks, and roughly half of all motorized vehicles in the Red Army were of American manufacture. For years after the war, the word Studebaker was synonymous with truck in the Soviet Union. Hitler, however, refused to take such facts seriously. At the same time, the German strength on the Eastern Front on October 1, 1944, stood at 1,790,138 men, including about 150,000 Russian auxiliaries, called Hiwis. Equipment was so short that the army was now beginning to outfit Panzer Grenadier divisions with bicycles. As 1945 began, the menacing shadow of Russian domination lay over Germany like an ugly poisonous cloud, seeping into our minds and clinging there as stubbornly as a wet fog on a gloomy winter morning, Major Siegfried Knappe recalled. On January 1, 1945, the German army had five army groups on the Eastern Front. Of these, however, only army groups Center and A were located between the Baltic Sea and the Carpathian Mountains in the path of Stalin's gigantic buildup. Army Group A had the task of blocking the Soviet drive into Germany proper, while Army Group Center had the mission of defending East Prussia. With its overwhelming forces, Moscow planned nothing less than to capture Berlin and end the war within 45 days. Specifically, Stavka, the Soviet Supreme Command, planned for the main blow to be delivered by Marshal Ivan Konev's 1st Ukrainian and Marshal Georgi Zhukov's 1st Belarusian fronts against the 9th Army, 4th Panzer Army, and 17th Army of Army Group A. These two Soviet fronts each had ten armies, including two tank armies each, and several independent tank and mechanized corps, totaling 6,400 tanks, 4,700 aircraft, 46,000 artillery pieces, and 2,200,000 men. Against this massive force, Colonel General Josef Harpa's Army Group A could muster only 400,000 men, 4,100 guns, and 1,150 tanks. The defense was further handicapped by the fact that the Soviets already had major bridgeheads across the Vistula at Magnushev, Puave, and Baranov. In the Magnushev bridgehead alone, the first Belarusian front deployed 400,000 troops, 8,700 guns, and 1,700 tanks, more than the total strength of Army Group A. At their points of main attack, the 1st Belarusian and 1st Ukrainian fronts outnumbered the Germans by an average ratio of 9 to 1 in men, between 9 to 1 and 10 to 1 in artillery, and 10 to 1 in tanks and assault guns. In addition, the Red Air Force had more than 10,000 airplanes ready for employment between the Baltic and the Carpathians. As of January 2nd, the Luftwaffe had fewer than 3,800 operational airplanes in its entire arsenal. Of these, 1,875 were on the Eastern Front. Fewer than 300 of these were with Ritter von Grimes' 6th Air Fleet, which supported Army Group's Center and A. On January 9th, General Guderian made one last attempt to persuade Hitler that the Russians were about to launch a major offensive. Before he went to see the Fuhrer, he said to his chief of foreign armies east, Galen, today is our last chance. If the panzer divisions from the west are sent on their way to the east, not later than tonight, they may still get there in time.
The meeting was held in Colonel General Alfred Yodel's spacious study at the Fuhrer headquarters of Alderhorst. Present were Yodel, Keitel, Göring, Major General Eckhart Christian, the Chief of Operations of the Luftwaffe and Air Force Liaison Officer to OKW, Rear Admiral Karl Jesko von Putkammer, the Führer's Naval Adjutant, Lieutenant General August Winter, the Chief of Staff of OB Southeast, Himmler, and General of Infantry Wilhelm Burgdorf, the Chief of the Army Personnel Office, who was already being called the Grave Digger of the German Officer Corps. Hitler entered and shook hands with every man in the room. He looked old, his left leg dragged as if partly crippled, his left hand trembled, his shoulders were stooped, his face was pale. He slumped into his chair like a man who had little control over his body. As Guderian spoke, he turned his left ear toward him, as had been his custom since his right eardrum was punctured during the Stauffenberg assassination attempt of July 20th, 1944. Guderian spoke frankly and cut to the heart of the matter. He stated categorically that the Soviets were going to launch a major offensive on January 12th. To meet this threat to the fatherland, he proposed that the armies in Courland be withdrawn immediately. The 16th and 18th armies had been isolated there in eastern Latvia for five months and were accessible only by sea. He asked that the panzer forces be transferred from the west to the east beginning that night. He asked that Hosbach's 4th Army be allowed to pull back from its exposed position in East Prussia. Finally, at the very least, he strongly recommended that Army Group A be allowed to withdraw from in front of the Baranov and Puave bridgeheads, so it would not have to take the full weight of the Soviet blow. He might as well have been talking to a fence post. Hitler still refused to believe that the Russians were going to launch any kind of attack at all. For the invasion of Germany, the Red High Command recast its entire propaganda and troop indoctrination program. During the first part of the war, the theme had been the defense of Mother Russia. Then it had been the liberation of Russian territory. Now the key word was revenge. Major Soviet literary figures, political officers, radio broadcasters, and visiting speakers pounded this theme into the heads of every Russian soldier. The crimes the Germans had committed against Soviet women and children were retold countless times, along with tales of burned villages, slaughtered livestock, ruined cities, and German looting and exploitation. The individual Soviet soldiers' hatred for Germans was fanned into a white heat, most Soviet soldiers were poorly educated, illiterate, and highly susceptible to propaganda. Kill, kill was the slogan of Ilya Ehrenberg, the top Soviet propagandist, whose words were disseminated to every Red Army unit, both by broadcast and in leaflet form. In the German race there is nothing but evil. Stamp out the fascist beast once and for all in its lair. Use force and break the racial pride of these Germanic women. Take them as your lawful booty. Kill. As you storm onward, kill. You gallant soldiers of the Red Army. Two eyes for an eye and a pool of blood for a drop of blood were favorite Ehrenberg slogans which were constantly drummed into the heads of the unsophisticated Soviet soldiers. By their behavior in Russia, the Germans had sown the wind. Now they were about to reap the whirlwind. On cold, snowy January 12, 1945, the western face of the Baranov Bridgehead, on the west side of the Vistula, southeast of Warsaw, was defended by General of Panzer Troops Baron Maximilian von Edelsheim's 48th Panzer Corps, which controlled three infantry divisions. General of Infantry Hermann Recknagel's 42nd Corps, which had four infantry divisions, held the northern face. All seven were veteran divisions, which meant that they were also severely depleted. 
The three divisions of the 48th Panzer, for example, had no tanks, only about twelve assault guns each, and only enough infantry to post one man for every fifteen yards of front. In most places along their thirty miles of front, they could not form a continuous line. Instead, they formed strong points and outposts, and covered the intervening terrain with patrols. Opposite them, the 1st Ukrainian Front had five armies, two tank armies, and more than 1,000 tanks. Before dawn, the Russians launched a massive artillery bombardment, an incredible concentration estimated at 420 guns per mile of front. The barrage lasted for three hours before the Russian infantry advanced. The Germans were surprised. They had assumed the Soviet offensive would be delayed for better weather, so the Reds could take advantage of their overwhelming air power. By noon, the gaps in the German line were wide enough for the Russians to commit their armor, which advanced rapidly. About ten miles to the west of the front lay two panzer divisions of Walter Nering's 24th Panzer Corps. They were ordered to counterattack, but even before they left their assembly areas, they were under attack themselves. The 17th Panzer Division was slaughtered, as was the elite 424th Heavy Panzer Battalion. Only the legendary Lieutenant Friedrich Karl Oberbracht really stood tall during the battle. Oberbracht was a veteran panzer officer and a master of his profession, despite his youth. After his battalion commander was killed in an ambush, Oberbracht led his panzer against the Soviets and personally destroyed eleven of their best Stalin tanks before the tracks of his own vehicle were blown off. Immobilized, he kept fighting and destroyed at least seven more Stalin tanks before he was killed. The rest of the battalion was then overrun and annihilated. The elite 424th Heavy Panzer lost 67 of its 70 modern Tigers and ceased to exist. It was arguably the worst disaster to overtake a Tiger unit during the entire war. By nightfall, the Russians had reached the Nida River and were a dozen miles into the rear of Fritz Hubert Grieser's 4th Panzer Army. The 48th Panzer and 42nd Corps had been smashed, and Nering had lost half his tanks. On January 13th, General Nering, conducting his usual skillful defense, slowed the pace of the Soviet advance. The next day, however, Konev committed his reserves and attacked Nering with three armies. Under attack by the 4th Tank and 6th Guards Tank Armies, the defense of the 24th Panzer Corps finally broke on January 15th, and Nering fell back to the west. By now the weather had cleared, and the Red Air Force pelted the Germans with hundreds of fighter-bomber and bomber sorties. The Luftwaffe could mount virtually none. To the north, General Rechtnagel rallied part of the 42nd Corps, but was soon nearly surrounded. Rechtnagel was killed by a Soviet tank shell on January 15th, and the survivors of his corps fell back in disorder. Everywhere, German communications broke down. In four days, the Russians gained 60 miles. By January 17th, Konev's spearheads had crossed the Varta. Six days after the offensive began, he had penetrated 100 miles along a 160-mile front. Meanwhile, Zhukov's first Belarusian front began its offensive on January 14th. General of Panzer Troops Baron Smilo von Lutwitz, the commander of the Ninth Army, expected the attack but had little with which to meet it. By January 16th, the Soviets had smashed his seven understrength divisions, the city of Radom had fallen, and Warsaw faced a double envelopment. On January 15th alone, the Soviet 16th Air Army flew 3,400 sorties in support of Zhukov's armies against 42 for the Luftwaffe. South of Warsaw, Walter Fries's 46th Panzer Corps, guarding the route to Posen, tried to avoid encirclement, was attacked by the 2nd Guards Tank Army, and pushed north of the Vistula. 
Recognizing the unfolding disaster on January 16th, OKW gave General von Lutwitz freedom to conduct his own battle, including the authority to order the evacuation of Warsaw. Lutwitz issued the order immediately. Hitler returned to Berlin later that day and promptly countermanded Lutwitz's order to abandon the Polish capital. By the time Lieutenant General Friedrich Weber, the commander of Division Warsaw and Commandant of the city, received Hitler's order, the evacuation was already well underway. The general who had commanded the 334th Infantry Division in Tunisia in 1934 let the evacuation proceed. Warsaw was occupied by the First Polish Army on January 17th. Hitler was furious over the loss of Warsaw and his, correct, suspicion that his orders were being circumvented. The first scapegoat was Colonel General Josef Harpa, the commander-in-chief of Army Group A, who was relieved of his command on January 16th. Though he was an officer who still believed in the Fuhrer and his destiny, he was sacked because he had failed to stop an offensive that Hitler had denied would ever take place. Harpa was replaced by the brutal Colonel General Ferdinand Schirner, who was succeeded as Commander-in-Chief of Army Group North by Colonel General Dr. Lothar Rendulich, a longtime Austrian Nazi. Naturally, Baron Smilo von Lutwitz was also sacked. His replacement was General of Infantry Theodor Busse, Manstein's former Chief of Staff, who had most recently commanded the First Corps on the Eastern Front. Busse owed his appointment to his connections at Führer headquarters. He and General of Infantry Wilhelm Burgdorf had married sisters, and Busse spoke to his brother-in-law on the telephone almost every night. Lieutenant General Friedrich Weber's explanation that he had already destroyed his supplies and was in the process of pulling out of Warsaw when the Fuhrer's last order arrived at least kept him out of prison, which is more than three of Guderian's staff officers could say. On Hitler's orders, Colonel Bogoslav von Bonen and Lieutenant Colonels Klaus von dem Knesebeck and Hans Hennig von Christen were arrested at gunpoint by Major General Ernst Meisel, the deputy chief of the Army Personnel Office. Guderian tried to intercede on their behalf, pointing out that as chief of the general staff, he alone was responsible for the actions of his subordinates, and that if anyone should be arrested, it should be he. No, said the Fuhrer, it's not you I'm after, but the general staff. It is intolerable to me that a group of intellectuals should presume to press their views on their superiors. But such is the general staff system, and that system I intend to smash. Hitler ordered that the Warsaw affair be thoroughly investigated, and Guderian himself was subjected to lengthy interrogations by Heinrich Müller, the chief of the Gestapo, and his boss, Ernst Kaltenbrunner, the chief of the Reich Main Security Office, RSHA. Walter Fries, the one-armed, one-legged commander of the 46th Panzer Corps, who had given Patton so much trouble in northern Sicily a year and a half before, was relieved of his command on January 20th and court-martialed. He was found not guilty, but was nevertheless sent into professional exile and was never re-employed. He had been promoted to general of panzer troops less than two months before. On January 19th, while the Soviets advanced into Silesia, Hitler issued a directive that stripped away the last vestiges of his field general's tactical authority. Henceforth, no commander from division upwards could attack, counterattack, or retreat without the Fuhrer's personal approval. Of Army Group A's armies, only the 17th Army had managed to retreat in any order because it was the only one the Soviets had not managed to attack with overwhelming forces. In a single week, the Soviets had smashed the entire 9th Army, and the 4th Panzer Army controlled only 8th Corps, which consisted of the remnants of the 168th Infantry Division and the 408th Replacement Division, 
and a few odds and ends. The bulk of the army under General Nering was trapped in a pocket, encircled by a dozen Soviet armies miles to the east. General Nering faced a desperate situation, but no field commander had more experience with panzer operations than he did. Nering formed a floating pocket and drove northwest toward the remnants of the 4th Panzer Army. On January 22nd, on the Varta River near Shiraz, he linked up with General of Panzer Troops Dietrich von Zalken's Großdeutschland Panzer Corps. Zalken was a cavalryman who habitually wore a sword and a monocle. He was openly contemptuous of Hitler's Brauner Banda, Brown Mob. He was also a superb panzer commander. Zalken promptly put himself under Nering's command. The veteran panzer leader now controlled the Großdeutschland Corps, as well as the remnants of his own 24th Panzer, the 56th Panzer, and the 42nd Corps, eight infantry and Volksgrenadier divisions, two panzer and two panzer grenadier divisions. His success in holding his perimeter and cutting a swath west was an incredible feat of tactical genius. Generals Nering and von Zalken performed feats of military virtuosity during these days that only the pen of a new Xenophon could adequately describe, Guderian wrote later. Nering and von Zalken finally fought their way through to the Oder and linked up with Army Group A at the end of January. By the time they arrived, they had more refugees than soldiers under their command. But Nering's and von Salken's successes were the exceptions. Every other German corps and division was routed. On January 22nd, the leading elements of the First Ukrainian Front reached the Oder. During the next three days, Konev's forces covered 140 miles to join them. Grazer's 4th Panzer Army held Breslau, but lacked sufficient forces to block or counterattack the Reds as they crossed the river unopposed north and south of the city. Also on January 22nd, Zhukov reached Posen, Poznania, the capital of the German administrative province of Wortegau, Poland, and headquarters of Wehrkreis, German Military District 21. The area's fortress commandant was Major General Ernst Gunnell, who had 11 replacement training battalions, mostly made up of raw recruits, 17 battalions of Volkssturm, and ad hoc units from sundry sources. In all, he had a garrison of 10,000 men, including Luftwaffe ground crewmen, stragglers whose units had been dispersed or overrun, and local police and security personnel. Most of them were of little military value. The muscle of Posen's defense lay in its officer training school, where about 2,000 highly motivated Fahnenjunkern and well-trained veteran second lieutenants fought fiercely street by street, delaying the Russian advance by a month. By February 22nd, however, the garrison's survivors were isolated in the citadel, Fort Vignara. That night, General Gunnell went to his quarters, spread a German battle flag on the floor, stretched out on it, and shot himself in the head. Every German officer who tried to escape was caught by the Soviets and shot. On February 23rd, Major General Ernst Matern, the city commandant, surrendered the remainder of the garrison, including about 2,000 wounded. Those who could walk were relieved of their watches, boots, and in some cases, even their trousers. The Russians marched them through the city for several days, while Poles pelted them with rocks. Prisoners who could not walk, the Soviets incinerated with flamethrowers. The Isolation of East Prussia At the beginning of December 1944, Reinhardt's Army Group Center defended East Prussia, holding a 360-mile front, with 33 infantry and 12 panzer or panzer grenadier divisions. 
With a reserve of nine mobile divisions, the average forward division had to hold ten miles of front. From this position of relative strength, Reinhardt was confident he could hold East Prussia. By the beginning of 1945, however, he had fallen victim to Hitler's policy of robbing one front to reinforce another, and had lost five panzer divisions and two cavalry brigades to other army groups. OKH ordered him to give up another panzer division, but he balked, and when the Soviet offensive struck Army Group Center, he still had it. The battle for East Prussia began on January 13th, when four armies and two tank corps from General Ivan Chernyakovsky's 3rd Belarusian Front attacked the 3rd Panzer Army at Stalapunin and Pilkalen in the northern sector of Army Group Center. To the south, General Konstantin Rokossovsky's second Belarusian front launched the main offensive due north from the Narev bridgehead the next day and struck Colonel General Walter Weiss's second army with five armies, including a tank army. The Soviets had begun a great pincer movement north and south of the Missourian lakes aimed at enveloping Army Group Center bypassing at first Hosbach's 4th Army, which was defending the Lake District. On January 15th, Reinhardt committed the 7th Panzer and Grossdeutschland Panzer Grenadier Divisions, his army group reserves, to the battle. Later that day, however, Hitler transferred Zalkin's Grossdeutschland Panzer Corps to Army Group A, significantly weakening the defense. When the weather cleared, allowing the Soviet 4th Air Army to fly 2,500 sorties a day against German positions, and Rokossovsky committed two more tank corps to the battle, the Red Army advanced. By January 19th, Rokossovsky had broken through along a 70-mile front to a depth of up to 40 miles and captured the Polish cities of Mwawa and Modlin. He crossed the old Prussian-Polish frontier on January 20th. That morning, the wife of the chief of the general staff of the army left Dippenhof, her family's estate in the Wortegau, just half an hour before Russian artillery shelled the place. The Guderians lost their remaining possessions, most of which had already been destroyed when Allied bombs struck their Berlin home in September 1943. A homeless refugee, she joined her husband in Zosen and remained with him for the rest of the war. The German Second Army, which lacked the mobility of the Soviets, retreated as rapidly as it could, and there were signs of disorder bordering on disintegration. The roads were clogged with refugees and fleeing soldiers. The 46th Panzer Corps, now under Lieutenant General Martin Garis, Theoretically had four divisions, but all were in remnants, and none amounted to more than a regiment. Lieutenant General Walter Meltzer's 23rd Corps consisted of only the 152nd Replacement Division, the Understrength 5th Jaeger Division, and the 7th Infantry Division, which was a Kampfgruppe, a division so reduced by casualties that it had the combat value of a regiment. Supply and fuel depots and other facilities were abandoned without being blown up. On January 21st, the Reds reached Tannenberg, now Stembark, Poland, where the Germans had defeated the Tsar's forces in 1914. They found that the German engineers had already destroyed the landmark memorial to the Great Battle and removed the remains of Generalfeldmarschall and former German Chancellor Paul von Hindenburg and his wife. By January 22nd, the Second Army was routed. On the evening of January 23rd, the spearhead of the Fifth Guards Tank Army rolled into the town of Elbing, now Elblanc, Poland, near the Baltic Sea, and cut the last land route from East Prussia to the rest of the Reich. They found the shops still open and the factory workers still at work. They had advanced 125 miles in 12 days and had trapped the German 3rd Panzer and 4th Armies, as well as part of the 2nd, in East Prussia, 
along with hundreds of thousands of German civilians. Meanwhile, the northern Soviet pincer hit Colonel General Erhard Rouse's 3rd Panzer Army. When the offensive began, the 3rd Panzer had been reduced to mainly Folk's Grenadier Divisions and had only two mobile units, the outstanding 5th Panzer Division and the mediocre 10th Bicycle Jaeger Brigade. It also had the excellent East Prussian 1st Infantry Division, which was defending its own soil. Rouse's men put up a heroic defense, and the Soviets did not capture Tilsit, now Sovetsk, Russia, until January 18th. It would be almost three months before the Red Army was able to enter Königsberg, the ancient capital of East Prussia. The Soviet offensive had succeeded in isolating Army Group Center with 27 of its divisions, but not in enveloping and destroying it. Raus retreated only very slowly, but he was forced to retreat. This endangered the rear of Hosbach's 4th Army, which was still holding the Missourian Lakes District. But Hitler demanded that the Lützen Line in the Missourian Lakes be held at all costs. Guderian also signaled Reinhardt that there would be no more retreats. Since the Lützen Line was already outflanked, Hosbach ignored the orders of both Hitler and Guderian and continued his evacuation. With the approval of General Reinhardt, he was preparing to launch a breakout attack to the west, into the rear of 2nd Belarusian Front, with the intention of linking up with Weiss's 2nd Army in West Prussia. On January 26th, however, Hitler learned what was happening. He flew into a rage and sacked both Reinhardt and Hosbach and their chiefs of staff. Reinhardt had to be replaced in any case. He had incurred a serious head wound during a Soviet air attack the day before. Colonel General Rendulich was named Commander-in-Chief of Army Group North, formerly Center, and Hosbach was replaced as Commander of Fourth Army by General of Infantry Friedrich Wilhelm Müller, a strong Nazi whose great courage far exceeded his intelligence. He had earned a reputation for brutality in the Balkans and would meet his death in 1947 at the hands of a Greek firing squad. Heinrich von Fietinghoff, the acting commander-in-chief of OB Southwest in Italy, replaced Rendulich in the Courland pocket. These were not the only changes Hitler made on January 26th. In a move designed to confuse readers and historians alike, he changed the names of several of his army groups. Army Group North became Army Group Courland. Army Group Center became Army Group North. Army Group A became Army Group Center. Army Groups South and F did not change their names, but a new army group, Vistula, was created from the staff of OB Upper Rhine, at the suggestion of General Guderian. Its missions were to plug the gap between army groups north and center, defend Pomerania and Danzig, and block the Soviets' path to Berlin. For the post of commander-in-chief of Army Group Vistula, Guderian nominated, and thought he had General Yodel's support as OKW Chief of Operations, Field Marshal Maximilian von Weichs, the commander-in-chief of Army Group F. Jodl, however, reneged on their agreement and made a sneering remark about Baron von Weichs's deep religious convictions, effectively killing his nomination. Hitler's choice for the post fell to none other than Heinrich Himmler, the Reichsfuhrer SS, who had done such a poor job on the southern sector of the Western Front. His chief of staff was SS Lieutenant General Heinz Lammerding, a veteran combat officer, but one without general staff training. Moreover, Lammerding, like many Waffen-SS officers, was contemptuous of Himmler. When Guderian first visited the headquarters of Army Group Vistula, Lammerding greeted him with the words, Can't you rid us of our commander? The chief of the general staff responded evasively, even though behind the scenes he was trying to rid the new Army Group of both Himmler and Lammerding. Himmler's new command consisted of what was left of Buse's Ninth Army, the remnant of Weiss's Second Army that had not been cut off in East Prussia, 
and General of Waffen-SS Felix Steiner's 11th SS Army, which was activated on January 26th and did not yet have a single division. It was formed from part of the staff, OB Upper Rhine, and was sometimes referred to as the 11th SS Panzer Army. Himmler came east in his very long and luxuriously outfitted private train, the Steiermark, which he parked at the station at Deutschkrona. It was totally divorced from the miserable columns of refugees who trekked by the train heading west. Himmler's only knowledge of the military situation came from occasional outdated situation reports. His command was as motley a collection of units as one could imagine, and had they faced an immediate major Soviet offensive, they would likely have collapsed. But Hitler reinforced Himmler's army group Vistula with a panzer division and four infantry divisions drawn from army group Courland. On January 22nd, Hitler ordered OB West to transfer headquarters 6th Panzer Army, soon to be redesignated 6th SS Panzer Army, and the headquarters of the 1st SS and 2nd SS Panzer Corps, as well as six Panzer Divisions, a Folks Grenadier Division, and several Folks Artillery Corps, to the Eastern Front. Despite Guderian's heated objections, Hitler sent the bulk of these units to Hungary, where he was planning another offensive. The Russians, meanwhile, overran East Prussia, subjecting it to unspeakable atrocities. In some districts, every female between the ages of 12 and 70 was raped, some of them by as many as 20 men. Their husbands and parents were often forced to watch. Many girls were murdered, followed by the parents. The victims were often tortured to death. Some were even crucified. Other Germans were arrested and shipped off to Siberian slave labor camps, where they would likely die. In the Soviet-occupied districts of eastern Germany, 1,300,000 people disappeared. Word of Soviet behavior spread like wildfire. Many of the citizens of the eastern districts either fled to the west, toward Germany proper, or to the Reich's northern ports. More by accident than design, they formed huge columns on the roads. Some traveled by cart, some by wagon, and others simply walked. There was very little conversation in these refugee treks. Even the children were too tired and hungry to cry or whine. The people trudged along without food, water, or rest, and children and babies died by the score in the bitter East European winter. The Germans resorted to unusual methods to save their children, many of whom were without shoes. Adults could wear mended shoes, but children outgrew their shoes. Even if a family had enough money and coupons to buy them, the stores rarely had any. One lady I know told me that she fled East Prussia in 1945 in shoes her mother had fashioned out of cow manure. The refugee columns, called treks, were often strafed by Soviet fighter bombers, shelled by Russian artillery, or machine-gunned by the Red Army. At least two treks were ground to bits under the treads of Soviet tanks. Still, they pushed north toward the ports. Behind them, the remnants of the German Wehrmacht in East Prussia tried to shield them, while the German Navy evacuated them to the west. Under the overall command of Grand Admiral Karl Dönitz, the task of organizing the evacuation of the refugees fell to General Admiral Otto Kumetz, the leader of Naval Command East, and his men. Kumetz sent in everything that would float, including more than a dozen liners of 10,000 tons or more. Rear Admiral Bernhard Roga, the commander of fleet training formations and the former commander of the commerce raider Atlantis, particularly distinguished himself during the evacuation. An estimated 60,000 people were waiting on the docks by late January 1945. Coming to their rescue was the Wilhelm Gustloff. In normal times, she was a cruise ship with a crew of 400 and room for 1,465 passengers. 
During the war, she was converted into a hospital ship and a floating barracks. Now, with a crew of 173, she served as a transport ship, taking aboard 918 sailors from the Navy's 2nd U-Boat Training Division, 373 female naval auxiliaries, 162 wounded soldiers, and more than 6,500 refugees. One source puts this total at 8,956 refugees, bringing the total number of passengers to 10,582. On the night of January 30th, 1945, the Wilhelm Gustloff heaved into the Baltic Sea, which was crusted with ice flows and peppered by snow flurries. If worse came to worst, there was room for 5,600 people in the lifeboats and rafts. The senior military commander on the Wilhelm Gustloff was a man who had already missed his place in history. On October 30, 1939, just west of the Orkney Islands, Lieutenant Wilhelm Zahn, the commander of U-56, had boldly and skillfully evaded a dozen British escort vessels and fired three torpedoes into HMS Nelson, the flagship of the British home fleet. Two of the torpedoes hit the Nelson but did not explode. Defective torpedoes were a common problem for the German Navy in 1939-40. The guests on board the Nelson that day included Lord of the Admiralty Sir Winston Churchill, Admiral of the Fleet and First Sea Lord Sir Dudley Pound, and Admiral Sir Charles Forbes, the Commander-in-Chief of the Home Fleet, as well as a dozen other Royal Navy luminaries. The Nelson sailed on, and Zahn became known throughout the U-boat force as the man who almost killed Churchill. Zahn's failure to achieve this feat sent him into a severe depression, and Admiral Karl Dönitz, the commander-in-chief of the German submarine branch, relieved him of his command. Zahn was transferred to the training command as an instructor. It took him more than a year to shake his depression, but he did and Dernitz gave him a new command, U-69, in the fall of 1941. Zahn led it on one failed patrol, during which he exhibited a lack of aggression and skill, firing four torpedoes and missing four times. Dernitz relieved him again. He was transferred to the Baltic, then considered a backwater training area, where he languished until 1945. He was nevertheless promoted to lieutenant commander, Corvettenkapitän, in 1943. Though he was the senior military commander aboard the Wilhelm Gustloff, the ship was under the command of a merchant marine captain, Friedrich Petersen. The ship had only one escort vessel, and against Zahn's advice, Petersen decided to put into deep water rather than hug the coast, use his navigation lights rather than run in darkness, and travel at 12 knots rather than push the vessel to its maximum speed of 16. The only argument Zahn won was in persuading Peterson to sail in a zigzag rather than linear path. The outside temperature was negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit with rough seas and high winds. 25 miles offshore, the Gustloff was spotted by S-13, a Stalinets-class submarine, commanded by Captain Third Class Alexander Marinesco. At 9.08 p.m. on January 30th, S-13 fired four torpedoes at the liner. One hung in the tube. The other three struck the port side of the Wilhelm Gustloff. About 300 people were killed in the initial explosion. Water rushed into the engine rooms and the engines immediately stopped. The internal telephones and public address system also went dead. Officers on the bridge could hear noises below and knew that some of the bulkheads had already collapsed. The ship tried to send an SOS, but the main radio had been knocked out and the emergency sets were not functioning properly. The radio operator grabbed an army transmitter and began sending out SOS signals. Unfortunately, this transmitter only had a range of 2,000 meters, far too short to reach naval headquarters. The signal reached the Gustloff's escort vessel, the Löwe, which immediately retransmitted it over its more powerful radio, 
Unfortunately, over the frequency reserved for the U-boat division, not the 9th Escort Division, which was headquartered at Schwinnemunde and had vessels in the area within easy sailing distance of the Gustlov. The 9th Escort did eventually receive the message and immediately headed for the scene, but it arrived too late to save many from the liner. The first torpedo had struck the crew's quarters, killing most of the off-duty crew or trapping them behind the bulkheads, which were sealed off to prevent the ship from sinking immediately. They were drowned, and unlike them, the U-boat sailors were not trained in helping passengers board lifeboats. The second torpedo struck just below the former swimming pool where the naval auxiliary girls were billeted. The third torpedo hit amidships in the forward area of the engine room, ripping open the hull, destroying the engines, and sending the ship sinking. Gertrude Agnesens, a 17-year-old auxiliary, shared a cabin with five other girls. She was in bed when the submarine attacked. Jumping from her bed, she stepped into ankle-deep water. By the time she had grabbed a flashlight, the water was up to her thighs. She vaguely remembered seeing an emergency exit sign and rushed in that direction. Nobody followed her. The surviving girls, most of the auxiliaries were killed in the torpedo blast, ran for the main staircase. She emerged on a deck where thousands of panic-stricken passengers were trying to ascend stairs because the ship was sinking. Small children and anyone who fell were trampled by the mob. Gertruda was very lucky. She had a life jacket on and was one of the 252 survivors the Luva plucked from the freezing Baltic. By now, the crew had repaired the intercom and the bridge was calling for calm, but it was too late to stem the panic. One officer announced there were enough lifeboats for everybody. There might have been two had everyone kept their heads, but even many of the crew did not. A dozen crewmen took a lifeboat for themselves, even though the boat had room for fifty people. A lieutenant opened fire on it. This did no good, since it was already at sea and his bullets missed the mark, but it probably made him feel better. Several lifeboats were badly launched and capsized, throwing their passengers into the sea. Courageous orderlies tried to help the badly wounded soldiers and pregnant women in the emergency hospital just forward of the bridge and managed to save a few. Among those who escaped in a lifeboat was Captain Peterson, who had a well-placed VIP lifeboat available for just such an emergency. Veteran U-boat Commander Zahn then took charge of the ship, sealing the bulkheads, checking the pumps, and trying to buy time. When the ship's list reached 25 degrees and the waves were hitting the windows of the bridge, he ordered that the ship's codes and papers be destroyed. At that moment, a steward appeared, still wearing his white jacket. A final cognac, gentlemen, he exclaimed. The officers and men drank together and then threw their glasses. Forty-five minutes after the torpedoes hit, Zahn heard the last bulkheads and waterproof doors give way under the pressure of thousands of tons of water. The Gustloff shuddered and fell over on her port side, trapping the pumping crews. Only two managed to escape through an air vent. Meanwhile, passengers slid down the enclosed decks, through the glass windows, and into the sea. The ship's funnels were now parallel to the water, and at least 2,000 people were trapped on the lower promenade deck. For a moment, the window of the bridge cleared, and Zahn saw a mother tossing her baby to two men in a raft. The child fell into the water, and she jumped into the freezing sea. Both disappeared forever. As the boat went down, shots rang out behind the watertight doors. Men preferred shooting themselves, and in some cases their families, to a more horrifying death by drowning. Commander Zahn spotted two sailors trying to untie a raft. Holding onto the railing, he moved toward them, but a large wave hit and threw them all into the sea. Zahn went under, but was pulled to the surface by his life jacket. He saw hundreds of heads bobbing in the water and between twenty and thirty empty rafts nearby and close together. 
He boarded one and then hopped to another, trying to get as far away from the Wilhelm Gustloff as possible. He finally fell exhausted on the fifth or sixth raft. Behind him, the Wilhelm Gustloff sank. As it went under, the boiler room exploded, and the sirens, generators, and lighting system were jolted to life. Suddenly, it seemed that every light in the ship had come on, one survivor recalled. The ship plunged to the depths, its sirens howling. Men in the lifeboats didn't want them swamped, and clubbed or shot would-be boarders. Even those on the rafts and in the lifeboats were unlikely to survive. Many were up to their knees in freezing water and melted snow. Most died of exposure. Zahn and dozens of others were saved by T-36, a torpedo boat commanded by Lieutenant Commander Robert Herring. Though Soviet submarines were in the area, he persisted in his rescue operations. Three pregnant women he rescued gave birth that night. In all, of the 1,239 people rescued from the Wilhelm Gustloff, T-36 rescued 564 of them and Herring's torpedo boat was already carrying 250 refugees before the liner was hit. The loss of life from the Wilhelm Gustloff disaster was more than that of the sinkings of the Titanic, Lusitania, Athenia, Andrea Doria, and Empress of Ireland combined. Five times as many people died in the sinking of the Wilhelm Gustloff as died in the Titanic disaster. On January 31st, after every other German boat had abandoned the search for survivors, VP-1703, a worn-out dispatch boat, moved cautiously through the ice flows and discovered a lifeboat with several people huddled together. They had frozen to death. But hidden beneath the frozen corpses, Petty Officer Werner Fisch found a baby boy, blue with cold but still alive. The petty officer took him to the warm cabin of VP-1703, where he slowly revived. Werner Fisch adopted the child and raised him as his own son. For the next four months, the German Navy evacuated refugees despite the constant danger of Soviet submarine or air attack. The news of the Wilhelm Gustloff affected the refugees not at all. They still lined up at the docks, preferring to take their chances at sea, to falling into the hands of the Red Army. Even when the Soviet fighter bombers attacked the harbors, they did not move or run for cover because it might cost them their place in line. Another disaster occurred shortly after midnight on February 10, 1945. The Generalsteuben, a 14,600 ton luxury liner built in 1922, was hit by two Soviet torpedoes. It sank in seven minutes. Aboard were 100 crewmen, 1,000 evacuated wounded, 30 doctors, 320 nurses, and at least 2,000 refugees. Only 300 of them survived. On April 16, 1945, Germany suffered yet another naval disaster when a Red Navy submarine sank the freighter-turned-troop transport ship the Goya, killing an estimated 7,000 with only 183 survivors. Aboard was the elite 35th Panzer Regiment, perhaps the most heavily decorated tank regiment in the Wehrmacht. It was almost totally wiped out. The evacuation of East Prussian refugees and military units continued until the second week in May 1945. According to Grand Admiral Dernitz, 2,022,602 refugees were successfully evacuated. This was more than two-thirds of the 1939 population of the province and one of the largest evacuations in human history. More than 98% of those picked up by the German Navy were successfully transported to northern Germany or Denmark and were behind the Anglo-American Allied lines when the war ended. They were homeless and had lost virtually everything they had, but they were the lucky ones. By the last week in January 1945, the Soviets had bridgeheads over the Oder north of Kustren and south of Frankfurt and were only 40 miles from the capital of the Third Reich. 
Here, however, the massive Soviet offensive came to a sudden and unexpected halt. On January 27th and 28th, a blizzard blew across Central Europe. When it stopped, the temperature rose rapidly, the snow melted, and Soviet tanks stalled in the mud. Himmler hailed the warm spell as a gift from fate, but the thaw served Zhukov's interests as well. His troops had advanced 250 miles, and he wanted to regroup and resupply his legions before the final assault on Berlin. On February 10th, after a pause of almost two weeks, the Russians resumed their offensive when the Second Belarusian Front attacked Weiss's Second Army with hundreds of tanks and about 40 rifle divisions. Their objective was to reach the Baltic Sea and isolate the West Prussian ports of Gdynia and Danzig from the Reich. The Soviets pushed forward, but the German resistance was fierce, and after ten days and having gained nothing of importance, General Rokossovsky called off the battle. While Zhukov, Konev, and Rosakovsky rested their men and prepared for the next offensive, Guderian and Hitler quarreled over strategy. Guderian wanted to evacuate the Courland pocket, but Hitler refused. Their heated arguments almost became violent. On one occasion, Major General Wolfgang Tomala, the chief of staff of the Panzer Inspectorate, actually grabbed Guderian and pulled him back because he thought Hitler was going to physically assault him. Another argument threw Hitler into such a hateful frenzy that even Hermann Goering, who was certainly no friend of the army general staff, felt compelled to intervene. He took Guderian by the arm and led him into another room, where they had coffee together, and the panzer general regained his composure. Army Group Courland, which controlled the 16th and 18th armies, remained where it was. Guderian thought he saw an opportunity to strengthen the German hold on Pomerania by cutting off the Russians north of the Varta. His plan called for a double envelopment east of the Oder. Zepp Dietrich's 6th SS Panzer Army would lead one attack. Erhard Rauss's 3rd Panzer Army would lead the other, but would first have to be withdrawn from East Prussia. Hitler liked the idea of resuming the offensive, but amended Guderian's plan. He approved a single-pronged attack in the vicinity of Stargard. The 3rd Panzer Army could be recalled from East Prussia to assist, but the 6th SS Panzer would continue to Hungary. Unfortunately for Guderian, this meant Himmler's army group Vistula would direct the offensive, and Guderian doubted the Reichsfuhrer SS could handle what would be a difficult assignment for even a well-trained and experienced commander. OKH performed miracles by pulling ten divisions, seven of them panzer, out of the front lines, earmarking them for the offensive. Though Allied bombings, fuel shortages, and damaged German railroads slowed their assembly. OKH forbade Army Group Vistula from using the new assault divisions prior to the offensive, but Himmler felt compelled to commit several of them prematurely to prevent the Soviets from overrunning his assembly areas. On February 9th, he told Guderian that he might not be ready to attack on February 16th as originally planned. This merely confirmed Himmler's incompetence in the mind of the strong-willed and opinionated chief of the general staff. He therefore proposed that Lieutenant General Walter Wenck, the chief of operations and deputy chief of staff of OKH, supersede Lammerding as chief of staff of Army Group Vistula so he could direct the attack. Adolf Hitler liked this handsome, outspoken young general staff officer. Despite his coming from an officer corps, he distrusted as defeatist. In their first recorded meeting, Wenck told Hitler that the Eastern Front was like Swiss cheese, full of holes. Hitler did not, however, like Guderian's proposal of appointing Wenck to lead the attack, and this led to another battle royal at the Reich Chancellery on February 13th. 
In Himmler's presence, Guderian told Hitler that if Wenck were not attached to the army group staff, the attack would fail. Hitler denied that Reichsfuhrer SS Himmler was incapable of carrying out his duties. Guderian nevertheless continued to demand that Wenck be placed in charge of the attack. Hitler trembled with rage. He was almost screaming, his eyes seemed about to pop out of his head, and the veins stood out on his temples, Guderian recalled. I had never seen Hitler rave so violently. At the end of each outburst, the chief of the general staff retained his icy composure and repeated his demand. Finally, Hitler realized that Guderian was not going to give in, no matter how long and furiously he screamed. Suddenly, he stopped and calmly told Himmler that General Wenck would arrive at his headquarters that night to take charge of the attack. Later, Guderian retired to an anteroom and sat down. Here, Field Marshal Keitel, the commander-in-chief of OKW, found him and berated him for causing the Fuhrer to get so excited. What if he had had a stroke, Keitel asked. Keitel had supported Hitler in the argument. A statesman must be prepared to be contradicted and to listen to the truth, for otherwise he is unworthy of the name, Guderian answered coldly. Wenck inherited an operation that was already going astray. To meet Guderian's deadline, he would have to attack piecemeal, as there was no way he could assemble the attack divisions in time. After he inspected the initial preparations, which were made by General of Waffen-SS Felix Steiner's 11th SS Army, Wenck became even more pessimistic. The staff work had been done badly. The troops were not properly assembled, supplied, or equipped. Meanwhile, the advanced elements of Erhard Rauss's 3rd Panzer Army headquarters arrived from East Prussia to spearhead the Stargardt counteroffensive as Wenck's Pomeranian operation was called. Rouse had serious reservations about launching the attack, and, after inspecting his new divisions, even doubted if Pomerania could be held. Pleading lack of familiarity with the local situation, he opted out of directing the attack. It would be left to Steiner. Rouse was further amazed when, on the eve of the attack, Himmler told him that both he and Hitler were convinced that this offensive would decide the entire outcome of the war in favor of Germany. Unfortunately, Hitler required General Wenck to attend Führer conferences each evening, which meant he had to make a round trip of almost 200 miles every day after his demanding frontline duties. On the night of February 14th to 15th, on the way back to Army Group headquarters, the exhausted general took the wheel from his driver, Hermann Dorn, who had collapsed from fatigue. Wenck fell asleep at the wheel and crashed into the parapet of a bridge on the berlin stettin Autobahn. Dorn dragged the general from the flaming wreck, doused his burning clothes, and got him to a hospital. He had suffered a fractured skull, five broken ribs, and multiple contusions. The offensive was scheduled to begin in about five hours. Wenck was replaced as deputy chief of the general staff and acting chief of staff of Army Group Vistula by General of Infantry Hans Krebs, a veteran staff officer who was a close friend of General Burgdorf. He lacked Wenck's talent, was unfamiliar with the local situation, and the attack came to nothing. Meanwhile, the conquered districts of eastern Germany were subjected to a reign of terror. Refugees from the Baltic states, east and west Prussia, Pomerania, and Upper Silesia told hair-raising tales of rape, pillage, and murder. Historian John Toland wrote, The refugees reported that advancing frontline Soviet troops were well-disciplined and well-behaved, but that the secondary units that followed were a disorganized rabble. In wild, drunken orgies, these Red Army men had murdered, looted, and raped. Many Russian commanders, the refugees claimed, appeared to condone the actions of their men. At least they made no effort to stop them. From peasants to gentry, the accounts were the same. 
and everywhere in the flood of refugees there were women who told chilling stories of brutal assault, of being forced at gunpoint to strip and then submit to repeated rapings. As the Russian armies neared their homes, thousands of refugees fled on foot or in farm wagons through blizzards and bitterly cold weather. They suffered from frostbite, died from exposure, were strafed and bombed by the Red Air Force, and were pursued by Red Army tanks. Dozens of babies died because it was too cold for them to nurse. Those who remained behind were subjected to extreme cruelty. In the past, Red Army officers had kept their soldiers obedient through threats of draconic punishment. Now, however, they were set loose against civilians. Even in friendly Yugoslavia, they acted barbarically. The Red Army only crossed the northeast corner of that country, and then only for a short period of time. Yet there were 1,200 reported cases of looting and 121 cases of rape. In all but ten of these incidents, the rape victim was also murdered. The German record in the East was abysmal, especially toward Jews, Poles, Gypsies, and Soviet prisoners of war, and nothing can excuse it. This was especially true for the civil administration, the SS, the security police, and the Einsatzgruppen, murder squads. The German army, however, had generally, but not always, behaved correctly and certainly did not engage in the orgy of rape, murder, destruction, and plunder that characterized the Red Army's drive through Eastern Europe. Many Germans, hoping the reports of Soviet atrocities were exaggerated, did not want to leave their homes or farms and fell into the hands of the Soviet Army or the Communist Poles who followed them. They were beaten, robbed, raped, and murdered. Hospitals were frequently attacked. The doctors were murdered, the nurses raped and sometimes murdered, and the patients were either left to starve or were thrown out of upper-story windows along with discarded nurses. The lucky ones were shot in the head. In some villages, everyone in uniform was executed, including postmen and foresters. In other towns, all Nazi party members were hunted down and killed. Men and women were dragged to death behind jeeps or horses. Members of the nobility and the clergy often received the most brutal treatment because they were regarded as communist class enemies. They were blinded, tortured, and mutilated. Communist sadism was rampant. The Western Allies seemed to have no illusions about their brothers in arms. Stalin had told Churchill that after the war, the Soviet Union would need four million German laborers indefinitely. And he spoke, to Churchill's horror, of the liquidation of 50,000 German officer prisoners of war. Before the firebombing of Dresden, Anglo-American pilots were instructed to try to reach Allied lines if they found themselves in trouble. If this was impossible, they were to bail out in German-held territory. Under no circumstances were they to come down behind Soviet lines. After the initial red wave of terror, the deportations began, as civilians were rounded up and sent to the Soviet Union to work as slave laborers. Most of these people were never heard from again. Meanwhile, the loss of some of the Wehrmacht's best and most important officers mounted at an incredible pace. It should be noted that a few of the leaders who were relieved or arrested deserved their fate. Lieutenant General Edgar Feuchtinger, the commander of the 21st Panzer Division, is a prime example. As an artillery major in 1935, he assisted in making the Nuremberg rallies a success. In the process, he befriended several prominent Nazis who took an interest in his career. Feuchtinger was born in Metz in 1894 and joined the Kaiser's army at the outbreak of World War I, beginning as a Fahnenjunker in the Baden 14th Foot Artillery Regiment. Promoted to second lieutenant in 1915, he spent most of the war on the Western Front. Selected for the Reichsheer, he was assigned to the 13th Württemberger Infantry Regiment, 
but managed to return to the artillery as a battery officer in October 1921. Undistinguished before the Nuremberg rallies, he advanced rapidly thereafter, from major in 1935 to lieutenant general in 1944. He remained in artillery assignments until 1942, most notably as commander of the horse-drawn 227th Artillery Regiment, September 1, 1939 to August 16, 1942, serving in France and in the northern sector of the Eastern Front. Placed in Führer Reserve, he was given command of a Kampfgruppe, battle group, of the 10th Panzer Division in November 1942. His mission was to prevent Vichy France from destroying the French fleet at Toulon. He was unsuccessful, but was nevertheless given command of Mobile Brigade West. In July 1943, this ad hoc formation was upgraded to 21st Panzer Division. Edgar Feuchtinger was in no way qualified to command a tank division. He owed his command solely to his Nazi Party connections. He performed poorly on D-Day and was in fact absent much of the night of June 5th to 6th, when British paratroopers and glider-borne troops were landing in his division's zone of operations. Feuchtinger's staff finally found him in a sleazy night call in Paris. Feuchtinger's poor performance continued during the Battle of Normandy and in the retreat across France. At the end of 1944, the 21st Panzer was involved in heavy fighting in the Tsar Lautern, when a Nazi lawyer turned up at division headquarters. He was investigating what had happened on D-Day. To his shock, Feuchtinger was not to be found. Subsequent investigation revealed that he was AWOL, away without leave, in bed with his lover in cell. He was relieved of his command and arrested on January 5, 1945. Confined to prison at Fortress Torgau, it was soon discovered that he had enriched himself through the illegal seizure and sale of Jewish assets, as well as army property. He had also communicated military secrets to his South American mistress. He was demoted to canonier, gunner or private, and sentenced to death. He was reprieved, thanks to his Nazi friends, and assigned to the 20th Panzer Grenadier Division, but promptly deserted. He escaped the Nazis and surrendered to the British, whom he hoodwinked, telling them that he had been busted because of his anti-Nazi activities. Later, he also fooled the Americans and went to work for them in Krefeld, where he continued his corrupt lifestyle. He died under mysterious circumstances in a Berlin hotel on January 21st, 1960. Chapter 6. The Russians Close In When the competent but brutal General Rendulich took charge of Army Group North at the end of January 1945, the situation in East Prussia was desperate. General of Infantry Hans Golnik's 28th Corps completed the evacuation of Memel by sea on January 27th and abandoned the city to the Russians. To the south, Janiakovsky's 3rd Belarusian Front had pushed to the outskirts of Königsberg, and south of that, the right flank armies of Rokossovsky's 2nd Belarusian Front had overrun southeastern East Prussia and were approaching Königsberg from the south. At the same time, to the west, the Soviet 3rd Shock Army and elements of the 1st Guards Tank Army lay siege to the small Prussian port of Kohlberg. On March 9th, the German Wehrmacht suffered yet another command shakeup. Hitler sacked Rundstedt as OB West and replaced him with Albert Kesselring. Colonel General Heinrich von Fietinghoff returned to Italy to succeed Kesselring as OB Southwest, while Rendulich returned to Latvia as Commander in Chief of Army Group Courland. General Weiss, the commander of the Second Army, replaced Rendulich as Commander of Army Group North in East Prussia, while Dietrich von Zalken became the Commander of the Second Army. 
Hitler met with Weiss later that day, added Second Army to his command, and instructed him to hold Königsberg and a land corridor to the city, along with the Hela Peninsula, Gdynia, Danzig, Pilau, and the Frische Nährung, also called the Frische Haf or Lagoon. On March 12th, Hitler summoned Zauken to Führer HQ to give him instructions and received a triple insult. Zauken rendered the old army salute, he continued to wear his monocle, a sign of disrespect, and he kept his left hand on his saber, even though it was forbidden to carry a weapon in Hitler's presence. Hitler ignored the insults, but informed Zauken that he would report to Albert Forster, the Nazi Gauleiter of Danzig. The Panzer general rebelled. Striking the map table with the palm of his hand, he snapped, I have no intention, Herr Hitler, of placing myself under the orders of a Gauleiter. This was a fourth and fifth insult. Zauken had refused a direct order and had not used the term Mein Führer. Hitler repeated his command and Zauken repeated his rebuttal. I will not place myself under the orders of a Gauleiter. All right, Zauken, Hitler finally said in a tired voice. Keep the command yourself. He then dismissed the general. Hitler did not shake Zalkin's hand, and Zalkin did not salute. The Soviets launched their East Prussian offensive on March 13th. For ten days, Zalkin's and Weiss's men fiercely contested the Soviet advance. Elements of Rokossovsky's front finally reached the sea at Sopot on March 23rd, cutting off Gdynia and Danzig from the rest of the army group. After prolonged house-to-house -house fighting, Gdynia finally fell on March 28th, and Danzig was lost two days later. The survivors of the Second Army then retreated east into the delta of the Vistula. On March 13th, the Third Belarusian Front launched a series of massive attacks against the Fourth Army, holding a twenty-by-six-mile bridgehead west of Heiligenbeil. By March 26th, under continuous landward assault and aerial and artillery bombardment, the Fourth Army was on the verge of collapse. Hitler finally gave it permission to abandon the Heiligenbeil bridgehead and retreat across the Frischeshof to Nerung, provided the army brought with it all of its panzers and artillery, though of course it was too late for that. On April 1st, after its retreat, 4th Army had 60,000 effective combatants and 70,000 wounded. The Soviets claimed to have taken 46,000 prisoners. With the Heiligenbeil bridgehead eliminated, the Soviets turned their attentions to Königsberg and Zamland. Königsberg, the ancient capital of East Prussia, was defended by General of Infantry Otto Lasch the commander of Wehrkreis I, who had been selected for the post of Commandant of Königsberg because he had a large family and if he surrendered prematurely it would be at risk of Nazi punishment. To defend the city, Lasch had the remnants of six battered divisions plus eight battalions of Volkssturm, about 35,000 men. For the attack, the Russians massed four armies, more than 130,000 men, backed by 500 tanks, several battalions of huge 203mm and 305mm guns, and 2,500 airplanes. The Luftwaffe had fewer than 100 aircraft inside the fortress, and they were operating off the city's main boulevards. Army Detachment Zamland, formerly HQ 28th Corps, and Fortress Königsberg came under the direct command of Fourth Army. Its commander, General Müller, visited the city on April 2nd and confidently told the defenders that they would hold Königsberg while he, Müller, counterattacked and threw the Soviets out of East Prussia. To accomplish this task, Müller took an infantry division from Lasch as well as his only panzer division. Lasch did not believe for one second that Müller had the faintest chance of defeating the Soviets, and he needed every unit he had. 
A heated argument ensued, during which Müller threatened to report Lasch to the Fuhrer for his lack of faith in final victory and national socialism. He then left Königsberg, never to return. Hitler did indeed have full confidence in General Müller. On April 5th, he sacked Colonel General Weiss, disbanded Headquarters Army Group North, and placed Müller in charge of the defense of East Prussia. The staff officers and GHQ troops of the former Army Group North were evacuated from East Prussia by sea to the Reich proper and were used to form the staff of the 12th Army. In addition to his military problems, General Lasch was saddled with the needs of a 100,000 civilians, who were terrorized by the bombardments and the thought of what lay ahead. Gauleiter Erik Koch, however, refused to allow them to evacuate, so they were trapped in the city when the Soviet offensive began on April 6th. By the end of the day, the Red Infantry had already reached the outskirts of the urban area. Lasch signaled Fourth Army, asking permission to withdraw to Zamland, but Müller refused. The following day, April 7th, the road to Zamland was cut. Müller then ordered Lasch to break out, but this was no longer possible. Lasch and his men struggled desperately against the Russian tide, but they never had a chance. Major General Erich Zudau, the commander of the 548th Folks Grenadier Division, was killed in the street fighting and his division was destroyed. With his defenses collapsing everywhere, a severely wounded General Lasch asked for the authority to surrender on April 9th, but permission was denied. He capitulated anyway that same evening. Three days later, Hitler sentenced Lasch to death in absentia and ordered his family arrested by the SS. He also sacked General Müller and dissolved his HQ. His command was absorbed by the indomitable Dietrich von Zalken, who now had sole responsibility for the defense of East Prussia. For two days, Königsberg was a scene of unspeakable atrocities of rape and the murder of about one-fourth of the civilian population and countless German POWs. Gauleiter Erik Koch, however, escaped via icebreaker to Denmark, abandoning his subjects whom he had refused to evacuate, while broadcasting messages to Berlin giving the impression that he was holding out to the last. Once he disembarked in Denmark, the former Reichskommissar of the Ukraine disappeared. After a siege of several weeks, the Russians finally captured Kolberg, now Kołobczyk, Poland, on March 20th. Eighty percent of the city had been destroyed. On April 13th, the Soviets began their attack on Zamland. General Hans Golnik met them with nine understrength divisions, one of them Panzer, about 65,000 men. Fighting was desperate, but the Germans were forced back, and on April 20th, Lieutenant General Kurt Hill was surrounded in Pilau with about 20,000 German soldiers. He managed to hold out for six more days, during which tens of thousands of civilians and a great many soldiers were evacuated by the German Navy. By April 26th, Zalkin's Army of East Prussia, formerly Second Army, was tenaciously holding its last-ditch positions on both sides of the Bay of Danzig and a small beachhead on the Halo Peninsula north of Gdynia. That it survived at all is a major tribute to the courage, skill, and determination of its officers and men. They suffered huge casualties but inflicted even greater losses on their enemies. Reliable Soviet figures are scarce, but during the four weeks before February 10th, the Reds admit that the Second Belarusian Front and the Third Belarusian Front suffered 15 and 22 percent casualties, respectively. These heavy losses and the desperate courage of the German soldat left the Russians unable to break Zalkin's final defensive line. Defeat in the Air while General von Zalken and his men clung to their positions, the U.S. Air Force and the RAF's Bomber Command pounded German cities in the West. 
During the last three months of 1944, British Bomber Command alone dropped 163,000 tons of bombs, compared with 40,000 tons in the same period the year before. Some 53% of this total fell on German cities. Within a hundred-day period, Duisburg, Essen, Cologne, and Dusseldorf were each blasted by 38,000 or more tons of high explosives, and other cities like Ulm, Stuttgart, Karlsruhe, Bonn, Koblenz, Bremen, Wilhelmshaven, Brunswick, and Osnabrück were devastated by British bombing. The U.S. 8th Air Force dropped an even greater tonnage of bombs on German targets. They concentrated on cities with synthetic oil plants, including Gelsenkirchen, Kastrup, Sterkrade, Hanover, Harburg, Hamburg, Botrop, Bolen, and Zeitz. The U.S. 15th Air Force, operating out of Italy, annihilated oil plants, including at Floridsdorf, Vienna, and Linz. An estimated 500,000 to 600,000 Germans were killed by bombs during the 1940 to 1945 period, about ten times the number of civilians killed in Great Britain during the entire war. Between February 1st and April 21st, 1945, Berlin alone was subject to 83 separate air raids involving heavy bombers. By January 1945, the U.S. 8th Air Force alone was sending up 1,500 bombers a day if the weather did not interfere. Magdeburg and Chemnitz were smashed on February 6th, but Dresden got the worst of it. Stalin wanted the city bombed because it was a transportation hub for the tens of thousands of German refugees attempting to escape the Red Terror. On February 13th, the beautiful Saxon capital and cultural center was firebombed with 650,000 incendiaries. The fires could be seen 200 miles away and the city burned for a week. Dresden was packed with refugees, so the death toll can only be guessed, but estimates run from 100,000 to 135,000, all in a single raid. It is probable that twice as many people were killed in this one raid as were killed during the entire Battle of Britain. As one mordant German observer said of the destruction of his country's towns and cities, the Fuhrer was right when he proclaimed that Berlin would be unrecognized in ten years. The veteran Luftwaffe fighter pilots flew out day after day, despite overwhelming odds, trying to stop the onslaught. Lieutenant Otto Kittel, a 27-year-old who had shot down 267 enemy airplanes, was shot down by a Soviet IL-2 on February 14th. Rudy Lintz, who had 70 kills, was shot down by a Spitfire, as was Wilhelm Mink, 72 victories. Friedrich Haas, 74 kills, was shot down by a Soviet MiG, while his wingmate, Franz Schall, 137 kills, died in a crash landing. Gerhard Hoffmann, 125 kills, went missing in action, presumed dead. Major Heinrich Erler, who had shot down 204 enemy airplanes, was killed over the Eastern Front on April 6, 1945, while Colonel Günther Lutzo, 105 aerial victories in World War II and five during the Spanish Civil War, was last seen attacking a B-17 four-engine bomber over Italy on April 24th. Colonel Erich Laia, 118 kills, was killed by a Soviet Yak on March 7th, while Colonel Kurt Bullingen, commander of JG-2, the Richthofen fighter wing, was shot down on the Eastern Front and captured in early 1945. He had 112 kills. Captain Karl Schnürer, who had 46 victories, was shot down defending Hamburg on March 30th and lost a leg, while Colonel Johannes Maki Steinhoff, 176 kills, was horribly burned on April 18th when he unsuccessfully tried to take off from a bomb-cratered runway to attack an American bomber formation. The future commander of the West German Air Force spent the next two years in the hospital.
Günther Rahl, another future general in the West German Luftwaffe, and the number three ace in history with 267 kills, was shot down for the eighth time and received his third severe wound of the war in 1945. He had not recovered when the war ended. Colonel Hans Ulrich Rudel, the leading Stuka ace of the war and a man who personally destroyed more than 750 Soviet tanks and armored vehicles, as well as 150 artillery pieces, 800 soft-skilled vehicles and a battleship, among other pieces of equipment, suffered his sixth wound of the war when Soviet anti-aircraft fire blew off his leg in 1945. Luftwaffe losses were staggering, and by March 1945 there simply were not enough German pilots, especially experienced fighter pilots, left to prevent the Allied bomber formations from attacking whenever and wherever they wanted. Hitler's Last Offensive by mid-February 1945, the Wehrmacht finally reached strategic bankruptcy. In January and February alone, it had lost 660,000 men. The home army lacked the weapons, including small arms and ammunition, to equip new divisions. In January, against a monthly demand for 1,500,000 tank and anti-tank rounds, production fell to 367,000. Despite this hopeless position, with Zhukov's spearheads within 70 miles of Berlin, Hitler planned another offensive in Hungary, using Dietrich's battered 6th SS Panzer Army, which had been pulled out of the Ardennes in January. Hitler planned to envelop a large part of the 3rd Ukrainian front between the Danube and the Drava, sweep across the Danube, recapture Budapest, and overrun eastern Hungary. Overriding Guderian, who argued against the offensive, Hitler declared that it was necessary because 80% of his remaining oil supply came from Hungary and Austria. He ordered General Wöhler, the commander-in-chief of Army Group South, to handle the detailed planning. Wüller's offensive was codenamed Operation Frühlingserwachen, Awakening of Spring, and its objectives were to inflict a sharp local defeat on the Soviets and push them back, in order to establish something of a buffer zone between them and the Najkaniska oil fields. Wüller's plan called for a main attack between Lake Balaton and Lake Velensa, to be launched by Balk's 6th Army and Dietrich's 6th SS Panzer Army. In all, Balk and Dietrich would have 10 panzer and 5 infantry divisions. Meanwhile, south of Lake Balaton, General of Artillery Maximilian de Angelis's 2nd Panzer Army was to launch a secondary attack with 4 infantry divisions, while Luftwaffe Colonel General Alexander Lue's Army Group E attacked across the Drava from the south with three infantry divisions. The main attack was to begin at dawn on March 6th. Hitler's goals for this offensive were completely unrealistic. Every German unit earmarked for the attack was seriously depleted. Dietrich joked that Panzer Army VI was so called because he only had six panzers left. On the other side of the line, Tolbukhin's 3rd Ukrainian Front had five armies with 37 Soviet rifle divisions, six Bulgarian divisions, several Yugoslav divisions, two Soviet tank corps, a mechanized corps, and a cavalry corps. A total of more than 400,000 men, 400 tanks, and 1,000 airplanes. Thanks to Hungarian deserters, Tolbuchin knew that an offensive was imminent and planned a defense in depth. During the night of March 5th to 6th, Lür struck the 1st Bulgarian and 3rd Yugoslavian armies and established three bridgeheads across the Drava, while the 2nd Panzer Army attacked the Soviet 57th Army with only SS Lieutenant General Hermann Priess's 1st SS Panzer Corps the 2nd SS Panzer Corps wasn't ready until the following morning, and gained ground only slowly, having to advance through deep mud from the melting snow 
while avoiding hundreds of Soviet mines. By the end of the second day of the attack, the German 6th Army and 6th SS Panzer Army had gained four miles in most sectors, although the 1st SS Panzer Corps had pushed forward almost 20 miles. Wuhler's drive caused Tolbuchen some bad moments, but by March 15th, the Germans had lost momentum. On March 16th, the Soviets counterattacked with the entire 2nd Ukrainian Front to destroy the 6th Army and the 6th SS Panzer Army between Lakes Balaton and Valencia. On March 17th, the Hungarian 3rd Army, north of Lake Valencia, collapsed and Wuhler's left flank was threatened with envelopment, while both Balk and Dietrich were subjected to a series of very heavy frontal attacks. Some of the hard-pressed SS units retreated without orders, prompting an enraged Führer to demand that SS Oberstgruppenführer Zepp Dietrich, commander of the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 9th SS Panzer Divisions, have his men remove their armbands from their uniforms as a mark of his displeasure and their disgrace. Dietrich had been a supporter of Hitler in the early 1920s, and he had commanded Hitler's personal bodyguard in the late 1920s and early 1930s. Dietrich nevertheless refused to issue the order. Instead, he and his staff officers filled a chamber pot with their ribbons and decorations and sent it to the Fuhrer. The pot had a 17th SS Panzer Grenadier Division, Goetz von Berlichingen, cuff ribbon permanently attached to it. Goetz von Berlichingen was a German knight and mercenary whom Goethe immortalized in a play where he tells the Bishop of Bamberg, You can kiss my ass. As historian Louis L. Snyder wrote, the incident expressed perfectly the personality of Zepp Dietrich. Unfortunately, Hitler's reaction to the chamber pot, if he ever saw it, has not been recorded. He did, however, publicize his order concerning the armbands. The result was predictable, an alarming increase in SS desertions. On March 18th, Malinovsky's 2nd Ukrainian Front turned north behind the 3rd Hungarian Army, and between Moore and Lake Valencia, Two Soviet armies, supported by two air armies, attacked the 4th SS Panzer Corps, which was covering the northern flank of Wuhler's strike forces. They routed it. Wuhler reacted by shifting the 6th SS Panzer Army north into the sector between Lake Valencia and the Danube, while 6th Army took charge of the entire sector between Lakes Valencia and Balaton. The SS divisions were able to slow but not check the Russian advance south, where the Reds hoped to cut off the 6th Army east of Lake Balaton. Hitler refused to authorize a retreat, and by March 21st, the 6th Army was left with one narrow escape corridor along the lake's north shore. Over the next 24 hours, Wuhler and Balk succeeded in extracting the 6th Army from the Soviet trap at the cost of much of the army's heavy equipment, which was abandoned in the thick Hungarian mud. On March 24th, as the Germans retreated, General Balk reported that morale had plummeted among his troops who were unwilling to fight for a lost cause. The Waffen-SS was no longer the elite unit it had once been. Casualties and the recruiting policies of Himmler and General of Waffen-SS General Gottlieb Berger had seen to that, and Hitler's armband order was the final straw for many. During the retreats of mid-March, about 75% of the deserters that the 6th Army's field police apprehended came from the ranks of the SS. Such a statistic would have been inconceivable even a year earlier. On March 25th, the vanguard of the Red Army reached the Raab River. General of Infantry Otto Wurler became Hitler's latest scapegoat. He was sacked to be replaced by General Lothar Rendulich. Wurler, however, remained in command of Army Group South until Rendulich arrived from Kurland in the second week of April. Without its heavy equipment, the 6th Army was unable to check the Russian onslaught. 
On its right and left flanks, the 6th SS and 2nd Panzer armies were hurled back, and desertions in the few remaining Hungarian divisions meant they soon functionally ceased to exist. By March 30th, Russian armies were heading toward Wiener Neustadt and Vienna. Hitler demanded a counterattack. Wöhler responded that given the state of his troops, this was out of the question. He needed to marshal what forces he had to block the Soviets at the Austro-Hungarian border. The situation was also critical on the flanks of Army Group South. By the end of March, the Eighth Army, under the command of General of Mountain Troops Hans Kreising since December 28th, was falling back into Austria and southern Czechoslovakia. Bratislava, the capital of Slovakia, fell on April 4th, and the Second Panzer Army lost the Najkaniska oil fields after a bitter fight. In the German center, the Soviets bypassed Wiener Neustadt on April 2nd and headed for Vienna. Hitler ordered the city defended to the last man. He who gives the order to retreat is to be shot on the spot, the Fuhrer commanded. To defend the former capital of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the city of his misspent youth, Hitler reinforced the 6th SS Panzer Army with the 25th Panzer Grenadier and Führer Grenadier Divisions. The Soviets, however, were now moving very rapidly, and the 2nd and 3rd Ukrainian fronts quickly launched a double envelopment against the city. When Rendulich finally arrived at Army Group headquarters on the evening of April 7th, the Battle of Vienna had been in progress a day and a half, and the Russians were in the streets of Vienna on both sides of the Danube. Elements of the Red Army were already west of the city. The battle was not destined to be a long one. Zepp Dietrich was hopelessly outnumbered, and Rendulich could not help him. He needed his remaining regiments to cover the Zitzersdorf oil region, Germany's last oil fields, in northwestern Austria and the area west of Vienna. As of April 7th, the divisions of the 6th SS Panzer Army had the following strengths. 1st SS Panzer, 1,582 men and 16 tanks. 12th SS Panzer, 455 men, 1 tank. 356th Infantry Division, 1,214 men, 3 Jagdpanzer 38s. 2nd SS Panzer, 1,498 men, 11 tanks. 3rd SS Panzer, 1,004 men, 6 tanks. 6th Panzer, 1,235 men, 8 tanks. Obviously, these burned out and exhausted divisions were no match for Stalin's legions. Rendulich's forces, which were redesignated Army Group Ostmark on April 7th, fell back and Dietrich abandoned the city. He surrounded his command post with heavily armed SS companies personally loyal to himself, lest Hitler demand he be shot. The Russians captured the center of the city on April 10th, stamped out the last pockets of resistance three days later, and subjected Vienna to an orgy of rape and pillaging. The Russians close in on Berlin. While Hitler frittered away his last reserves on senseless counterattacks to the south, the Soviets inched ever closer to the German capital. Given their overwhelming superiority in every category of military power, their operations in February and March were strangely slow, hesitant, and focused on their flanks in Pomerania and Silesia. They began their offensive west of the Vistula on February 24th, but it was March 4th before they isolated western Prussia and eastern Pomerania from the Reich. Hitler responded to the latest crisis by decreeing that 15-year-old boys were eligible for frontline combat duty. In Berlin, barricades were erected, Policemen were formed into infantry battalions, and people braced for the worst as public utilities broke down. Newspapers, if they published at all, were limited to a single page. Even the newspaper of the Reichsminister of Propaganda, 
Josef Goebbels's Der Angriff, was shut down. Members of the Berlin Philharmonic were called up for military duty. They gave their last concert on April 18th. Significantly, it was Wagner's Die Goethe Dämmerung. On March 5th, Hitler sacked the highly competent Colonel General Erhard Rauss and replaced him as commander of the 3rd Panzer Army with Baron Hasso von Manteuffel. Hitler did not like Rauss because he was an Austrian. This prejudice was the only reason he ever gave for relieving him of his command. The general was never re-employed. Colonel General Josef Harpa, the former commander-in-chief of Army Group A, and the principal scapegoat during Stalin's January offensive, replaced Monteufel as commander of the 5th Panzer Army in the West. Monteufel was a capable commander, but he could not prevent the Russians from shattering the left flank of 3rd Panzer Army. On March 19th, Hitler was forced to allow him to evacuate the Stettin bridgehead, but Hitler also issued his first Nero decree. Every civilian threatened by the Allies' advances was to be evacuated to the interior of Germany, and all bridges, factories, supply facilities, roads, and transportation facilities were to be destroyed. The enemy was to capture nothing but a wasteland. If the war is lost, Hitler said to Albert Speer in his coldest voice, the people will also be lost. It is not necessary to worry about what the German people will need for elemental survival. On the contrary, it is best for us to destroy even these things, for the nation has proved to be the weaker, and the future belongs solely to the stronger Eastern nation. In any case, only those who are inferior will remain after this struggle, for the good have already been killed. Speer was shaken to the core by these words. Both he and Guderian attempted to persuade Hitler to revoke his decree, and even SS Colonel Wilhelm Zander, Martin Bormann's liaison officer at Führer headquarters, opposed it. But Keitel and Bormann issued it in the form of orders to the generals and Gauleiters the next day. The Fuhrer's orders, however, were no longer being obeyed everywhere, especially in the West, where civilian delegations appealed to German military commanders not to defend their towns and villages if it meant they would be destroyed. SS General Paul Hauser, the commander-in-chief of Army Group G, refused to pass Hitler's order to his troops, and Willi Stür, the Gauleiter of the Palatinate and the Tsar, flatly refused to evacuate civilians and destroy the towns. In other sectors, the front was disintegrating so rapidly that the Nero decree was irrelevant. Despite the increasingly catastrophic situation, the replacement army continued to function at near full efficiency. Since 1939, it had already activated 32 waves of divisions. Wave 33 was organized in January and included 10 infantry and Volksgrenadier divisions, most of which were rebuilt units. After this, the German order of battle became increasingly confused. The Fahnenjunkern of the Dresden Infantry School were incorporated into six grenadier regiments in February as were the Fahnenjunkers at Wiener Neustadt, two regiments, Potsdam, seven regiments, and Wetzlar in Bavaria, three regiments. In addition, three new shadow divisions, Hanover, Dresden, and Donau, were dubbed Wave 34. They were used both to reinforce existing divisions and to create new ones. In February, four new infantry divisions, the 63rd, 219th, 249th, and 703rd, were created in the Netherlands, mainly from Osttruppen, Eastern Volunteers, and Sailors. The named divisions rolled off the Home Army's assembly lines in February and March 1945. They included the 303rd Infantry Division Derberitz from the Infantry School, the 309th Infantry Division Berlin from the Berlin and Großdeutschland Guard Regiments, 
the 324th Infantry Division Hamburg, the 325th Infantry Division Jutland, and the 328th Infantry Division Zeeland, which was formed in Copenhagen. The last wave, the 35th, was organized in March and April 1945. It included the 1st RAD, Reich Labor Service Division, Schlageter, 7,500 men, the 2nd RAD Division, Friedrich Ludwig Jahn, 7,500 men, the 3rd RAD Division, Theodor Körner, 7,500 men, the 4th RAD Division, 8,000 men, Infantry Division Potsdam, Infantry Division Scharnhorst, Infantry Division Ulrich von Houten, and Infantry Division Ferdinand von Schill. All of the RAD divisional headquarters were former Army HQ units. The Kurmark Panzer Grenadier, the Clausewitz Panzer, 2nd Feldherrnhalle Panzer, 2nd Hermann Göring Panzer Grenadier, Holstein Panzer, Jüterbolk Panzer, Münchenberg Panzer, Schleizin Silesian Panzer, Tatra Panzer, and Norwegian, Norwegian Panzer divisions were also created in 1945. Meanwhile, Reichsfuhrer SS Heinrich Himmler, the commander-in-chief of Army Group Vistula, checked himself into Professor Gebhardt's sanitarium at Hohenlichen, allegedly suffering from the flu. The operations of Army Group Vistula were left in the hands of Lieutenant General Eberhard Kinsel, the man whom Halder had sacked as chief of the Foreign Army's East Section of OKH in 1942. Kinsel had replaced General of Infantry Hans Krebs as Himmler's other chief of staff after the failure of the Stargard Division, and Krebs had returned to Berlin and replaced Lieutenant General Walter Wenck as chief of operations at OKH. Despite his lack of qualifications for higher general staff work, SS Lieutenant General Heinz Lammerding was still chief of staff of the Army Group. General Guderian, the man responsible for the Eastern Front, had not received a single report from Himmler since February 14th. On March 20th, he drove to the sanitarium and found Himmler, apparently in good health. He called upon him to resign his post as commander of Army Group Vistula, and reminded the former chicken farmer that he was National Police Commander, Minister of the Interior, Reichsfuhrer SS, and Commander-in-Chief of the Replacement Army. With uncharacteristic diplomacy, Guderian asked how one man could possibly fill all these posts. Himmler, who had lost his taste for combat command, liked the notion of resigning, but said he could not approach the Fuhrer with such a suggestion. Guderian volunteered to personally bring the idea to Hitler, and Himmler seemed delighted with the thought. He appeared to be looking for a way out. Hitler was in a rare rational mood when Guderian brought up the matter. However, he frowned when the chief of the general staff nominated Colonel General Gotthard Heinrichsi, the leader of the 1st Panzer Army, to replace Himmler. Perhaps the immensely competent but relatively colorless Heinrichsi was not charismatic enough for the Fuhrer. Or perhaps it was because he was too religious, Heinrichsi was a devout evangelical Christian, and a non-Nazi product of the general staff, which the dictator despised. The fact that Heinrichsi was related to Field Marshal Gert von Rundstedt, the epitome of the Prussian officer corps, may have had something to do with it. Or perhaps it was just because Heinrichsi was short, five foot seven inches. Most likely it was because his wife was a Mischling, half Jewish. In any case, Hitler mentioned several other possible choices, but Guderian held firm on the idea of Heinrichsi, and Hitler relented in the end. Heinrichsi's appointment was promulgated on March 20th. Walter Nehring succeeded Heinrichsi as commander of the 1st Panzer Army. The next day, in what was virtually his first act as Army Group commander, Heinrichsi relieved SS General Lammerding of his duties. 
On March 22nd, Hitler agreed to let Guderian transfer most of the staff of the now-defunct Army Group F to headquarters Army Group Vistula, where it was used to replace most of Himmler's incompetent staff. Lammerding's replacement was General of Infantry Kinsel, a veteran general staff officer and former chief of staff Army Group North. Emboldened by his success in getting Himmler to abandon his military ambitions, Guderian quickly overplayed his hand. On March 21st, he visited the Reich's chancellery and saw Hitler and Himmler strolling through the ruins. Guderian asked to speak to the Reichsfuhrer SS in private and told him that it was his duty to approach the Fuhrer and ask him to open armistice negotiations. My dear general, it's too early for that, Himmler replied. He did not tell Guderian or Hitler that he had already made contact with the enemy and was attempting to negotiate, but he did tell Hitler what Guderian had said. That evening, the Fuhrer announced to the chief of the general staff that he had heard that Guderian's heart condition had taken a turn for the worse. He therefore ordered him to take four weeks' leave. Guderian declined on the grounds that he had no deputy. Wenck was still recovering from his injuries, and Hans Krebs had been wounded in an Allied bombing attack on OKH headquarters in Zosen on March 15th and had not yet returned to duty. Hitler accepted this reasoning for the moment, but on March 28th, after another acrimonious exchange with Guderian, the dictator sent him on six weeks' sick leave. He had, in reality, been sacked again, and this time he was not reemployed. Guderian was replaced by General of Infantry Hans Krebs. He was a well-trained staff officer, but had spent the entire war in various general staff appointments and lacked command experience even at the regimental level. He was, however, a close friend of General Burghoff, the chief of the Army Personnel Office. As soon as Guderian named Krebs chief of operations at OKH, Burghoff drew Krebs into the inner circle of radical Nazis at Führer headquarters, and he was soon rubbing elbows with Bormann and General of Waffen-SS Hermann Fegelein, Himmler's liaison officer at Führer headquarters. Within a matter of days, Bormann and the radical Nazis were conspiring to permanently remove Guderian and replace him with Krebs, whom they could manipulate more easily. Under Krebs, the general staff of the army became even more subject to the Führer. Meanwhile, the Russians pushed into Silesia. On February 14th, they surrounded Breslau, but the 17th and 269th Infantry Divisions broke out, leaving the defense of the city largely in the hands of Major General Siegfried Ruf's recently created 609th Infantry Division. Overall command of the city was placed in the hands of Major General Hans von Alphen, the former commander of the 70th Engineer Brigade of Army Group A, often conducted a tenacious defense, but by March 12th there was fighting in the streets of the city. Simultaneously, other Soviet armies pushed Colonel General Ferdinand Schirner's Army Group Center away from the Oder and back toward the Sudete Mountains. On March 17th, they encircled General of Cavalry Rudolf koch Erpach's. 56th Panzer Corps. The Russians dispersed the headquarters of the 17th Army and narrowly missed capturing its commander, General of Infantry Friedrich Wilhelm Schutz. The 56th Panzer eventually managed to break out of the encirclement, but only after suffering heavy losses. The 1st Panzer Army, under Heinrichsee and then Nehring, generally held its positions, but General of Panzer Troops Fritz Hubert Grazer's 4th Panzer and Schultz's 17th Armies were unable to cover the Great Silesian Industrial Area, which included the cities of Glogau, Opeln, and Breslau. By the time Marshal Ivan Konev halted his offensive on March 31st, all of Upper Silesia was in Soviet hands, except for a few isolated German pockets, the most notable of which was Breslau. Hitler wrongly assumed that the next Soviet drive would be aimed at Prague, not Berlin. On March 30th, he transferred the 10th SS Panzer Division from Army Group Vistula to the Gerlitz sector, guarding Prague. On April 2nd and 3rd, 
He belatedly transferred the 25th Panzer and Fuhrer Grenadier Divisions from Heinrichsee to the 6th SS Panzer Army for the defense of Vienna. General Krebs raised no objection, though the Russians were now within 50 miles of Berlin. The loss of these three divisions robbed Army Group Vistula of half its tanks and mobile forces. The Soviets' next major offensive would be against Army Group Vistula, with the goal of capturing Berlin and destroying the Third Reich forever. Stalin ordered a pause because he wanted no mistakes. The Red Armies would be properly equipped, extremely well supplied, and reinforced before he began his last campaign in Europe. But while a lull descended on the Eastern Front, Hitler's Western Front collapsed. Chapter 7 Back Across the Rhine In early January 1945, after the failure of the German Ardennes Offensive, the U.S. Division of Psychological Warfare surveyed 324 captured German soldiers. 62% still expressed faith in Hitler. 44% still believed in final victory. But the odds were now heavily stacked against them. By February 1945, Germany had lost more than 2,500,000 sons. By the end of the war, the total was 3,300,000 killed or missing. But while Hitler had recklessly wasted his troops, the Western Allies were approaching Germany with formidable strength. By New Year's Day 1945, Eisenhower had more than 3,700,000 Allied soldiers on the mainland of Europe, including 73 well-equipped mobile divisions, 49 infantry, 20 armored, and 4 airborne. Backing them were more than 17,500 first-line combat airplanes, including thousands of fighter bombers, medium and heavy bombers, and rocket-firing typhoons. They outnumbered the Germans at least 2.5 to 1 in troops, 2.5 to 1 in artillery, about 10 to 1 in tanks, and more than 20 to 1 in airplanes. Within three months, Eisenhower's strength would be 90 divisions and 4 million men. To oppose these masses, Gert von Rundstedt had 29 infantry divisions, including static, ad hoc, and special purpose units, 26 Volksgrenadier divisions, 7 Panzer divisions, 5 Parachute divisions, 4 Panzer Grenadier divisions, 2 Mountain divisions, and three motorized or panzer brigades. These figures include SS units but exclude divisional staffs which had no combat elements attached to them. On paper, Rundstedt outnumbered Eisenhower in terms of divisions and divisional equivalents, 74 to 73. Unfortunately for OB Vest, not a single division in the West was at full strength and most had but a fraction of their authorized manpower. The 26th Volksgrenadier Division, for instance, had an authorized strength of 10,000 men, but only 5,202 were actually present for duty, and only 1,782 of these were classified as combat effective, Kampfstärke. Most of the other units were in equally poor condition. For example, the 198th Infantry, the best equipped division in the 19th Army, had only 6,891 men, or less than half its authorized establishment. In February 1945, after Dietrich's 6th Panzer Army was transferred to the Eastern Front, Rundstedt estimated that he had the equivalent of 6.5 full-strength infantry divisions on the entire Western Front. The Ruhr River Dams General Eisenhower's plans to conquer the Rhineland involved five phases. First, the U.S. First Army would capture the Ruhr River bridges. Second, British Field Marshal Sir Bernard Law Montgomery's 21st Army Group would clear the Lower Rhineland with a converging attack 
in which the 1st Canadian Army would drive through the Reichswald and the U.S. 9th Army would drive through the Ruhr River sector. They would then clear the west bank of the Rhine from Nijmegen to Dusseldorf. In the third phase, Montgomery would prepare for a set-piece attack across the Lower Rhine, while General Omar Bradley cleared the west bank of the Rhine from Dusseldorf to Cologne. During this phase, the U.S. First Army's left wing would push forward to Cologne and then strike southeast into the flank and rear of the German forces defending the Eiffel, as the German Ardennes is called. At the same time, Patton's Third Army would advance east, take Prune, and drive on to Koblenz. In the fourth phase, Montgomery would launch the major assault across the Lower Rhine, while the U.S. Third and Seventh Armies cleared out the moselle czar rhine Triangle and secured crossing places along the Rhine in the Mainz-Karlsruhe sector. Finally, after the Rhineland was cleared, the Anglo-American forces would launch a double envelopment against the Ruhr, with Montgomery's forces playing the major role. General Courtney Hodges, the commander of the U.S. First Army, assigned the primary mission of the first phase to Major General C. Ralph Hubner's V Corps on his northern flank, seize the Ruhr River dams northeast of Monschau. The two most important dams were the Urft and the Schwamenauel. As long as they possessed these two dams, the Germans had the power to flood the Ruhr Valley, washing out any tactical bridges the Allies might erect and isolating any Allied invasion force on the eastern side of the river. Hubner's main opposition came from Major General Eugen Koenig's 272nd Volksgrenadier Division, a well-led veteran unit which had been reduced to 6,000 men by casualties. It conducted a skillful delaying action without becoming decisively engaged, frustrating Hodges and the other American generals, because speed was essential. Montgomery was scheduled to launch the major Allied offensive through the Reichswald and against the Rhine on February 8th, and the U.S. Ninth Army, on his right flank, needed to secure the dams before that time so it also could take part in the drive. Even so, it was February 7th before the first Americans entered the town of Schmidt, two miles north of the Schwamenauel Dam. The next day, the Americans attacked again, this time supported by no fewer than 40 battalions of artillery, 780 guns. Once again, however, the 272nd Volksgrenadier turned back every attack. It was not until after nightfall on February 9th that the Americans reached the dam. They discovered that the German engineers had blown up the discharge valves on both the Schwamenauel and Urft dams, as well as the machinery in the power rooms. There would be no spectacular crashing flood of water from the Ruhr dams, but the demolitions had been well calculated. They would release a steady flow of water that would keep the Ruhr Valley flooded for about two weeks and prevent the U.S. Ninth Army from supporting Montgomery's push through the Reichsfault. The Battle of the Reichsfault Monty's build-up for his drive to the Rhine, codenamed Operation Veritable, was the largest Allied logistical operation since D-Day. The main blow would be delivered by the 1st Canadian Army, which was to be spearheaded by Sir Brian Horrocks's 30th British Corps. Horrocks would advance out of Nijmegen with five divisions, 200,000 men, supported by an artillery bombardment of more than 1,000 guns and by a massive aerial bombardment from several thousand airplanes. The British were experts at disguising where a main attack would fall, but General of Paratroopers Alfred Schlem, the commander of the 1st Parachute Army, was not deceived. He expected the main attack in the Reichsfeld and persuaded a skeptical General Johannes Blaskowitz to give him a regiment of the 2nd Parachute Division. He also quietly moved elements of the 7th Parachute Division forward into a second line of defense. Horrocks's plan called for the fortified towns of Cleva and Goch 
to be leveled by Allied bombers the day before he launched a frontal attack. He hoped to penetrate the forest quickly and capture the two bombed-out towns before the Germans could react and commit their reserves. Because of floodwaters on his flanks, Oryx had to cram 50,000 Allied troops and 500 tanks into a front only five miles wide. They were to be followed by six more divisions. Opposing this huge force was Major General Heinz Fiebig's 84th Infantry Division, which had two infantry regiments, about 7,000 men, on the front line, with the 3rd Regiment, about 3,000 men, on the 2nd line. Although the 84th was one of the strongest divisions in the Wehrmacht in terms of numbers, its men were mostly elderly soldiers, normally used as security troops, and several of his units were at Magen, stomach battalions, consisting of men with special dietary needs. In addition to his other problems, Fiebig had only 36 assault guns and a few batteries of artillery to face 5,000 Allied tanks. German reserves near this sector of the front included the 7th Parachute Division, a Panzer Grenadier Division, and two depleted Panzer Divisions, which between them could field only 50 tanks. The Battle of the Reichswald began at 5 a.m. on February 8th when the defenders were blasted by the British Army's heaviest artillery barrage of the Second World War. Simultaneously, the medieval town of Cleva was hit by nearly 1,400 tons of bombs, leaving hundreds of civilians dead. The smaller town of Goch was demolished by 500 tons of bombs, and the villages of Kalkar, Udem, and Vetsa were also hard hit. After a barrage of two and a half hours, a strange silence fell on the Reichswald before the British fired smoke rounds, which were normally used as cover for advancing infantry. The surviving German gunners poured shells into the smoke, but the British were not advancing. They had fired the smoke rounds so the German gunners would return fire and give away their positions. When the bombardment resumed at 7.50 a.m., most of the surviving German batteries disappeared in a storm of high explosives, and the 184th Artillery Regiment was annihilated. At 10 a.m., the bombardment shifted to the German rear, and smoke shells again began to fall on the German front and into no man's land. Then at 10.30 a.m., the Allied assault infantry moved out. Despite the overwhelming material superiority of the enemy, the defenders of the Reichswald did have some important natural advantages. Tanks, for the most part, couldn't penetrate the forest. Roads were few, narrow, and muddy, and floodwaters and destroyed ditches constricted the British advance. Units became hopelessly intermixed. By nightfall, the German 84th Infantry Division had lost six of its battalions and was near collapse, but the Anglo-Canadian advance was itself stuck in the forest and thick mud. The next day, around 4 p.m., the Allies finally reached the outskirts of Cleva, 11 hours behind schedule. British communications were not functioning properly, traffic jams in the British rear added to the confusion, and when General Horrocks sent in his reserve, the 43rd Wessex Division, he did not realize the poor conditions of the roads around Cleva. There were now some 40,000 Allied trucks and armored vehicles clogged on disintegrating roads, leaving frontline troops running short of food, fuel, and ammunition. While the Allies stalled, the Germans acted. By late afternoon, lead elements of Lieutenant General Wolfgang Erdmann's 7th Parachute Division began arriving in Cleva, and Lieutenant General Hermann Plocher's 6th Parachute came down from Arnhem and linked up with the 7th Parachute near Matterborn, south of Cleva. Field Marshal von Rundstedt ordered Blaskowitz to hold Cleva at all costs, and he signaled General Baron Heinrich von Lütwitz to move into the Cleva sector with his 47th Panzer Corps, 15th Panzer Grenadier, and 116th Panzer Divisions. If the town fell before he arrived, he was to counterattack and retake it. 
Lutwitz would assume leadership of the battle from General of Infantry Erich Straube, commander of the 86th Corps. Lutwitz's two divisions, however, could muster only 50 tanks, and Lutwitz himself was suffering from combat fatigue. By February 10th, the third day of the Battle of the Reichswald, Fiebig's 84th Infantry Division had lost eight battalions and was finished. Cleva, however, was now defended tenaciously by the 7th Parachute Division and the 16th Parachute Regiment of the 6th Parachute Division, which took full advantage of the cover offered by the bomb craters and ruins. The main roads to Cleva were now flooded, which meant the British needed three-ton trucks and amphibious vehicles to bring up supplies and ammunition. Gradually, however, the weight of five Allied divisions and two armored brigades began to tell, and by February 12th, the paratroopers had fallen back. Lutwitz arrived the next day and delivered his counterattack at dawn on February 14th. The battle lasted two days. Although the Germans were outnumbered more than ten to one in tanks, the Allied tanks, narrow-tracked Shermans, often found the mud impassable, and the range of the Panzer's main battle gun was far superior to that of the Allied tanks and tank destroyers. In addition, the 15th Panzer Grenadier was equipped with the Jagdpanther tank destroyer, which carried an 88mm high-velocity anti-tank gun on a turretless Panther chassis. In the end, superior numbers did win out, and the 47th Panzer Corps was pushed back to the German border. Still, it took another week for the floodwaters of the Ruhr to recede, allowing Lieutenant General William H. Simpson's U.S. 9th Army to deliver what turned out to be the decisive blow. The highly capable Simpson massed 11 full-strength divisions, more than 300,000 men, backed by 130 battalions of artillery, more than 2,000 guns, and almost 1,400 tanks. At the point of the main attack, in the zones of the U.S. 13th and 14th Corps, the Americans massed one artillery piece for every 10 yards of front. General of Infantry Gustav Adolf von Zangen's 15th Army faced Simpson. It held a front 50 miles long with six infantry divisions and no reserves. Nearby, in Army Group B, was Major General Baron Harald von Elverfeldt's 9th Panzer Division, along the Erft River east of Julich, and Lieutenant General Wendt von Wietersheim's 11th Panzer Division, which had just left the Tsar Moselle Triangle to the south and was in the process of assembling near München Gladbach but both were of Kampfgruppe, regimental battle group size. There were in fact only 276 tanks and assault guns in all of Army Group B, 15th Army, 5th Panzer Army, and 7th Army. Simpson, hoping to attain surprise, struck on the morning of February 23rd, before the waters of the Ruhr had fully receded. His timing was perfect, and the German resistance was neither determined nor effective. Not even the 12th Volksgrenadier Division performed well. Crossing the Ruhr against six German divisions, the U.S. 9th Army suffered casualties of fewer than 100 killed, 900 wounded, and 61 missing. Model at once placed the 9th Panzer and 11th Panzer Divisions under von Zangen's control, but most of the 11th had not yet arrived from the Tsar Moselle, and the 9th Panzer had only 29 tanks and 16 assault guns. Zangen was forced to commit them piecemeal just to hold his lines. Simpson had 16 infantry battalions across the Ruhr at the end of the first day of attack, and 38 across by nightfall on February 24th. Simpson paused to consolidate his forces and then resumed the offensive on February 25th. Just as Zangen feared, his main effort was to the north, where the 12th SS Corps and 338th Infantry Division were easily swept aside. 
On February 26, the U.S. 102nd Infantry Division entered Erkelenz and found the town deserted. German resistance was crumbling. Commanders in the 9th U.S. Army noted that German infantrymen were confused and drained of all enthusiasm for the fight. The only serious threat came from German anti-tank fire. Recognizing that the left wing of the 1st Parachute Army and the 12th SS Corps were in danger of being encircled between the 1st Canadian and 9th U.S. Armies, Field Marshal von Rundstedt begged Hitler to allow them to withdraw. The Fuhrer refused. Lieutenant General August Winter, the deputy chief of the OKW staff, then made a personal appeal to Hitler, who finally agreed to a retreat. By February 28th, German columns were fleeing toward the Rhine, pursued by American divisions and their ubiquitous fighter bombers. On March 2nd, an American task force from the U.S. 19th Corps crossed the Rhine River Bridge at Oberkassel and had several tanks on the eastern bank before the Germans blew the bridge. That same day, elements of the U.S. 2nd Armored and 95th Infantry Divisions clashed with what was left of the 2nd Parachute Division, approximately four understrength battalions, at the Adolf Hitler Bridge at krefeld Udingen, north of Neuss. During the night of March 2nd to 3rd, a U.S. patrol crept onto the bridge and cut every explosive wire it could find, but when the Americans attacked the bridge in strength at 7 a.m. on the morning of March 3rd, the German parachute engineers blew it up in their faces. The two bridges at Rheinhausen and Duisburg were destroyed in less dramatic fashion before the Americans arrived. On March 3rd, the U.S. 9th Army linked up with the 1st Canadian Army, connecting the forces of operations Veritable and Grenade. Together, they went about crushing the Vesel Pocket, west of the Rhine. There, General Schlem and more than 50,000 men, including all or part of every division in his army, stood before two intact Rhine River bridges that led to the German city of Vesel. For the next four days, the Americans, British, and Canadians inched their way forward against the German 1st Parachute Army. Then, during the night of March 9th to 10th, the Germans suddenly broke contact, escaped across the Rhine, and blew up their bridges behind them. But not even General of Paratroopers Alfred Schlem's skillful retreat could hide the fact that Simpson's Ninth Army had driven 53 miles from the Ruhr at Ulick to the Rhine at Wesel in less than three weeks, and had cleared 35 miles of the west bank of the Rhine from Wesel to Dusseldorf. In the process, the U.S. 9th and Canadian 1st Armies had taken 52,000 prisoners at a cost of approximately 24,000 of their own casualties, and these figures exclude large numbers of German killed and wounded, the exact numbers of which are unknown. While Montgomery and Simpson were engaged in clearing the northern Rhineland, the bulk of Hodges's 1st U.S. Army and Patton's 3rd Army were busy cracking the Siegfried line. Patton attacked General of Panzer Troops Erich Brandenberger's 7th Army on February 4th and pushed into the Eiffel, the German Ardennes, in one of the 3rd Army's most challenging campaigns. The terrain was some of the worst in Germany. The early thaw and rains had swollen the rivers, turning the countryside into rivers of mud. The Siegfried Line was strong here, and there were mines everywhere. Despite their low numbers, the German rearguards fought an annoyingly effective delaying action. But at this crucial moment, Germany lost one of its best remaining commanders, General of Panzer Troops Erich Brandenberger. Field Marshal Walter Model disliked Erich Brandenberger from the moment he met him. Modell was a hot-blooded, profane, pro-Nazi commander with a talent for improvisation. Brandenberger was a non-Nazi, a gentleman, and a cool military professional who believed in planning and not precipitate action. On February 20th, Modell drove to 7th Army headquarters, castigated Brandenberger in front of his staff, and relieved him of his command. 
he appointed General of Infantry Hans Felber, the commander of the 13th Corps, as his successor. In being relieved at this moment, Brandenberger was lucky. Hardly had he left his former headquarters than it was attacked by American bombers, and several staff officers were killed or seriously wounded. General Felber, who had just left the building for a farewell visit to 13th Corps, was only slightly wounded. Major General Baron Rudolf Christoph von Gerstorf, the chief of staff, was also lucky. He suffered only minor injuries. Knowing that he could not expect rational orders from Fuhrer headquarters, Felber told his subordinates that they would now receive two sets of orders. One for the official record would direct them to hold the line at all costs. The other to be destroyed after receipt would be Felber's actual order. If questioned, the pretext for every withdrawal would be that the Americans had attacked in overwhelming strength. On February 11th, the Americans captured Prüm. On February 18th, they seized Kessfeldt. On February 28th, Bitburg fell, and the Americans were in control of the Southern Eiffel. To the north, the U.S. First and Third Armies launched a double envelopment against German forces west of the Rhine. Collins's U.S. Seventh Corps spearheaded the First Army's drive. His objective was Cologne. Bradley codenamed his offensive Operation Lumberjack. Facing Collins were the weak remnants of General of Panzer Troops Friedrich Kruger's 58th Panzer Corps, which did not have a single panzer, as well as the remnants of General of Infantry Friedrich Kuckling's 81st Corps and Corps Beierlein, an ad hoc unit under the command of Lieutenant General Fritz Beierlein, which controlled the 9th and 11th Panzer Divisions. Facing Patton's Third Army behind the Prume and Kill Rivers were the shattered remnants of General Felber's Seventh Army. On March 1st, Collins attacked across the Erft River and was soon advancing along the highway from Ulich and Duren to Cologne. By March 2nd, the 58th Panzer Corps had been defeated, but Baron von Elferfeldt's 9th Panzer Division kept up a stubborn resistance. By nightfall, however, the Americans had reached the open country three miles from the river. German troops fell back toward Cologne, though Hitler did not authorize their retreat until March 5th, the day Collins attacked the city. General of Infantry Friedrich Kuckling defended Cologne's outer ring with the remnants of the 9th Panzer, 363rd Volksgrenadier, and 3rd Panzer Grenadier Divisions the equivalent of two weak regiments. The inner ring was held by firemen, policemen, and anyone else who could be found and who could fire a rifle or a Panzerfaust, the single-shot disposable anti-tank weapon of which Germany had thousands and manufactured dozens every day. However, of the 1,200 Volkssturm promised by the Gauleiter, only 60 appeared. Collins struck the city with three divisions. Progress was slow until the morning of March 6th, when the gallant and courageous young commander of the 9th Panzer Division, Major General Baron von Elferfeldt, was killed. Then the resistance of the 9th Panzer, one of the best divisions in the history of the Wehrmacht, suddenly collapsed. The U.S. 3rd Armored quickly pushed into the heart of the city, which had been reduced to a field of ruins by the ceaseless Allied air attacks. Only the stately cathedral, which the airmen had used as a turning marker, still stood. To the surprise of the American tankers, thousands of the city's survivors poured into the streets and greeted them as liberators. By the time the Americans reached the Hohenzollern Bridge on the Rhine, however, 1,200 feet of it was missing. The scapegoat for the fall of Cologne was General Friedrich Kuckling, who was relieved of his command, arrested, and court-martialed for dereliction of duty and possible treason. He was temporarily replaced as commander of the 81st Corps by Lieutenant General Ernst Günther Bader, the former commander of the 90th Panzer Grenadier Division, who was now recovered from the wounds he had suffered in Italy in December. The U.S. Third Corps under Major General John Milliken, four divisions, 
began its part of Operation Lumberjack on February 25th against General of Infantry Karl Puchler's 74th Corps, which was part of von Zangen's 15th Army. The 353rd Infantry Division was quickly smashed, but Richard Schimpf's 3rd Parachute Division, which was under strength but still battle-worthy, and Koenig's 272nd Volksgrenadier Division put up a very effective resistance. And it was March 1st before Milliken could overcome the 74th Corps. On March 2nd, however, the Americans went over to the pursuit, driving south to link up with Patton's 3rd Army. Field Marshal Modell had erroneously concluded that the main effort of the U.S. 3rd Corps was aimed at Bonn. General von Zangen disagreed. He thought the American objective was Remagen because it was the location of an important Rhine River Railroad bridge, which had been converted into a traffic bridge and was a vital supply artery for the 15th Army. Zangen also recognized a developing double envelopment when he saw it, and he saw no way of halting Hodges's twelve full-strength divisions, three of them armored, with his puny forces. He therefore asked permission to withdraw Walter Lucht's 66th Corps, 5th Parachute Division, and General of Infantry Otto Hitzfeldt's 67th Corps, 89th Infantry and 277th Volksgrenadier Divisions, to positions east of the Rhine. Modell obeyed Hitler's orders and rejected the requests. The two corps would continue to hold their west wall positions despite the evolving encirclement. Meanwhile, to face the next onslaught of the U.S. Third Army, General Felber deployed three corps north to south. General of Cavalry Count Edwin von Rothkirk und Trachs, 53rd Corps, three folks grenadier divisions near Prüm, Lieutenant General Count Ralph von Oriola's 13th Corps, two Folks Grenadier Divisions and the 2nd Panzer Division opposite Bitburg, and Bayer's 80th Corps, two Folks Grenadier Divisions between Bitburg and the Moselle. The remnants of the 9th and 276th Folks Grenadier were so small that they were attached to other units. In all, Felber had ten divisions to cover thirty-five miles of front, but all were Kampfgruppen, and aside from a handful of assault guns, only the remnant of Lauchert's second panzer had some armor and was mobile. General Felber was under no illusions. His army would not be able to hold its positions if Patton attacked them with significant forces. He recommended Seventh Army be allowed to withdraw behind the Moselle prior to Patton's attack, but Hitler would not consider it. Felber then decided to commit his small Tiger Reserve to the most threatened sector, which he considered to be Rotkirk's 53rd Corps east of Bitburg, opposite the U.S. 4th Armored Division. He was still trying to find enough gas to move it when the Americans struck. The U.S. 3rd Army's attack, spearheaded by Lieutenant General Troy Middleton's 8th Corps, began on March 1st and initially met Major General King Ludwig Heilmann's tough 5th Parachute Division, a Kampfgruppe on the extreme left flank of the 15th Army, near its junction with the 7th Army. Resistance here was so stiff that Middleton considered delaying the commitment of his armor for 24 hours, but in the end unleashed his tanks on March 3rd, as originally planned. The 5th Parachute fell back skillfully and escaped across the kill, where it again held the U.S. 8th Corps to minor gains until March 8th. On March 3rd, Mantinetti's U.S. 7th Corps attacked the 53rd Corps and had a sizable bridgehead over the kill by nightfall on March 4th. Patton committed the U.S. 4th Armored Division to the exploitation the following morning, and the 3rd Army was rolling again. On March 5th, Eddy smashed the southern wing of Rotkirk's 53rd Corps and the northern wing of Ralph von Oriola's 13th. During the night, General von Rotkirk drained the last drops of fuel out of his command cars and headquarters vehicles and sent it to Weidenbach, where a few Tigers were sitting in a repair shop. 
They were ordered to rush to the front, but were slow to get started and were swamped by the American advance. Rotkirk also ordered Major General Tolstorff, whose 340th Volksgrenadier was still holding its positions on the kill west of the American penetration, to take his division out of the impending pocket via a secondary road north of Weidenbach. He was then to establish blocking positions near Oberstadtfeld. Count von Rotkirch's orders to Tolsdorf were based on the assumption that the Americans would continue their usual practice of halting for the night. When Tolsdorf's vanguard arrived near Oberstadtfeld, however, he found that the U.S. 4th Armored Division had already seized the town. Theodor Tolstorff was one of the best soldiers in the German army and a hero of the Third Reich. He had risen from first lieutenant in 1939 to major general in 1944 and was wounded a dozen times in the process. Knowing that an attack on the Americans at Oberstadtfeld was futile, it was held by the equivalent of an armored brigade, Tolstorff realized that he and his men would have to retreat around the advancing Americans. The daring East Prussian abandoned his vehicles and heavy equipment, including his artillery, and tried to escape by infiltrating to the northeast. Hiding by day and moving by night, Tolstorff and his men worked their way through woods and open fields and crossed roads and highways in the intervals between American columns. Remarkably, the young divisional commander made good his escape, taking most of his command with him. On March 18th, he became only the 25th German soldier to be decorated with the Knight's Cross with oak leaves, swords, and diamonds. On April 1st, he was promoted again. He had risen from major to lieutenant general in less than a year, and at the age of 35, was named acting commander of the 82nd Corps. Despite being wounded 14 times in six years, Tolstorff survived the war and died in Wuppertal in 1979. Although Tolstorff was able to pull off a brilliant escape, he was not able to take up the blocking position assigned to him by General Rotkirch. Most of the 53rd Corps was unable to escape the trap. The majority of the demoralized men did not try too hard, either. They surrendered in droves. General Rotkirch saw one large mass of German soldiers clustering around what appeared to be tanks. He went to investigate and realized too late that the tanks were American and the Germans were surrendering. Where do you think you're going? An American lieutenant asked Rotkirk as he tried to sneak away. It looks like I'm going to the American rear, the general responded with a touch of irony. Army Group B learned of Rotkirk's capture by monitoring an American radio network. Modell promptly replaced him with Lieutenant General Walter Butch commander of the 18th and 26th Volksgrenadier Divisions, which had been assigned the task of forming a bridgehead from Bonn to Remagen. Butch wanted to brief his successor on the situation in the bonn remagen bridgehead, but Modell considered the situation so desperate that he ordered Butch to take charge of the 53rd Corps at once. Butch had no choice but to leave for the front and hope that he could find his command post before the Americans found him. The 53rd Corps, now part of the 15th Army, was in imminent danger of encirclement, as was Lucht's 66th and Hitzfeldt's 67th, but still Hitler would not allow a withdrawal. Modell ordered Wendt von Wietersheim to recross the Rhine at Bonn with what was left of his 11th Panzer Division and counterattack southwest toward Riembach to cut off the spearheads of the U.S. 3rd Corps. This order was, of course, impossible to execute. By the time Wietersheim arrived in Bonn, the bridges were down. All this maneuver accomplished was to waste gasoline that the Germans could not spare. Zangen also ordered a counterattack, but it failed to materialize. General Butch located his corps on March 6th and found it was smaller than a peacetime division. The next day it was scattered by the U.S. 11th Armored Division, and separately the 66th and 67th Corps began to disintegrate. Everywhere, U.S. Army historian Charles B. MacDonald wrote later, 
Irregular columns of foot troops and horse-drawn vehicles toiled toward the Rhine, hoping to find a barge, a ferry, perhaps a bridge still standing. Other Germans gave themselves up by the hundreds, while others, some successfully, most not, tried to slip behind the armored spearheads to escape southward across the Moselle. Abandoned equipment, vehicles, anti-tank guns, and field pieces, many of them smoldering, dotted the Eiffel in macabre disarray. General Lucht escaped the debacle with his staff, as did General Hitzfeld, but King Ludwig Heilmann, the commander of the 5th Parachute Division, was captured along with all but a small fragment of his command. Major General Wilhelm Fielig, the commander of the 277th Folks Grenadier Division, received a hold-at-all-costs order from Berlin. He sent the remnants of his combat units back behind the Rhine, but did not withdraw his headquarters. He was captured when his command post was overrun on March 9th. At last, the 15th Army was back on the east bank of the Rhine, but it no longer had enough men left to effectively defend it. Chapter 8 Raymagen The Bridgehead As masses of German troops straggled across the Ludendorff Bridge at Remagen, the German chain of command for defending the bridge was a mess of confusion. The area combat commander, Captain Willy Bratka, lacked authority to destroy the bridge except in an emergency. The bridge was technically under the command of Captain Karl Friesenhahn, an officer of engineers. But neither Bratka nor Friesenhahn commanded the anti-aircraft battery overlooking the bridge, and the local Volkssturm were commanded by the district's Nazi party officials. Major General Richard von Botmer had just replaced Lieutenant General Walter Boch as commander of the bonn Remagen bridgehead. Botmer, the former commandant of Bonn, was unfamiliar with the situation, and Boch did not have time to brief him. General Zangen, as commander of the retreating 15th Army, ordered General Otto Hitzfeld, the commander of the 67th Corps, to send an officer to check on the situation at Remagen. Hitzfeld sent his adjutant, Major Hans Scheller, telling him to make sure that the bridge was ready for demolition. Scheller left 67th Corps headquarters at 2 a.m. on March 7th, but the roads were so clogged with retreating troops that he did not reach Remagen until 11 a.m. on March 8th. By this time, the U.S. 9th Armored Division was trying to sever the R Valley Highway near Bad Neuenahr to cut off the retreat of Hitzfeld's Corps. Shortly before 1 p.m., after barreling through minimal opposition, a column from the 9th Armored reached the high bluff overlooking Remagen, and, to their surprise, found the Ludendorff Bridge intact. The bridge at Remagen was a 1,069-foot railroad bridge, wide enough for two train tracks plus footpaths on either side, but by securing planks to the rails it had been converted to allow vehicular traffic. Just beyond the eastern edge of the bridge, the tracks entered a tunnel which ran through a cliff-like hill called the Erpeler Lai. It was from here that Captain Friesenhahn planned to blow the bridge. He was, however, operating under a severe handicap. Because the explosives on one of the bridges at Cologne had been prematurely detonated by an American bomb, OKW had decreed that demolitions could not be placed on a bridge until the enemy was within eight kilometers, about five miles of it, and the igniters were not to be attached until demolition seemed imminent. Finally, the demolition order itself had to be issued in writing by the officer in tactical command of the area. At Remagen on the morning of March 7th, this officer was Captain Bratke. He had only his own company, 36 men, 120 engineers under Friesenhahn, and 500 unreliable Volkssturm, most of whom were looking for the most suitable moment to desert. All but six did. 
Though the anti-aircraft battery on the Western Bluff was not under his command, it did provide a measure of comfort until mid-morning, when it was taken down and joined the retreat across the river. Bratka had tried to contact General Boch's command post, but failed, so he was quite pleased when Major Scheller showed up shortly after 1.15 a.m. and informed him that he had been sent to take command of the bridge. Scheller was reluctant to blow the bridge because German combat troops were still making their way across it. When the American tanks finally advanced toward the bridge at 4 p.m., Scheller and Bratka were in the tunnel on the east bank. Friesenhahn, however, was on the west side of the river. As he hurried across the bridge, a shell from an American tank knocked him out for several vital minutes. Then he pulled himself from the plank floor and, still dazed, made his way to the tunnel. American tanks were shelling the east bank with white phosphorus rounds, and the tunnel was full of disorganized soldiers, screaming civilians, crying children, terrified folkstorm, and cowering foreign laborers. Captain Brodka met Friesenhahn at the entrance and yelled at him to blow the bridge. But when Friesenhahn turned the detonator key designed to activate the electric circuit and set off the explosives, nothing happened. Realizing that the circuit was probably broken, Friesenhahn ordered a repair team to the bridge. The Americans, however, were now too close and swept the bridge with machine gun and tank fire. Friesenhahn called for a volunteer to go to the bridge and manually ignite the primer cord. A brave sergeant responded, and dodging a hail of American bullets, ignited the primer cord and sprinted back to the tunnel. Then came a deafening roar, flying timbers and blinding smoke. When the smoke cleared, Friesenhahn could hardly believe his eyes. The bridge was still there. So were the American infantrymen. They dashed from girder to girder, exchanging fire with the German infantry on the east bank, tearing out packets of explosives and throwing them into the river. As the Americans spread out on the east bank and advanced on the Erpeler Lie, Major Scheller tried to contact higher headquarters to report that the bridge had not been blown and was about to be captured. When he could not reach anyone, he mounted a bicycle and rode off to give his report in person. Shortly thereafter, Captains Bratka and Friesenhahn surrendered, along with the other Germans in the tunnel. The Americans, meanwhile, could hardly believe their luck. The news traveled up the U.S. chain of command like an electrical shock. By late afternoon, General Bradley was ordering General Hodges, the first army commander, to shove every unit he could across the river. Within the next 24 hours, 8,000 American soldiers crossed the Rhine and Eisenhower had already given Bradley permission to reinforce the bridgehead with five divisions. As was his wont, Field Marshal Modell was somewhere at the front. While being a front-line officer won him enormous respect, it could also interfere with communications, especially as his headquarters was relocating. When he finally returned on the morning of March 8th and was briefed on events, he ordered the 11th Panzer Division at Bonn to turn south, crush the American bridgehead, and blow up the Remagen Bridge. Under his command, General von Wietersheim had 4,000 men, 25 tanks, and 18 pieces of artillery, but no gas. By the time he obtained the necessary fuel and pushed to within striking distance of the American perimeter, it was March 10th far too late for the 11th Panzer to be a real threat to the Americans. Modell, meanwhile, ordered the recently created and improvised Corps Bayer Line to smash through to the Ludendorff Bridge. He assigned Bayer Line the 11th Panzer, the Panzer Lair Division, down to a combat strength of about 300 men and 15 tanks, the remnants of the 106th Panzer Brigade, five operational tanks, and the 9th Panzer Division, 600 men and 15 tanks. Eventually, Bayerlein's command would be reinforced to a strength of about 10,000 men under HQ 53rd Corps. Lieutenant General Walter Boch gave up this command on March 25th and was given command of the 58th Panzer Corps, replacing General of Panzer Troops Walter Kruger, 
who was placed in Fuhrer Reserve. The 53rd Corps was given to Beyerlein. It absorbed Corps Beyerlein, which then ceased to exist. On March 9th, Beyerlein arrived at Modal's HQ and outlined a plan to attack the bridgehead, beginning at nightfall on March 10th. Modal rejected the plan. First, he wanted Beyerlein to cordon off the bridgehead, then to attack it. In adopting this method, Modal lost the battle before it began. Due to the speed and strength of the American buildup, Beyerlein would be forced to commit his new units as soon as they arrived and would never be able to do more than launch a few local counterattacks. On March 8th, in reaction to the fall of the Remagen Bridge, Hitler summoned Field Marshal Albert Kesselring from Italy to Berlin and the following day named him O.B. Vest. Field Marshal von Rundstedt was sent into his fourth and final retirement. I am the new V3, Kesselring announced to the command staff of O.B. Vest on March 10th, referring to the new reprisal or superweapons designed by the Germans. By that time, however, Hodges had reinforced General Milliken's U.S. Third Corps at Remagen with the 7th Armored Division, March 7 to 8. Bonn had fallen, March 9, and U.S. heavy artillery could find no suitable targets west of the Rhine. General von Botmer blew up the Rhine River bridge at Bonn and escaped to the east bank. But because he evacuated Bonn without orders, he was court-martialed, reduced to the ranks, and sentenced to prison. Rather than accept this humiliation, he shot himself in the courtroom on March 10th. Meanwhile, German troops, abandoning their vehicles and heavy weapons, escaped across the Ahr River via ferries or small river craft. The Americans captured about 18,000 prisoners, far fewer than they had hoped, but the German troops who escaped were disorganized and equipped only with what weapons they could carry. The Germans continued their attempts to destroy the Remagen Bridge. They used artillery, including the huge Karl Howitzer, a 540mm gun, 11 V2s fired from the Netherlands, and seven underwater divers, all of whom were captured. Nothing worked. Then, shortly before 3 p.m. on March 17th, the bridge simply collapsed. No one dramatic action caused it to fall, and it was not under attack at the time. About 200 engineers were working on it when they heard a sharp crack, followed by another. The bridge trembled, and the men dropped their tools and ran for the nearest shore. The bridge swayed, twisted, and fell into the Rhine. Of those working on the bridge at the time, 28 were killed and 93 were injured. As the Americans advanced, a raving Hitler looked for more scapegoats for the disaster at Remagen, in addition to von Rundstedt and von Botmer. A special three-man military tribunal was convened under the direction of SS Lieutenant General Rudolf Hübner, and with no regard for fairness, sentenced to death Lieutenant Karl Heinz Peters, commander of the 44th Flakwerfer Battery, Major Scheller, who had taken command at the bridge at Remagen, and Majors Herbert Strobel and August Kraft, who had commanded engineer units nearby. The four officers were executed by firing squad. Also sentenced to death was Captain Bratka, but he survived because he was in American captivity. Captain Friesenhahn was acquitted. Hitler's micromanagement of the war was getting worse and even more removed from reality. Minister of Munitions Albert Speer remembered visiting Army Group B headquarters just after Modal had received orders for attacking the Remagen bridgehead. The field marshal was in a state of fury because the units Hitler had earmarked for the attack had no chance of reaching Remagen. They were in tatters and out of fuel. The attack was never launched. By March 17th, Modal had committed seven Folks Grenadier Divisions, the 3rd and 5th Parachute Divisions, and the headquarters of the 74th Corps, General of Infantry Karl Pückler, and 67th Corps, Hitzfeld, to contain the bridgehead, as well as the units previously committed under Corps Beierlein. 
Though none of these amounted to much more than a regiment, they were nevertheless a tremendous strain on the limited resources of Army Group B and OB Vest. Under Modo's orders, Byerline finally launched his long-delayed counterattack on March 24th. It quickly degenerated into a series of ill-coordinated piecemeal efforts that accomplished nothing, except to deplete the already weak panzer reserves behind the Western Front. Modal was so dissatisfied with Byerline's efforts that he reassigned all of Byerline's armored units to Pukler's 74th Corps. Eisenhower had already decided that the main Allied thrust across the Rhine would come farther north, in the zone of Montgomery's 21st Army Group, which meant that German units sent to Remagen were sent to a sideshow. But more serious than the tactical or strategic implications of the Battle of Remagen was the effect the disaster had on German morale, which was already low. With the Allies across the Rhine, German surrenders and desertions multiplied. The Tsar Palatinate was now the only German-held territory west of the Rhine. It lay south of the Moselle and covered about 3,000 square miles, including the Tsar Industrial Area, which produced 7 million tons of coal annually. Important cities within the Tsar included Homburg, which featured one of the few synthetic oil plants still in production, Ludwigshafen, across the Rhine from Mannheim, home of the IG Farben plant, which produced nearly half the Reich's chemicals, Stuttgart with the Mercedes-Benz facilities, and the minor but important industrial cities of Kaiserslautern, Wurms, and Speyer. On March 13th, Deaver's 6th Army Group and Patton's 3rd Army launched a major offensive in the Tsar Palatinate. Facing them was Army Group G, which included General of Infantry Hermann Furch's 1st Army and Felber's 7th Army, which was already on the point of disintegration. SS Colonel General Paul Hauser, the commander-in-chief of Army Group G, had been begging for permission to fall back behind the Rhine since early March, but the Fuhrer's answer was uncompromising. The Tsar Palatinate would be held. Meanwhile, Major General Meinrat von Laukert's greatly reduced 2nd Panzer Division was pushed back against the Rhine. With no bridge, the men's only hope to escape was to swim across the river. Most of the men, including Laukert, reached the East Bank on March 20th. The wet general, who was disgusted by Hitler's conduct of the war and the unnecessary slaughter of his division, decided to quit the war and walked home to Bamberg, the peacetime base of his old 35th Panzer Regiment, apparently assuming that the Nazis would conclude that he had been killed or captured and would not look for him. He was correct. Over the next nine days, the American and French forces, aided by their ever-present fighter bombers, crushed the ragtag German battalions. On March 23rd, Hitler finally authorized the First Army to retreat across the Rhine. General Furch had actually begun the retreat the night before, and many guns and vehicles were already on the West Bank, along with thousands of demoralized foot soldiers. Army Group G, however, was smashed, with the 1st and 7th Armies having lost up to 80% of their infantry strength in the Tsar Palatinate battles. Total German losses easily exceeded 100,000 men, including 88,000 captured, while the U.S. 7th and 3rd Armies and the attached French units lost roughly 20,000. Army Group G no longer had enough battle-worthy units to prevent the Franco-Americans from crossing the Rhine. The Rhine Crossings General Hans Felber, the commander of the 7th Army, had an impossible task. Hold more than 50 miles of the Rhine, from Wiesbaden opposite Mainz to Mannheim, with four divisions, three of which were Volksgrenadier the 246th, 352nd, and 559th. He had one corps headquarters left, von Oriola's 13th. The 246th and 352nd were Kampfgruppen of only about 400 men each, 
smaller than a peacetime battalion, and the 559th was reduced to about 60% of its original strength. Felber had no contact with the 1st Army to the south and only one division, the 159th Infantry, in reserve. To hold the northern section of his line, he was forced to resort to using headquarters Verkreis 12, 12th Military District, which was located at Wiesbaden and was commanded by General of Artillery Herbert Osterkamp. Verkreiser were territorial replacement and training commands. They performed excellent service for the Third Reich throughout their existence, but their staffs consisted mainly of older aged men or wounded veterans who were no longer physically fit for active campaigning. The Verkreiser had no divisions as such and consisted exclusively of security units and replacement training battalions. Felber and the other senior German commanders hoped that Generals George S. Patton and Jacob L. Devers would halt and conduct an extensive build-up before attacking across the Rhine. Characteristically, however, Patton crossed the river at high speed. Late on the night of March 22nd, the U.S. 5th Infantry Division launched an assault crossing at Oppenheim, south of Mainz, taking the defenders completely by surprise. On March 23rd, the Americans met resistance from an engineer replacement training battalion, a Landesschützen replacement training battalion made up of men 45 years of age or older, a handful of Waffen-SS, and some Volkssturm battalions, which were useless and surrendered. Hans Felber knew he needed to counterattack immediately. He took officer candidates from the Wiesbaden Officer Training School, formed them into a regimental size Kampfgruppe, and threw them into a night attack on March 23rd to 24th. Although they briefly disrupted the American advance, they were easily defeated. General Patton succeeded in crossing the Rhine before his arch-rival, Field Marshal Montgomery, if only by a matter of hours. By the afternoon of March 24th, the U.S. 4th Armored Division was driving toward Darmstadt. To prevent the encirclement of the few forces he had there, Felber abandoned the city. By March 26th, American tanks had reached the southern suburbs of Frankfurt. At 2.30 a.m. on March 26th, Major General Wade Hampton Hayslip's 15th U.S. Corps of General Alexander Patch's 7th Army launched a deliberate two-division assault across the Rhine at Wurms. Resistance was feeble, and before the day was over, the U.S. 7th Army was linked up with the U.S. 3rd Army and had cut the Darmstadt-Mannheim Autobahn eight miles beyond the Rhine smashing the 246th Volksgrenadier Division in the process. The American forces captured, or accepted the surrender of, more than 2,500 Germans, with a total loss of fewer than 200 men. During the night, Patch sent across the 12th Armored Division and prepared to drive into the rear of the German First Army. Hans Felber was sacked on March 26th and replaced by General of Infantry Hans von Obstfelder, a tough man of Nazi sympathies. Obstfelder was succeeded as commander of the 19th Army by General of Panzer Troops Erich Brandenberger, who had led the 7th Army until he had been unfairly sacked by Modell four weeks earlier. With the possible exception of Schlem, the commander of the 1st Parachute, Brandenberger was the best army commander on the Western Front in 1945, and the Wehrmacht could ill afford to leave him unemployed for long, although there was really very little he or anyone else could do at this stage. On March 27th, the U.S. 20th Corps crossed the Rhine Mine Arch at Mainz. General of Infantry Baptist Kniese's 85th Corps had taken over this sector only two days before from Wehrkreis 12 and the only defensive force available was the 159th Infantry, formerly Reserve Division, which had practically no combat value. Kniese had been promised that he would be reinforced with the 9th Panzer, 11th Panzer, and 6th SS Mountain, 
but none of these divisions ever arrived. Unable to hold off an entire American corps with his meager forces, Canise requested permission to retreat, but was curtly turned down by General Obstfelder. Canise withdrew most of his troops anyway, leaving only a thin screen to face the Americans. Mainz and Wiesbaden fell on March 28th, and Obstfelder relieved Canise of his command the following day. He was replaced by General of Panzer Troops Baron Smilo von Leutwitz, the cousin of Heinrich von Leutwitz, the commander of the 47th Panzer Corps. Eisenhower made his main effort across the Rhine with the Allied 21st Army Group, which included the 1st Canadian, 2nd British, and U.S. 9th Armies, which brought the overwhelming superiority of 30 divisions, 6 independent brigades, more than 2,000 tanks, and 5,500 pieces of artillery against Colonel General Johannes Blaskowitz's Army Group H. The focus of the Allied attack was the Vesel sector, which was defended by the 1st Parachute Army, 2nd Parachute, 86th and 63rd Corps, which were led by General of Paratroops Eugen Meindl, General of Infantry Erich Straube, and General of Infantry Erich Abraham, respectively. General Karl Wagner, the Chief of Staff of Army Group H, called the first parachute a shadow of an army. Its morale, he noted, varied from suspicion to callous resignation. Its officer corps lacked confidence. The army, he concluded, could only pretend to resist. General Schlem, its talented commander, had been seriously wounded on March 21st when an Allied bombing raid demolished his headquarters. He was replaced by the markedly less gifted General of Infantry, Günther Blumentritt, the commander of the newly formed 25th Army, which did not have a single combat division. Blumentritt was succeeded at 25th Army in Eastern Holland by General of Cavalry Philip Kleffel. Blumentritt's strongest corps was Eugen Meindl's second parachute, which had only 12,000 men, less than the strength of a peacetime division. First Parachute Army's only reserves were the 130th Infantry Division, a recently upgraded training unit, and the 106th Panzer Brigade, which now had an effective strength of about a battalion. Army Group H Main Reserve, Heinrich von Leutwitz's 47th Panzer Corps was near at hand, but only controlled the remnants of the 116th Panzer and 15th Panzer Grenadier Divisions, which could muster 35 tanks and assault guns. In all of Army Group H, there were fewer than 200 Panzers and assault guns. Supported by 3,300 guns, the Anglo-Americans crossed the Rhine on the night of March 23rd to 24th and swept as far as Wesel without meeting much opposition. There, they were met by an ad hoc force called Division Wesel. This conglomerate unit put up surprisingly stiff resistance, and the British were unable to declare Wesel secure before March 25th. The American prong of the attack landed along an eight-mile front, defended, at least theoretically, by the German 180th Infantry Division and Infantry Division Hamburg. Resistance varied from extremely spotty to non-existent, and two U.S. Infantry Divisions crossed the Rhine with a combined loss of 31 men. The Allies followed up the landing with Operation Varsity, the largest airborne operation in history, with 21,680 paratroopers and glider soldiers from the U.S. 17th Airborne and British 6th Airborne Divisions, delivered behind German lines by 1,696 transport planes and 1,348 gliders, themselves defended by 889 fighters. The Allied airborne troops secured the town of Diersfort, which yielded 300 prisoners, eliminated most of the German 84th Infantry Division, and captured much of the division's staff and the 86th Corps staff. The 1,053rd Grenadier Regiment of the 84th Infantry, however, escaped. 
Leutwitz's 47th Panzer Corps arrived south of Lippe, but could not stop the U.S. Ninth Army's advance any more than the German 2nd Parachute Corps could hold back the British. By nightfall on March 28th, the Anglo-Americans had a bridgehead 35 miles long and 20 miles deep across the Rhine. At this point, the Allied armies split up. Montgomery sent the British 2nd and Canadian 1st east across the plain of Westphalia, while the U.S. 9th joined Bradley's 12th Army Group to encircle the Ruhr. On both the eastern and western fronts, casualties and sackings were heavy among German senior officers and general staff officers. Chapter 9. The Battle of the Ruhr Pocket The Ruhr had long been Germany's industrial heartland, but by 1945, its factories lacked raw materials, its transportation networks were under attack, and Allied bombing had so completely leveled the Ruhr's big cities that German civilians joked that Allied bombers would soon need to bring their own targets. Nevertheless, the Ruhr still accounted for a large percentage of Germany's war production. The task of defending it fell to Field Marshal Walter Modell's Army Group B, which was part of OB Vest. Field Marshal Kesselring, commander-in-chief of OB Vest, felt like a concert pianist who was asked to play a Beethoven sonata on an ancient, rickety, and out-of-tune instrument. Hitler, he recalled, was obsessed with the idea of some miraculous salvation and clung to it like a drowning man to straw. On all active fronts, but especially in the South and West, the Fuhrer's hold-at-all-costs orders had taken the place of sound military strategy. Kesselring dutifully passed on every one of Hitler's orders, even when they were senseless or totally irrational, and insisted that the responsible commander do everything in his power to carry them out. As a result, Army Group G was smashed, and by the end of March, the 1st and 7th Armies were incapable of offering effective resistance. Army Group B was next in the line of fire. It consisted of the 5th Panzer and 15th Armies, under the command of Colonel General Josef Harpe and General of Infantry Adolf von Zangen, respectively. Not surprisingly, at this stage in the war, its morale was low, it had too few junior officers, and there were only 65 tanks left in the entire command. Leading Army Group B was Field Marshal Walter Modell. Born in the Gentin district of Magdeburg on January 24, 1891, his family had no military background, but was strongly religious. His father initially wanted to be a priest, but became a music teacher at the girls' school at Gentin instead. He advanced in his profession and eventually was named Royal Music Director. Young Walter was educated at the Bürgerschule, public elementary school at Gentin, the Gymnasium at Erfurt, and the humanistic Dom Gymnasium in Naumburg. He received his Abitar, roughly translated as school leaving certificate, on February 14, 1909. Three days later, he joined the 52nd Infantry Regiment at Kotbus as a Fahnenjunker. Modell's family was one of modest means, and as General Walter Nering later declared, a junior officer in the Imperial Army served the fatherland pretty much at his own expense. In addition to the financial burden, Modell had a difficult time with the harsh training program. One of his sergeants even told him he was not tough enough to become an officer. Cadet Modell nevertheless stuck with it, attended the Kriegsschule, war school, at Nysa, now Nysa, Poland, and was commissioned a second lieutenant in 1910. He was initially assigned as an aide to the battalion adjutant in 1910, and in 1913 became adjutant himself. He was viewed as brilliant, ambitious, and dedicated to mastering his profession, but also as outspoken and undiplomatic, characteristics that only intensified with age. Physically, Walter Modell was considered indefatigable. 
He spent World War I on the Western Front, where he was highly decorated and wounded several times. One of his superiors, Prince Oskar of Prussia, noted that he was intelligent and always grasped the essentials of every problem, but he was also brusque and not an easy man to have as a subordinate. He was even more uncomfortable to have as a superior. He was regimental adjutant in 1917, when he was transferred to the logistical staff of the 5th Infantry Division. Finally, he was sent to Sedan, where he underwent an abbreviated general staff training course. The shortage of general staff officers was so great that the course was reduced from three years to one month. Modell then became 1B, Chief Supply Officer, of the Guards Replacement Division, and finally, in 1918, 1B of the 36th Reserve Division. Here he also served briefly as a company commander. After the armistice, Captain Modell was posted to Danzig and the staff of the 12th Corps, but he soon joined Freikorps Hakatau in The War After the War. In this time of civil unrest, Modell considered leaving the army to become a physician and even registered at the University of Halle one semester. During this period, he met Hertha Heusen, the daughter of a wealthy family. They were married in 1921. He decided to remain in the army. Young Modell alternated between general staff positions and command assignments. In the 1920s and into the 1930s, he often invited junior officers to his home. They were warned, however, not to talk shop, discuss military matters, or tell war stories, which Modell detested. Political topics were also off-limits. Modell commanded a company in the 14th Infantry Regiment, 1919, commanded the Machine Gun Company of the 18th Infantry Regiment, 1920, and helped suppress communist uprisings in the Ruhr, held a general staff position with the 6th Artillery Command, 1921, and was a company commander in the 8th Prussian Infantry Regiment at Görlitz. In 1925, he joined the staff of the 3rd Infantry Division in Berlin. From 1928 to 1931, Modell, who was promoted to major in 1929, was assigned to the training section, T4, of the Truppenamt, as the clandestine general staff was called. As a major, Modell wrote an essay on the Prussian Field Marshal August Neithart Gneisenau, a military reformer and hero of the Napoleonic Wars, which later was included in an anthology on leadership published by General Friedrich von Kochenhausen in 1930. Perhaps as a result, he was given the duty of teaching military history to general staff officers. Students admired his knowledge, but he talked too fast, could be abrasive and impatient, and had a hot temper. As he rose in rank, Modell became ever more demanding of subordinates and intolerant of mistakes. In 1931, Modell was named Chief of Staff of the Board of Youth Efficiency Training, called the Curatorium, which was designed to help Germany circumvent the Treaty of Versailles, which limited the army to 100,000 men. Boys and young men received eight weeks' training. It was theoretically non-military, but it was essentially a basic training course. Promoted to lieutenant colonel on November 1, 1932, he assumed command of the 2nd Battalion Infantry Regiment Allenstein in East Prussia in 1933. The following year, he was advanced to colonel and took command of the regiment itself. He continued his upward advancement in 1935 when he became head of Department T-8, Technology, of the General Staff in Berlin. His appointment was something of a surprise because while recognized as a forward thinker, he had no particular expertise in technology. The appointment, however, proved inspired as he helped develop the Wehrmacht's highly effective assault guns. In 1938, he was promoted to Major General and named Chief of Staff of Wehrkreis IV at Dresden. In 1939, during the Polish campaign, he was Chief of Staff of the IV Corps. 
On October 23, 1939, he was named Chief of Staff of the 16th Army under General Ernst Busch. He was promoted to Lieutenant General on April 1, 1940, and performed well during the conquest of France, Belgium, and Luxembourg. On November 13, 1940, Model succeeded Baron Leo Geyer von Schweppenburg as commanding general of the 3rd Panzer Division. He led it across the Soviet border on June 22, 1941, as part of Guderian's 2nd Panzer Group. His division crossed the Bug, the Beresina, and the Dnieper, and helped encircle Bialystok, Minsk, and Smolensk. He led the Panzer Army's spearhead in the battle at Kiev, where 667,000 Soviet soldiers were surrounded and captured. On October 26th, he became commander of the 41st Motorized, later Panzer, Corps, and was promoted to General of Panzer Troops, backdated to October 1st. By now, Walter Model was known throughout the Reich as a man of great physical courage, tactical brilliance, single-mindedness of purpose, and above all, incredible energy. He was always near the front, and his troops loved him. Many of his staff officers and immediate subordinates, however, despised him. It was reported that his behavior was so bad that every member of the staff of the 41st Corps requested a transfer. Allegedly, the stress of working with Modell drove Colonel Hans Rüdiger, the chief of staff, to contemplate suicide. Modell led his corps on Moscow and against Stalin's winter offensive, which began on December 16, 1941. The health of Modell's army commander, Colonel General Adolf Strauss, gave way under the strain. Modell, who had been a divisional commander only three months before, was selected to replace him. The Ninth Army was nearly surrounded by five Soviet armies, but Modell repelled every Soviet attack. It was a strange thing, but the moment Modell assumed command of the army, the regiments seemed to gain strength. Paul Karol wrote later, it was not only the crisp precision of the new CNC's orders, but he also turned up everywhere in person. He would suddenly jump out of his command jeep outside a battalion headquarters, or appear on horseback through the deep snow in the foremost line, encouraging, commending, criticizing, and occasionally even charging against the enemy penetrations at the head of a battalion, pistol in hand. The live wire general was everywhere and even where he was not, his presence was felt. During this battle, Modell had his first confrontation with Hitler, and won. On January 20th, 1942, he flew to Fuhrer headquarters to meet with the dictator. He expected his battered army would soon face another red offensive, and he wanted an additional corps assigned to his command. Hitler agreed, but insisted on placing the unit at Gzhatsk. Modell wanted it near Rzhev, almost a hundred miles to the north. What General Friedrich Wilhelm von Millentin described as an acrimonious argument ensued. It ended when Modell stared coldly at the Führer through his monocle and asked, Who commands the Ninth Army, my Führer? You or I? Hitler, startled, did a double take. Modell told the Nazi chieftain that he knew the situation on the ground far better than the dictator and his generals understood it from their maps. Hitler later said, Did you see that I? I trust that man to do it, but I wouldn't want to serve under him. The Red Army attacked exactly where Modell predicted it would, and it was badly beaten by Modell's newly arrived corps. Modell surrounded the Soviet 39th Army northwest of Rzhev, and by February 24, 1942, he had destroyed it. The Russians lost 187 tanks, 615 guns, and 27,000 men killed. Only 5,000 surrendered. Hitler personally decorated Modell with the oak leaves on his Knight's Cross. Stalin launched offensives in March, April, and from late July to mid-October 1942 to obliterate Modell's Ninth Army, and failed. 
Model did not abandon Rzhev until the German defeat at Stalingrad in February 1943. That summer, he commanded the northern wing of Hitler's failed Kursk offensive. During his retreat west, he conducted a scorched earth policy against Russian civilians and cooperated with SS murder squads targeting Jews. Model became Hitler's chief military troubleshooter, commanding 9th Army, Army Group North, January 9th to March 31st, 1944, and Army Group South, later Army Group North Ukraine, March 31st to August 16th, 1944. From June 28th to August 16th, 1944, he was simultaneously Commander-in-Chief of Army Group Center. He was promoted to Colonel General on February 1st, 1942, and Field Marshal on March 1st, 1944. During the summer of 1944, Modell gave up vast tracts of land, but sustained the fighting strength of his army groups. When the Soviets finally halted, less than 15 miles from the East Prussian border, Hitler proclaimed that Modell was the savior of the Eastern Front. Throughout the army, he was known as the Fuhrer's Fireman. But an even greater challenge lay ahead. On August 16, 1944, he was sent to the Western Front to replace Günther von Kluge as OB Vest and Commander-in-Chief of Army Group B. When Model arrived in France, the Western Front was collapsing, and though he ordered an immediate full retreat, fewer than half his forces escaped behind the German border. Even Hitler finally realized the impossibility of successfully commanding both OB Vest and Army Group B, and on September 4th he recalled Gerd von Rundstedt to command OB Vest. As commander of Army Group B, Model defeated Montgomery at Arnhem but was unsuccessful against the Americans in the Battle of the Bulge. In March and April 1945, Model became uncharacteristically depressed, apathetic, unobservant, and indecisive. He had lost all faith that the Führer's promised miracle weapons would save Germany, and with defeat looming, and the prospect that the Soviets would try him as a war criminal, he had taken to the bottle. In the Battle of the Ruhr Pocket, the formerly brilliant tactician made mistake after mistake. He committed most of his armor at the wrong place, against the Remagen bridgehead, failed to launch effective counterattacks, improperly sighted his headquarters on the extreme right flank while his main counterattack was on the extreme left, and became so obsessed with the battle on the northern flank of the Ruhr that he was blinded to his armies falling victim to a classic double envelopment. Modal's proverbial energy let me down. However, to this day even, the operations of Army Group B remain incomprehensible to me, Kesselring declared later. On March 25th, the U.S. First Army began its enveloping attack south of the Ruhr with five infantry and two armored divisions. Unlike Modal, General von Zangen, the commander of the 15th Army, expected just such an attack and was ready to meet it. German resistance was initially quite stiff, and the Panzerlehr and the 9th Panzer and 11th Panzer divisions fought with ferocity even though all were Kampfgruppe strength. By the end of the day, however, U.S. ground and air power had combined to crush the defenders. The following day, the American First Army broke through southeast of Cologne, and the U.S. Third Corps roared into the rear of Hitzfeldt's 67th Corps. The U.S. Third Corps alone took more than 17,000 German prisoners. On March 27th, Hodges's 3rd, 5th, and 7th Corps barreled through German territory south of the Ruhr at an incredible pace, meeting little or no opposition. On March 27th, the U.S. 3rd Armored Division gained 22 miles and crossed the Dill River in two places. The next day, American armor gained 21 miles and seized the university town of Marburg. The U.S. 3rd Armored Division took more than 15,000 prisoners. General Bradley ordered the 1st Army north to Paderborn, while Patton's 3rd Army protected the right flank of the encirclement, 
by continuing northeast in the general direction of Kassel. To the west, a new U.S. Army, the 15th under Lieutenant General Leonard Giroux, formed an opposite wing of the impending encirclement. The spearhead of the U.S. First Army was dubbed Task Force Richardson after its commander, Lieutenant Colonel Walter B. Richardson. He pushed his men forward all day and most of the night on March 29th, gaining 45 miles without suffering a single casualty. When he finally halted for the night, he was only 15 miles from the ruined cathedral city of Paderborn. The complexion of the battle changed completely the next day. When Task Force Richardson resumed its advance, it almost immediately slammed into an SS Panzer Reconnaissance Training Battalion from the SS Panzer Replacement Training Center at the Zenelager Maneuver Area near Paderborn. Soon Richardson was fighting an ad hoc SS Ersatzbrigade Westfalen, Replacement Brigade Westphalia, which was led by the Camp Commandant, SS Lieutenant Colonel Hans Stern, a heavy-set 38-year-old tanker who had earned the Knight's Cross during his three years' service on the Eastern Front. Stern mustered 3,000 young SS men. Most of them were 17 or 18. They had no artillery, mortars, or radios and were inexperienced in combat, but they were true believers in their Fuhrer and their cause. They also had 57 panzers, 32 were mechanically unreliable tanks from the training school, but 25 of them were Royal Tigers of the 512th Heavy Panzer Battalion. The SS Brigade Westfalen stopped the Americans in their tracks. Later that day, the Americans were reinforced and managed to push to within six miles of the town. Here, fanatical young SS men with Panzerfausts checked them again. Major General Maurice Rose, the commander of the U.S. Third Armored, hopped in a jeep to head to the front and supervise the final attack on Paderborn. But he, his aide, and his driver suddenly found themselves in the middle of an SS convoy. His driver hit the gas and passed one German vehicle after another until a panzer pivoted and pinned the American jeep against a tree. Confronted by an SS sergeant with a machine pistol, they surrendered. Rose, however, had a pistol in the holster under his left arm. Without thinking, he reached for it with his right hand and began to pull it out. The SS man took this as a threatening gesture, so he shot and killed him. Thus died the highest-ranking Jewish general in Eisenhower's army. In the confusion, Rose's aide and driver escaped into the woods. The Germans sent a hail of bullets after them, but the two Americans escaped to Allied lines. Walter Modell finally realized that he was in danger of being encircled. On March 29th, he signaled OB Vest and asked for permission to break out. He noted that he had lost contact with HQ, 15th Army, and his only reserves were two mobile Kampfgruppen, the Panzerlehr and 3rd Panzer Grenadier Divisions, and the 176th Infantry, a partially rebuilt division. He pointed out that if Army Group B were cut off in the Ruhr, it could hold out until April 15th at the latest. Kesselring passed Modell's request to Fuhrer headquarters. The response from OKW? Modell was to defend the Ruhr as a fortress. He was forbidden to attempt a breakout. Although he was a Nazi sympathizer and an unimaginative commander, Kesselring was, in his own words, more than flabbergasted by this decision. Despite his personal views, Kesselring told Modell he could counterattack but not retreat. Modell tried to counterattack. General von Zangen was missing. His headquarters had been bypassed unwittingly by the rapidly moving Americans, and he was now hiding in the woods behind their spearheads. So Modell ordered General of Artillery Karl Toholte to counterattack on the evening of March 30th. Bayer Line's 53rd Corps headquarters had just arrived, reinforcing Toholte's two Kampfgruppen, which included a dozen tanks from the Panzerlehr, two mixed battalions of infantry and combat engineers, 
and a handful of assault guns. He had no artillery. Toholta placed Byerline in charge of the attack. Predictably, it failed and was not even strong enough to throw a single U.S. infantry regiment out of Winterberg. Byerline decided to try again after the 176th Infantry Division arrived with reinforcements. Simpson's U.S. 9th Army drove rapidly toward Ham on the northeastern tip of the Ruhr. South of the Lipper River, the U.S. 8th Armored Division was halted by the 116th Panzer Division, but north of the river resistance was minimal. The Americans crossed the Dortmund-Ems Canal on the afternoon of March 30th and cut the two major railroad lines leading north from Ham the following day, leaving only one railroad open between the Ruhr and the rest of the Reich. The rapid American thrust cut the first parachute army in two. North of the American breakout, it fell back toward the Teutoburger Vault. To the south, Lutwitz's 47th Panzer Corps and Abraham's 63rd Corps appealed to Modell for orders. The field marshal placed them under Lutwitz's command, Group von Lutwitz, and gave him responsibility for defending the northeastern sector of the Ruhr Pocket. To the east, the Americans tried to complete their encirclement of the Ruhr. The U.S. 3rd Armored Division, which had been checked by the tough young men of SS Colonel Hans Stern's Ersatzbrigade Westfalen, sidestepped them by sending a task force to the left in the direction of Lippstadt. This medieval town of 20,000 was defended by a Volkssturm battalion of a few hundred men under the command of Captain of Reserves Wilhelm Oberwinter. His soldiers were old men and boys, all poorly armed with foreign equipment, and most of them carried Czech rifles. As was typical for a Volkssturm unit, most of them did not even have uniforms. They wore civilian clothes with an armband bearing the identifier Volkssturm. The local party boss insisted that they fight, but with the U.S. 2nd Armored Division closing in from one direction, and the U.S. 3rd Armored coming up from the other, Captain Oberwinter disbanded his companies and ordered his men to discard their armbands and go home. He did not have to tell them twice. The U.S. 9th and 1st Armies linked up just east of Lippstadt at 1 p.m. on Easter Sunday, April 1, 1945. They had trapped the 5th Panzer and 15th Armies of Army Group B, a total of 19 divisions and seven corps headquarters, in a pocket 30 miles wide and 75 miles long. Its total strength was around 400,000 men, including 100,000 flak troops and Luftwaffe auxiliaries. But they were mostly ill-trained Hitler youth, old men, Volkssturm, or recent draftees with little training and no stomach for fighting. Many were residents of the Ruhr, which had a long tradition of leftist political leanings and were fed up with this losing war. The towns and cities rolled out the white flags at the first opportunity. On April 1st, Fritz Beyerlein sent his own former division, Panzerlehr, into the attack at Hollandberg. It collided with the U.S. 9th Infantry Division and fought to a standstill. The next day, Major General Christian Johannes Landau's relatively fresh 176th Infantry Division and the 3rd Panzer Grenadier Division, Lieutenant General Walter Denkert, reinforced the Panzerlehr attack. The Panzer Grenadiers pushed into the town of Medebach, but were thrown back in heavy fighting. The following morning, the U.S. 9th Infantry Division took Winterberg and Beierlein's 53rd Corps had a difficult time holding its positions west of the town. Hitler named General of Infantry Otto Hitzfeld acting commander of the 11th Army, temporarily replacing General Walter Lutz, who was apparently ill, which held positions east of the Ruhr pocket. Hitzfeld had under his command his own corps, 67th Corps, as well as Lieutenant General Hermann Flierke's 66th Corps, Wehrkreis 12's staff, SS Ersatzbrigade Westfalen, 
remnants of the 166th Infantry Division, several Volkssturm battalions, a collection of stragglers, recently discharged hospital patients, and Hitler youths, a total of about 80,000 men. He also had 20 tanks fresh off the assembly line at Kassel. He was told to break through the American armies to the Ruhr, an order that he recognized as pure folly. While Army Group B was essentially a write-off, it was not considered so by Führer headquarters and OKW. In their unrealistic world, they had created another army, or at least another army headquarters, during the first week of April. This one, the 12th, was placed under the command of General Walter Wenck, the 45-year-old former deputy chief of the general staff who, in February, had been injured in an automobile accident on the way to the Eastern Front. Wenck was ordered to form his new command in the Elbe region between Dessau and Wittenberg. Its men came from officer cadet schools, NCO schools, military training schools, and the Reich Labor Service, RAD. Its tank division, the Clausewitz Panzer, came from tank training schools in central Germany. Its Schagader Panzer Grenadier Division came from motorized and mechanized warfare schools, officer cadets, and young labor service volunteers. Five infantry divisions were created, Potsdam, Scharnhorst, Ulrich von Houten, Friedrich Ludwig Jahn, and Theodor Körner. Once formed and organized, the Twelfth Army was charged with breaking the American encirclement of the Ruhr. The Eleventh Army's mission was to hold off the Allies until General Wenck was ready to strike. The Twelfth Army, of course, existed only on paper. It was so scattered that it would have taken weeks to organize. Modell organized the defense of the Ruhr pocket. The northern half of the perimeter was the responsibility of Colonel General Harper's 5th Panzer Army, which included, left to right, the 57th Panzer Corps, 81st Corps, and 12th SS Corps, while Armee Abteilung von Lütwitz covered the northeast quadrant. The southern half of the pocket was defended by Zangen's 15th Army, which included, west to east, 58th, 74th and 53rd Corps. It was less well organized than the 5th Panzer Army and had three times as much area to defend. General von Zangen had had an adventure. He and his headquarters had been cut off by the rapidly advancing Americans. In fact, the Amis had him surrounded, but they didn't know it. Zangen and his men hid in the woods and filtered out of their mini pocket between U.S. convoys. Eventually, using back roads or traveling across open fields, they managed to reach friendly lines and reassumed their command functions. It took one U.S. division four days to clear Ham, but Duisburg fell in an hour. There was no resistance in western Essen, the home of the Krupp industries, but the fighting at Dortmund was vicious. At Surst, the 116th Panzer, Windhund, or Greyhound Division, under General von Waldenburg, put up stiff opposition against the U.S. 8th Armored Division, launched a series of local counterattacks, and even forced the Americans to send reinforcements. Then the fighter bombers of the U.S. 29th Tactical Air Corps smashed the city, and by the end of the day, even the Greyhounds were beginning to surrender en masse. To the south, the U.S. 18th Airborne Corps crossed the Zieg River and advanced 50 miles in three days against the remnants of four divisions, including the 11th Panzer Division, which together could muster only 10,000 men. Only at Wuppertal did they meet stiff resistance, but it was overcome within 48 hours. Then the mass surrenders began there as well. As the Ruhr pocket shrank rapidly, OB West hurriedly built up forces in the Teutoburger Wald Weser River sector, in front of the Harz Mountains and east of the Ruhr, under the command of General of Panzer Troops Karl Decker's 39th Panzer Corps of the 12th Army. From this base, Kesselring intended to launch a desperate relief attack to the Ruhr. 
If, however, the Americans penetrated the Teutoburger Vault and crossed the Weser and the Elba, there would be no more barriers between them and Berlin. And this was exactly the objective which U.S. Lieutenant General William H. Simpson had in mind. Diverting much of his Ninth Army from the Ruhr pocket, he placed two armored divisions side by side and swept through the forest as far as the small industrial city of Bielefeld. On the way, the Americans were greeted with white flags and surrender delegations led by the local burgermeisters. Even where local NSDAP leaders wanted to resist, they were prevented from doing so by the citizens, who dismantled anti-tank barriers, and by the Volkssturm, who simply refused to turn out. Simpson's vanguards reached Bielefeld within 48 hours. Bielefeld was different. Located on the edge of the Teutoburger Vault, it was commanded by Major General Karl Becker, who had joined the Imperial Army as a private and had earned a commission during World War I. After more than 30 years in the German infantry, he led the 574th Infantry Regiment on the Eastern Front and spent several months recuperating from injuries. He had commanded Fortress Königsberg, January 4th to February 28th, 1945, before being sent to Bielefeld. Here he organized a defensive force of 7,000 men. However, it was a motley collection of Volkssturm, training companies, two ear battalions, made up of men with hearing disorders who were otherwise fit for duty, the 64th Panzer Grenadier Replacement Training Battalion, and SS men from the nearby Infantry Training School at Zena, all equipped with captured foreign weapons. Becker had few heavy weapons, no signals equipment, no artillery at all, and a staff that was over age and too small and inexperienced. Becker's mission was to hold his position against an onslaught of eight to nine U.S. divisions, about 100,000 men. The heart of Becker's defense was the young, tough SS men and the Panzerfaust, Germany's single-shot disposable anti-tank weapon. The local Nazi party bosses remained behind, getting drunk in their command bunker. Their only acts in the battle were to issue fight-to-the-last-man orders and to threaten to have Becker strung up as a traitor for asking them to dissolve the Volkssturm battalions. In the thick forests, Becker's SS men and fanatical Hitler youths conducted dozens of hit-and-run ambushes. And when cornered, these troops fought to the last man, or more frequently, to the last teenage boy. The Americans did not succeed in entering Bielefeld until 1 p.m. on April 4th, and did not reach the eastern edge of the forest until nightfall. Bypassing Becker and his men, who continued to hold out in the Teutoburger Vault, the Americans pushed on in the direction of the Elba on April 5th. German resistance was light thereafter, and on April 8th, the U.S. Ninth and First Armies were fanning out on either side of the Hartz Mountains, driving for the Elba. Field Marshal Kesselring ordered that the Liner River Line be held under all circumstances, but it had already been breached before he issued the order. The 11th Army, now under General Lucht, was soon isolated in the hearts, with few heavy weapons and little food or ammunition. With its last thin hope of relief gone, the resistance of Army Group B weakened with each passing day. Eastern Essen, including the Krupp Works, was captured by the U.S. 17th Airborne Division on April 10th, and what was left of Bochum, Oberhausen, and Mülheim were occupied or captured against minimal resistance on April 11th. The stubborn 3rd Parachute Division, however, continued to hold the suburbs of Cologne on the East Bank. Perhaps overconfident, the U.S. First Army sent the 13th Armored Division to finish it off on April 11th. The Americans lost 30 tanks and dozens of half-tracks, armored personnel carriers, and other vehicles to desperate paratroopers carrying Panzerfausts and had to beat an ignoble retreat. But it was a temporary setback. American infantry arrived later to finish off the third parachute. 
Dortmund fell to the Americans on the evening of April 13th, and except for a few pockets holding out in Dusseldorf and a handful of other localities, this was the end of the Battle of the Ruhr in the U.S. Ninth Army's zone. By now even Modal was desperate. He had already disobeyed the Fuhrer's orders to lay waste to the Ruhr. The dictator wanted it destroyed so it would have no value to the Allies. Modal was supposed to destroy its bridges, transportation facilities, and industrial plants, but he had not. Now, on April 13th, he disobeyed Hitler again by ordering 53rd Corps to attempt a breakout. But it was too late. General Beierlein recognized the situation as hopeless and surrendered that day along with the remnants of his command. On Friday, April 13th, Hitler summoned Colonel Günther Reichheim, Modell's brilliant young operations officer, to the Reich Chancellery. Colonel Reichheim thought he saw a tear in Modell's eye as the field marshal gave him a letter to deliver to his wife. Hitler named Reichheim chief of staff of Wenig's 12th Army and ordered a 12th Army counterattack to rescue Army Group B and push on to the Rhine. Berlin sent optimistic messages to Modal, but he knew Army Group B's situation was hopeless. He faced overwhelming Allied forces, and his army had food supplies for only three more days. Still, when his chief of staff, Major General Karl Wagner, who had replaced Krebs on February 16th, suggested surrendering, Modal rejected the suggestion as repugnant. The battle continued. The U.S. 2nd Armored Division crossed the Elbe at the small town of Westerhusen, south of Magdeburg, during the night of April 12th to 13th. By early morning, there were three American armored infantry battalions across the river. General Wenck, however, acted quickly and threw mobile battle groups from the Scharnhorst, Potsdam, and Ulrich von Hutten divisions into an immediate counterattack against the bridgehead. The young cadets in these groups were inexperienced but enthusiastic and eager to prove themselves in battle. The Americans were desperately trying to finish a pontoon bridge when German artillery shells slammed into it, isolating the advanced American battalions on the eastern bank. The American commanders tried to call in artillery fire, but it was too late. Striking with an élan that the Wehrmacht had not exhibited in many a day, the cadets overran the American positions. More than 300 Americans were killed while the rest surrendered or fell back in disarray behind the Elba. It was the only real defeat the U.S. 2nd Armored Division suffered during the Second World War. In the Ruhr pocket, meanwhile, time ran out for the Germans. On April 15th, elements of Lieutenant General Matthew Ridgway's U.S. 18th Airborne Corps pushed to within two miles of Modal's headquarters. Ridgway sent a message asking the trapped field marshal to surrender. Modal refused, citing his personal oath of loyalty to Hitler. Ridgway tried again. Neither history nor the military profession records any nobler character any more brilliant master of warfare, any more dutiful subordinate of the state than the American general Robert E. Lee, he wrote in a personal letter to Modal. Yet even the great Lee had chosen an honorable capitulation when finally surrounded by overwhelming forces. This same choice is now yours. In the light of a soldier's honor for the reputation of the German officer corps, for the sake of your nation's future, Lay down your arms at once. The German lives you will save are sorely needed to restore your people to their proper place in society. The German cities you will preserve are irreplaceable necessities for your people's welfare. Modal sent his chief of staff, General Wagner, with his reply. He would not surrender. Ridgway offered Wagner a choice. He could return to Modal or become a prisoner of war. Wagner opted for surrender. From Army Group B headquarters, Field Marshal Modal issued an order, discharging all young boys and old men from the service 
and instructing them to return to their homes as civilians at once. This order was designed to save their lives or spare them months or years of captivity. Nevertheless, many of these underage or elderly soldiers ended up in POW camps. That same day, April 15th, the Americans split the Ruhr pocket into several smaller pockets. South of the Ruhr River lay two enclaves centered around the cities of Dusseldorf and Wuppertal. East of the river, there was a floating pocket, which was directed by Zangen and his staff, while a larger pocket, which included the HQ 5th Panzer Army, held out west of Kassel. All were under attack. Seeing the situation as hopeless, Major General Siegfried von Waldenburg surrendered the remnants of the once proud 116th Panzer Division, and Major General Horst Niemach surrendered the once elite Panzerlehr Division. On April 16th, Wuppertal, a city of half a million people, finally surrendered. By now, mass surrenders were becoming common. None of Modal's divisions had more than 2,000 men, and ammunition supplies were dangerously low. The will to resist was crumbling. At one place, two American military policemen guarded 16,000 German prisoners with a carbine and a machine gun. On April 17th, Modal admitted defeat. Rather than surrender, however, he dissolved Army Group B, including the Luftwaffe's 3rd Flak Corps. He gave his men three choices, make their way home, surrender, or try to break out and join the German armies to the east. Several thousand escaped to the east, though some were too late. Major General Friedrich Wilhelm von Melentin, the chief of staff of the 5th Panzer Army, for example, broke out of the pocket with several comrades. Traveling by night and hiding and resting by day, they covered 250 miles on foot. They were finally captured at Hüxter on May 3rd, after Berlin had fallen and Hitler was already dead. Others escaped to their homes and avoided becoming prisoners of war. Colonel General Harpa opted for surrender on April 17th. Lieutenant General Walter Denkert, the commander of the 3rd Panzer Grenadier Division, also surrendered as did Baron von Lütwitz, the commander of the 47th Panzer Corps, General of Infantry Erich Abraham, commander of the 63rd Corps, and the commanders of the 9th, 180th, 190th, and 338th Divisions, among others. In all, 29 German generals surrendered or were captured during the Battle of the Ruhr Pocket, along with an admiral, but not Field Marshal Modell. On the morning of April 21st, with the Americans only a mile away, he walked into a deep forest near Duisburg, accompanied only by Colonel Theodor Pilling, his intelligence officer. Anything's better than falling into Russian hands, he said. You will bury me here. He then shot himself in the head. The Battle of the Ruhr Pocket was over. Otto Moritz Walter Model, the youngest field marshal in the German army, was buried in a secret grave until it was felt safe to reinter his remains in the military cemetery at Vosenach in the Hürtgen Forest in 1955, not far from the grave of George S. Patton. Many of the men of his army group also died over the next few months. Some of the POW camps were just fields surrounded by concertina wire, open to the elements and without medical facilities and even the most primitive shelters or sanitation facilities. At Bad Kreuznach, 56,000 men were crammed into a camp designed for 4,500. One POW later testified before a German investigation committee that for weeks the daily ration in his camp was Three spoons full of vegetables, a spoonful of fish, two prunes, one spoonful of jam, and four biscuits. Many died of malnutrition, sickness, exposure, or collapsed and died in the urine-soaked mud. The death toll climbed into the tens of thousands and perhaps higher. In his controversial book Other Losses, Canadian writer James Bach, 
estimated that about 800,000 German POWs died in Western prison camps after the war. Stephen Ambrose, the foremost biographer of Eisenhower, estimated that the number was much lower, 50,000 at most. It seems likely that Ambrose's figure is closer to the mark, but this is merely educated guesswork, and it is an open question how readily German soldiers in the Ruhr would have surrendered if they had known what was to follow. Whatever the might have been, German soldiers in the Ruhr did surrender rapidly. At a cost of just over 10,000 casualties, the Americans captured 317,000 German soldiers. For the German army, in terms of pure numbers, it was a disaster larger than Stalingrad. It destroyed the Central Army Group of OB West and tore a gap 200 miles wide in the German line. A gap Kesselring had no means of plugging with his weak reserves, the 11th and 12th Armies. Defeat was now an accomplished fact on the Western Front. After more than five years of war, the Wehrmacht was disintegrating. Chapter 10 Defeat in Italy And what was happening in Italy while the German armies in the East and West were being smashed? After the fall of Rome, Kesselring's Army Group C retreated at a relatively slow pace to the Gothic Line, which it reached during the third week in August 1944. Kesselring faced the Allies with two armies, Colonel General Heinrich von Fietinghoff's 10th, now responsible for the Adriatic Sector, which was judged more critical at this time, and General of Panzer Troops Joachim Lemelsen's 14th on the western flank. Since his defeat in front of Rome in June, Kesselring had received five new divisions, plus infantry divisions Ostpreußen, East Prussia, Wiltflecken, and Schlesien. These last three were broken up and their men used as replacements for several divisions in the army group. In exchange, Kesselring had to give up the Hermann Göring division, sent to the Russian front in July, and the 3rd and 15th Panzer Grenadier divisions, sent to the Western Front in August. He had therefore gained eight mediocre non-motorized divisions, but lost three good mobile divisions. This exchange left him with six understrength mobile divisions, the 1st and 4th Parachute, the 26th and 16th SS Panzer, and the 29th and 90th Panzer Grenadier. With his generally unremarkable divisions, Kesselring took maximum advantage of the excellent defensive terrain of Italy to fall back slowly to the north. The British reached the Gothic Line in late August 1944 and launched numerous set-piece attacks on the Coriano Ridge, a key position in the Gothic Line, from September 12th to September 20th. The Germans finally withdrew without suffering a decisive defeat, but British losses were heavy. The Eighth Army lost 480 tanks destroyed or badly damaged. Almost all of the British infantry battalions had to be reduced from four to three companies for the next six months. In the fifth year of the war, the United Kingdom was finally nearing the end of its manpower reserves and the famous 1st British Armoured Division had to be disbanded as a combat formation, although its headquarters continued to exist as a staff without combat units. To the Genghis Khan Line Now the Germans retreated onto the plain of Romanga, and Kesselring began preparing deep defenses across the Po River Valley. The strongest position was known as the Genghis Khan Line, which ran from Lake Comacchio, to the Apennines, covering Bologna, Modena, and Parma. He also established the shorter and easier to defend, but also weak Adige or Venetian line. The German 14th Army still clung tenaciously to the Apennine ridges south of Bologna, and while the U.S. 5th Army chipped away at these defenses, there was no question of a rapid breakthrough. A gain of one mile a day was considered good progress. 
After three weeks of exhausting climbing and fighting, the Americans took Monte Grande Massif, just five miles from the critical Route 9. By the end of the week, they were within ten miles of Bologna. By this time, however, 1st Parachute Corps had been reinforced to a strength of eleven divisions, none at full strength, including the 16th SS Panzer Grenadier, 1st Parachute, and 29th and 90th Panzer Grenadier. Struggling as they might, the American infantrymen were nearing the end of their endurance, and Bologna remained just beyond their grasp. On October 23rd, Kesselring was on the road from 5 a.m. until late evening, visiting several headquarters and frontline divisions, as was his habit. In his memories, he recalls how he was greeted with enthusiasm everywhere, and how he got the impression that the crisis had passed, as indeed it had. At 7 p.m., on his way to visit the last two divisions on his agenda for the day, his driver was passing a column when a long-barreled gun came out of a side road. The field marshal's car was going about 45 miles per hour when they collided. Kesselring suffered a badly lacerated face, which he later described as a hideous mess, a severely fractured skull, and had to undergo brain surgery. After it became apparent that he would live, the troops joked that the field marshal was doing well after the accident, but the gun had to be scrapped, a joke that pleased the recovering commander-in-chief immensely. Even so, he was unable to return to duty before 1945. He was temporarily replaced by Colonel General Heinrich von Fietinghoff, who was determined to hold Bologna as stubbornly as he had held Cassino, in 1943-44. Fietinghoff was temporarily succeeded as commander of the 10th Army by General of Panzer Troops Traugott Hare. Within a week, however, General of Panzer Troops Joachim Lemelson moved over from 14th Army to assume command of the 10th, Hare returned to command of the 76th Panzer Corps, and General of Panzer Troops Friedo von Zenger, the commander of the 14th Panzer, became acting commander of the 14th Army for the second time. In December, General of Infantry Kurt von Tippelskirk was named acting commanding general of 14th Army, and General Zenger returned to the 14th Panzer. By the time of Kesselring's accident, the Americans were exhausted, and their offensive was suspended on October 27th. Except for a minor thrust or two, the Allies, in effect, went into winter quarters, which freed several German divisions to launch a massive attack on Italian partisans, scattering them in the mountains. The U.S. official history estimated that the number of guerrillas operating against the Germans fell from 130,000 to 50,000. They would remain active for the rest of the war, but would not constitute a serious threat to the German army in Italy, until after Army Group C suffered its decisive defeat in 1945. The Canny of Army Group C During the winter of 1944-45, Field Marshal Sir Harold Alexander became Supreme Commander Mediterranean. U.S. General Mark Clark took command of the 15th Army Group, and Lucien Truscott was recalled from France to take over the 5th Army from Clark. British Lieutenant General Richard L. McCreary commanded the other army in the 15th Army Group, the famous British 8th Army. Both he and Truscott were top-notch commanders. On the German side, Heinrich von Fietinghoff, the OB Southwest and Commander-in-Chief of Army Group C, made 10th Army responsible for the entire active sector, from about 30 miles west of Bologna to the Adriatic coast, while 14th Army held the inactive Mediterranean coast and western Apennine sectors. Fietinghoff gave the newly arrived 73rd Corps, commanded by General of Infantry Anton Dostler, control of the sector immediately adjacent to the Adriatic Sea, while at the front, General of Panzer Troops Joachim Lemelson's 10th Army controlled, from left to right, the 73rd, 76th Panzer, 14th Panzer, and 1st Parachute Corps. 
Kesselring returned to command of OB Southwest and Army Group C on January 15, 1945, and Fietinghoff briefly resumed command of 10th Army. Then, near the end of January, he was sent to Russia to command Army Group Courland. Lemelson returned to the command of 14th Army. General of Infantry Kurt von Tippelskirk went on leave. General of Panzer Troops Traugott Herr again assumed command of 10th Army. And Count Gerhard von Schweren, the former commander of the 116th Panzer Division, who had friends in the high command, took over the 76th Panzer Corps on April 1st and was immediately promoted to General of Panzer Troops, in spite of his abysmal record in Normandy and the Siegfried Line battles. It was fortunate for Army Group C that Kesselring returned when he did, because OKW wanted Hitler to reinforce both the Eastern and Western fronts at the expense of the Italian theater. Kesselring deftly negotiated giving up four divisions, only one of which, the 16th SS Panzer Grenadier, was mobile. He rearranged the front he had inherited from Fietinghof, giving more responsibility to 14th Army, and placing the experienced General of Panzer Troops, Friedo von Zenger, in command of the Bologna sector. He had to commit three of his five mobile divisions, the 26th Panzer and 1st and 4th Parachute, to the front line because of its length. The mobile divisions left in reserve were the 90th and 29th Panzer Grenadier. Lacking fortified positions, Kesselring and Fietinghof constructed a defense in depth, with delaying positions between several defensive lines. The last, the Adige or Venetian line, ran from Lake Garda eastward through the Alpine foothills to the Adige River, which it followed to the Adriatic. Behind it lay the Voralpenstellung, the forward Alpine defenses of the National Redoubt, which was being constructed by a special command, Alpine Fortress Command Tyrol, headed by General of Infantry Hans Jordan, the former commander of the Ninth Army on the Eastern Front. Kesselring and his generals knew that the best they could do was fight a skillful delaying action to the Adige. The vital question was, would Hitler approve a withdrawal in time? Hitler's strategy of holding the most forward possible line gave an advantage to Allied commanders Sir Harold Alexander and Mark Clark, who planned to destroy Army Group C south of the Po. If the British could advance as far as Ferrara and Bondeno, they would cut off the bulk of Army Group C. The U.S. Fifth Army would attack astride Route 65 in the direction of Bologna. Once the German front broke, the British were to cross the Po and send armored brigades to the north to disrupt any German attempts to man the Adige line. Simultaneously, the Americans would cross the river and drive for Verona, Lake Garda, and ultimately the Brenner Pass. The Allied attack was preceded by elaborate deception measures designed to convince von Fietinghof, who had returned as OB Southwest again after Kesselring replaced Rundstedt as OB West on March 9, 1945, that they planned to strike via amphibious landings north of the Po. Fietinghoff fell for the ploy on March 29th when he sent Lieutenant General Dr. Fritz Polak's 29th Panzer Grenadier Division to the Venetian coast, leaving the 90th Panzer Grenadier Division near Modena as the Army Group's only mobile reserve south of the Po. On April 1st, the British 2nd Commando Brigade launched a diversionary attack against the Spit, a narrow strip of coast between the Adriatic and Lake Comacchio. They quickly routed the 162nd Turkoman Infantry Division, captured the 142nd Fusilier Battalion, the reconnaissance battalion of the 42nd Jaeger Division, and took 800 prisoners. Like most German divisions at this point, the 42nd Jaeger was no longer the size of a division, having only 2,600 men when the battle began. On his own initiative, General Polak sent his 129th Panzer Reconnaissance Battalion to the threatened sector. 
Fietinghoff was now further convinced that the Allies intended to land north of the Po. On the other flank, the U.S. 92nd Infantry Division launched another diversionary attack on April 5th and forced General Lemelson to commit a regiment-sized battle group from the veteran 90th Panzer Grenadier Division to the front. This left the Germans with less than a full mobile division to commit against the Allies when the British 8th Army commenced the long-awaited main offensive on April 9th. It started with British air and artillery bombardments that lasted eight hours. The effects were devastating, especially to the German 98th and 362nd Infantry Divisions. Even so, the Germans gave ground slowly, despite the overwhelming Allied air superiority. By nightfall, however, the British were across the Seigneur River, one of the innumerable small rivers flowing off the Apennine Mountains. Two British divisions mauled the 42nd Jaeger Division, and the 2nd Polish Corps joined the offensive, but quickly bogged down in front of Major General Victor Linartz's 26th Panzer Division. The retreat of the 98th and 362nd Infantry, however, exposed Linartz's left flank, and the Panzer Division had to pull back. By noon on April 12th, both the British 5th and Polish 2nd Corps had moved troops across the Santerno River against strong German resistance. The battle now spilled over into an area known as the Argenta Gap, between the Reno River and Lake Comacchio. By this time, both Fietinghoff and Hare were convinced that the Allies did not intend to launch a major amphibious operation north of the Po, so they committed the 29th Panzer Grenadier Division to the battle for the Gap. It did not arrive in time, however, to prevent the British from capturing the critical Bastia Bridge over the Reno River before the remnants of the 42nd Jaeger could blow it up. General von Fietinghoff saw his front collapsing, and signaled OKW that to counter the Allied advance, he needed to adopt a mobile defense. Without waiting for a reply from Berlin, he ordered the 1st Parachute Corps to abandon an increasingly dangerous salient and pull back to the Genghis Khan line. General Hare, meanwhile, committed the entire 29th Panzer Grenadier to the defense of the town of Argenta, transferred the 278th Folks Grenadier Division from the 1st Parachute Corps to plug the gap in the east left by the burned-out 98th Infantry Division, and withdrew the 26th Panzer Division, which was fighting the Poles into a reserve position behind the Reno. Despite Hare's astute tactics, Lt. Gen. Charles F. Keitley's British V Corps broke through the German lines east of Argenta on April 17th, endangering the Reno River line, with the combined Allied thrust threatening to overwhelm Army Group C. Fietinghoff then received a remarkable signal from General Yodel, although it undoubtedly originated with Hitler. All further proposals for a change in the present war strategy will be discontinued, I wish to point out particularly that under no circumstances must troops or commanders be allowed to waver or to adopt a defeatist attitude as a result of such ideals apparently held by your headquarters. Where any such danger is likely, the sharpest countermeasures must be employed. The Fuhrer expects now, as before, the utmost steadfastness in the fulfillment of your present mission to defend every inch of the North Italian areas entrusted to your command. I desire to point out the serious consequences for all those higher commanders, unit commanders, or staff officers who do not carry out the Fuhrer's orders to the last word. More than threatening letters would be needed, however, to halt the Allied offensive. The British steadily advanced against the battered 10th Army, with its 1st Parachute Division and 278th Infantry Division bearing the brunt of the fighting. Further west, the Americans advanced. At 8.30 a.m. on April 14th, Lemelson's 14th Army was hit by hundreds of heavy bombers dropping tens of thousands of high-explosive and napalm bombs. Then at 9.10 a.m., more than 2,000 guns blasted German positions. After this barrage, the American infantry jumped off. 
eight divisions, two of them armored, under the U.S. 2nd and 4th Corps. They were opposed by 51st Mountain Corps, commanded by Lieutenant General Friedrich Wilhelm Hauck, and Zenger's 14th Panzer Corps, which deployed, from left to right, the 114th Jaeger, 334th Folks Grenadier, 94th Infantry, 8th Mountain, and 65th Infantry Divisions, with about two-thirds of the 90th Panzer Grenadier Division in reserve. The Rofeno Massif, the key terrain feature in the 14th Army's sector, was defended by Lieutenant General Helmut Bülke's 334th Folks Grenadier Division and Lieutenant General Bernhard Steinmetz's 94th Infantry Division, which had been crushed south of Rome the year before. Each now had only three understrength regiments of two battalions each, and neither had any significant reserves. By nightfall of April 14th, the American mountaineers had forced a serious gap between the divisions of Bulka and Steinmetz. The following morning, Allied air forces dropped 1,500 tons of bombs on the German front and 800 tons in its rear. By nightfall, Steinmetz, facing encirclement, requested permission to pull back. Zenger refused to authorize voluntary withdrawals. By the following afternoon, the Americans had cut every road in Steinmetz's sector, and the 94th Infantry had to abandon most of its vehicles and heavy equipment in a cross-country retreat. Fietinghoff committed his last reserves, the 90th Panzer Grenadier Division, to a counterattack against the left flank of the American advance, but was repulsed. By nightfall on April 18th, the U.S. 10th Mountain Division, overcoming the terrain and the Grenadiers, reached the edge of the mountains and could see Highway 9 and the Lombardy Plain below. General Bülke was a solid commander. When World War I began, he joined the 2nd Pomeranian Jaegers. By war's end, he was a battlefield-commissioned lieutenant commanding a company. He then served in the Fry Corps during the War After the War, as the Civil Unrest of 1918-1923 was called. Not selected for the Reichsheer, he joined the police and rose to the rank of major. He rejoined the army in 1935 and in 1937 was commanding a battalion in the 21st Infantry Regiment, which he led in Poland. Promoted to colonel, he directed a replacement training regiment and then a line regiment in central Russia. Here he contracted a liver and biliary disease from which he suffered the rest of his life. For his service at Rzhev, Bulka received the Knight's Cross. A tour of duty as commander of the Ninth Army's training school followed. Marked for higher command, Bulka attended a division commander's course in Germany, was promoted to Major General on January 1, 1944, and assumed command of the 334th Infantry, later Folks Grenadier Division, a month later. He was twice praised in Wehrmacht dispatches for his courage and leadership, at Casino and in the heavy fighting north of Florence, which noted that his excellence had been proven. Meanwhile, he was promoted to lieutenant general and was awarded the oak leaves to the Knight's Cross. His excellent record, high decorations, unquestionable courage, and the fact that he had made no major mistakes in April 1945 could not save him. A scapegoat was needed for Germany's latest defeat, and Bulka was selected. On April 16, 1945, he was relieved of his command and sent back to the fatherland in disgrace. He could not go home because it was under Soviet occupation. He was never reemployed. While the U.S. Fourth Corps gained ground fairly rapidly in the center of the American attack, Major General Martin Strahammer's 114th Jaeger Division limited the 1st Brazilian Corps on the Allied left to purely local gains, and Zenger's 14th Panzer Corps stalled the advance of the U.S. Second Corps south of Bologna. By April 19th, the German line resembled an inverted V, making it a longer front, and Lemelson's depleted units could not fill all the gaps. 
On April 19th, two U.S. divisions attacked the Mikkelstellung, the Mikkel position, the last German line south of the Po Valley. It was discontinuous and centered on inadequately fortified strong points. Nevertheless, its defenders put up fierce resistance. This, however, was the last hurrah for Army Group C. At noon on April 20th, the American mountain troops captured Monte San Michele, and the German front collapsed. Realizing that the 14th Army was routed, the brilliant General Lucian Truscott sent the U.S. 1st Armored Division in pursuit of the retreating Germans. Lemelson countered by throwing in his last reserve, the 190th Panzer Battalion of the 90th Panzer Grenadier Division, a rebuilt Africa Corps unit with a pitiful handful of worn-out tanks. It temporarily halted the American Armored Division and bought the fleeing infantry a few hours, but Truscott now committed three divisions to the pursuit. A German rearguard put up a desperate fight in the village of Pradalbino and had to be crushed, but again it offered the fleeing Germans only a temporary respite. Around 3 p.m., the U.S. 10th Mountain cut Highway 9, 10 miles northwest of Bologna, forcing General Zenger to abandon the city later that night. General von Fietinghoff, meanwhile, withdrew Major General Friedrich von Schelwitz's 305th Infantry Division from southeast of Bologna, and ordered it to plug a gap that was threatening the 14th Panzer Corps to the west. But the maneuver did not work. The Americans were moving too rapidly. After nightfall on April 20th, Fietinghoff, without contacting Hitler or OKW, ordered that Operation Autumn Mist, the withdrawal to the Po, be put into effect immediately. Had he been given permission to withdraw on April 14th, as he requested, this veteran East Prussian general would probably have escaped with his command intact, but by April 20th it was too late. The 14th Panzer Corps was the first to be smashed. During the night of April 21st to 22nd, Zenger ordered General Steinmetz to form a blocking position at Mirandula, about halfway between Modena and the Po River, and to hold it until the rest of the corps could retreat past that point. When the 94th Infantry reached Mirandola, however, they found the U.S. 88th Infantry Division was already there. Thus cut off, Steinmetz ordered his men to break into small detachments and sneak across the Po. The general made good his escape, but most of his division did not, and its vehicles and heavy weapons were lost. Early on the morning of April 23rd, Zenger disbanded his corps and ordered his men to reassemble at Legnano across the Po and on the Adige River. Only 2,000 men made it, and four more German divisions essentially ceased to exist. Lieutenant General Paul Schricker's 8th Mountain Division, formerly the 157th Reserve Mountain Division, and Lieutenant General Helmut Pfeiffer's 65th Infantry Division were also trapped south of the Po. General Pfeiffer was killed in action on April 22nd. Most of his and Schricker's troops surrendered. The loss of the 14th Panzer Corps left General Lemelson's 14th Army with one intact corps, General of Artillery Friedrich Wilhelm Hauck's 51st Mountain. It had three intact divisions, the 148th Infantry, the 232nd Infantry, and the 114th Jaeger, but was separated from the rest of Army Group C by the advancing Americans. Hauk pulled back as rapidly as possible to the northwest, hoping to outmarch American tanks and trucks and get behind German lines. General Truscott did not pursue the 51st Mountain too closely because he wanted to eliminate the elite 1st and 4th Parachute Divisions of the 1st Parachute Corps. Late in the evening of April 23rd, the U.S. 88th Infantry Division reached the Po River and cut off Major General Alois Weber's 362nd Infantry Division of the 1st Parachute Corps. The Americans bagged 11,000 prisoners over the next two days, including Generals Weber and von Schelwitz. On the U.S. 2nd Corps' right wing, 
the U.S. 91st Infantry and 6th South African Armored Divisions, were checked by the 1st and 4th Parachute, which made a determined stand on the small Panaro River. To the east, the British 6th Armored Division had been committed to the Battle of the Argenta Gap with the mission of cutting off the retreat of the 1st Parachute Corps. On April 21st, it smashed Lieutenant General Harry Hopa's 278th Infantry Division, which had been holding the escape corridor for the rest of the 1st Parachute. Two days later, the British 6th linked up with the South African Armored Division at the village of Finale, encircling the 1st Parachute Corps. The Corps Commander, General of Paratroopers Richard Heydrich, and the survivors of the 1st and 4th Parachute Divisions swam the River Po and reformed, but without artillery, anti-tank guns, or even heavy machine guns. They were no longer any match for the rapidly advancing Allies and were finished off by the Americans at Verona on April 26th. Among the prisoners were Major General Karl Lothar Schultz, commander of the 1st Parachute, and Major General Heinrich Trettner, the commander of the 4th Parachute Division, General Kurt Studen's former chief of staff and one of the principal architects of the German Parachute Branch. General Heydrich was not captured until May 3rd. The destruction of the 1st Parachute Corps at Finale on April 23rd left General Count von Schweren's 76th Panzer Corps as the only more or less intact German force south of the Po, and it was also under heavy British attack. The next day, Lieutenant General Walter Joost, commander of the depleted 42nd Jaeger Division, was killed at Villadoza, and elements of two British corps reached the river. With no way to successfully extricate his corps, General Schwerin ordered his remaining divisions, the 98th Infantry, 162nd Infantry, 26th Panzer, and 29th Panzer Grenadier, to abandon their vehicles, artillery, and heavy equipment, and swim across the river. Knowing that Hitler would want him shot, he did not cross the river, but surrendered to the British on April 25th. The Battle of the Po was over. Of the 23 German divisions in Italy, 19 were engaged in the battle. Only one emerged roughly intact, and only the 90th Panzer Grenadier could still function as a mobile unit. Army Group C had made it across the Po, but it lacked vehicles, tanks, or heavy weapons to reach and defend the Adige or Venetian lines. Thanks to Hitler's interference, the strongest remaining German army group had been destroyed in a battle lasting 16 days. The war in Italy was lost. By April 25th, Italian partisans controlled Milan, Genoa, and Turin. On April 26th, Lieutenant General Max Pemsel, chief of staff of the Ligurian Army, the Axis Rear Command, surrounded by partisans, surrendered to the Americans. On April 28th, the Allies closed the last escape route through the Alpine passes when they captured its defenders, Lieutenant General Dr. Fritz Polak and his staff, and the remnants of the 29th Panzer Grenadier Division. With collapse facing him everywhere, the rear area commander, general of the SS Karl Wolf, secretly arranged for a separate surrender of Army Group C, with General Fietinghoff's implied approval. The surrender was signed on April 29th, the day after partisans captured and killed Mussolini. Kesselring, however, as OB Vest, and in charge of Army Groups A, G, C, Ostmark, and E, in eastern Germany slash Czechoslovakia, southern Germany, Italy, Austria, and the Balkans, respectively, did not approve the idea of a separate surrender for Army Group C. He believed that Fietinghoff had deceived him, retreated precipitously, and deliberately failed to coordinate his movements with Army Group E. He relieved Fietinghoff of his command, placed him under house arrest in Innsbruck, repudiated the surrender, and sacked General of Panzer Troops Hans Rüdiger, the Army Group Chief of Staff. Fietinghoff and Rüdiger were replaced by General of Infantry Friedrich Schultz, the Commander-in-Chief of Army Group G, 
and Lieutenant General Fritz Wenzel. Schultz also remained in command of Army Group G. Kesselring ordered Schultz and Wenzel to Italy immediately to ensure that Army Group C continued to fight. But at 7 a.m. on May 1st, General Rittiger arrested Schultz and Wenzel, and a co-conspirator, Major General Siegfried Kempf, the chief signal officer of Army Group C, cut communications between Army Group C headquarters and the rest of the Reich. General Rittiger and General Ritter Maximilian von Pohl, the Luftwaffe commander in Italy, then tried to persuade Generals Lemelson and Hare, commanders of the 14th and 10th Armies, to agree to the surrender terms. They refused to consider such an action while General Schultz was under arrest. At this impasse, SS General Wolf worked out a compromise with Schultz and Wenzel. The arrested officers refused to enter negotiations while they were captives, but did agree to hold a general conference after their release to determine what should be done. Wolf then freed them, and the conference began at Army Group C headquarters at 6 p.m., with General Schultz acting as chairman. Wolf, Wenzel, Pohl, Rüdiger, Lemelson, and Hare were also present. Hare opened the discussion by reporting the Tenth Army was virtually destroyed. Everyone except Wenzel urged Schultz to surrender within 24 hours. Schultz and Wenzel conceded that surrender was the rational decision, but refused to authorize it without Kesselring's approval. Wolf called Kesselring's headquarters and was connected to the OB Vest Chief of Staff, General of Cavalry Siegfried Westphal. He was sympathetic and promised that Kesselring would call Wolf at 10 p.m. Shortly after 10.30 p.m., with no call from Kesselring, General Traugott Hare decided to act. He turned to his adjutant and issued orders for the men of the 10th Army to lay down their arms, beginning at 2 p.m. on May 2nd. Lemelson then issued surrender orders for the remnants of the 51st Mountain, 1st Parachute, and 14th Panzer Corps. At 11 p.m., the generals received word that Adolf Hitler was dead. The conference principals, except for Schultz and his chief of staff, adjourned to Wolf's command post, where the SS general had prudently posted 350 troops loyal to him, along with seven panzers. At 1.15 a.m., news arrived that the Luftwaffe High Command had ordered the arrest of General von Pohl. A few minutes later, a message arrived from Kesselring's headquarters, ordering the arrest of Fietinghoff, Rüdiger, Colonel Victor von Schweinitz, the general staff officer who had signed the surrender document, and Major General Kempf, the chief signal officer of Army Group C. The conspirators thought Schultz had betrayed them. In fact, Schultz had betrayed no one. The arrest orders were ignored, and at 4.30 a.m. on May 2nd, after much agonizing, General Schultz finally sanctioned the surrender of Army Group C. Kesselring later gave his belated and begrudging approval. Two days later, on May 4th, General Friedo von Zenger und Etterlin arrived at Mark Clark's headquarters at Florence as liaison officer in charge of arranging the details of the German capitulation. It was, Zenger noted in his war diary, a tragic moment, the complete defeat and the imminent surrender after a fight lasting six years tragic even for those who had foreseen it for a long time. The agony of Army Group C was over. Chapter 11 On the Edge By the end of March 1945, it was clear that Nazi Germany was doomed. Adolf Hitler, however, refused to admit it. Hundreds of officers who injudiciously expressed their disagreement, one Luftwaffe officer merely noted in his diary that the war was lost, were hauled before a special court or a flying court-martial and hanged. Hitler was convinced, or at least pretended to be convinced, that the Allied coalition would fall apart and the Third Reich would emerge triumphant. Rationalization, self-deception, and a belief that willpower could triumph over superior battalions were widespread at Fuhrer headquarters in 1945. 
Hitler had lost none of his hypnotic powers of personal persuasion. He was even able to convince intelligent men like General of Infantry Wilhelm Burgdorf and Luftwaffe Field Marshal Robert Ritter von Kreim that the war could yet be won. In making his decision to prosecute the war until final victory, Hitler told his Gauleiters in August 1944 that if the German people were to be conquered in this struggle, then they had been too weak to face the test of history and were fit only for destruction. This notion would become a familiar theme around Fuhrer headquarters. Would the German people prove worthy of the Fuhrer? By 1945, however, Hitler's own physical deterioration was obvious to everyone. Years of taking Dr. Theodor Morell's drugs had taken a serious toll on him physically, just as the assassination attempt of July 20, 1944, had affected him both physically and psychologically. His left arm trembled to the point that it was useless. He dragged his left foot when he walked. He had developed a pronounced stoop. He worked incessantly but monotonously. The once sociable Fuhrer was now practically a recluse, living in complete isolation except for his entourage. This too had changed and shrunken considerably since 1939. It now consisted of his secretaries, his mistress, Ava Brown, his doctor, the quack, a few generals who still pandered to him, and Nazi party leader Martin Bormann. As defeat approached, Hitler himself grew increasingly miserable and frustrated. More and more he dreamed of retirement at Linz and devoted himself to his only remaining amusement, architectural planning. Playing with Albert Speer's old models in his underground bunker, he did not have to face the present, where fate was closing in on him. When Hitler announced that superior willpower could triumph over superior numbers of battalions, he was dismissing a great many battalions. For Stalin was already within 60 miles of Berlin and was massing his forces for the final onslaught. Three full fronts, army groups, were earmarked for the drive on the German capital. 2,500,000 men, 6,250 tanks, 41,600 pieces of artillery and mortars, 3,255 multiple-tube rocket launchers, and nearly 100,000 motorized vehicles. To meet this mammoth threat, Heinrichs' army group Vistula had perhaps 700,000 men, 750 tanks, and 400 to 500 guns, excluding anti-aircraft guns. It was supported by Ritter von Grimes' 6th Air Fleet, which had only 300 operational airplanes. In addition, the Germans were critically short of ammunition. Stalin placed Zhukov in charge of the last offensive. From north to south, he deployed Rokossovsky's 2nd Belarusian Front, General Vasily D. Sokolovsky's 1st Belarusian Front, and Konev's 1st Ukrainian Front. The battle plan called for the first Belarusian to launch the main attack against the German Ninth Army. Konev's first Ukrainian front was to crush the 4th Panzer Army on the left flank of Army Group Center, and in conjunction with the first Belarusian front, encircle the Ninth Army and Berlin from the south. The second Belarusian front was to push the 3rd Panzer Army toward the coast, away from the capital, and encircle Berlin from the north. Simultaneously, south of the main combat zone, the 4th, 2nd, and 3rd Ukrainian fronts were to pin down army groups center and south to prevent them from reinforcing the Berlin sector. The odds against General Heinrichs' army group Vistula were overwhelming. As of April 1st, General of Infantry Theodor Busse's 9th Army had 17 badly understrength divisions. The 32nd SS Panzer Grenadier Division, for example, had only 2,846 men, while the Panzer Division Münchenberg had only 2,867. 
The Berlin 309th Infantry Division was apparently the largest in the army, 5,889 men, while the 25th Panzer Grenadier Division had 5,196 soldiers. The Panzer Grenadier Division Kurmark had 2,375, and the 712th Infantry Division could muster only 3,699 troops. The other divisions of the Ninth Army were in equally miserable shape. Buse's depleted legions opposed the first Belarusian front, which had 18 armies, more armies than the Ninth Army had divisions. In all, the first Belarusian had 77 rifle divisions, eight artillery divisions, seven tank or mechanized corps, plus dozens of independent brigades and regiments. They outnumbered Busa 3,155 to 512 in tanks and assault guns, and 16,934 to 344 in artillery pieces excluding about 350 anti-aircraft guns. Baron von Manteuffel's 3rd Panzer Army had 11 divisions, all under strength and none of which were Panzer. Opposing him, Rokossovsky's 2nd Belarusian Front had eight armies, controlling 33 rifle divisions, three artillery divisions, and four tank or mechanized corps. They had 951 tanks and assault guns against Manteuffel's 242. They outnumbered him in artillery by a margin of at least 10 to 1. On Zhukov's left flank, Konev's front outnumbered General Fritz Hubert Grazer's 4th Panzer Army by a similar margin. Many of Heinrichs' divisions were recently created units and came from the replacement army, or were ad hoc formations of regimental size and divisions in name only, including SS units made up of foreign volunteers and marine formations consisting of sailors converted into infantry. They were in no way comparable to United States Marines. On March 26th, in what amounted to a declaration of military bankruptcy, the Home Army was dissolved. In the so-called March of the Goths, its cadre units were formed into divisions, numbered 402 to 490, and were sent to the front, providing 70,000 men as reinforcements for the Oder sector and 45,000 for OB Vest. In such impossible circumstances, Army Group Vistula was fortunate to have one of Germany's most gifted and experienced commanders. Gotthard Heinrichsee was a tough, solid, tactically brilliant, tested and respected East Prussian officer and gentleman. When Heinrichsee took command of Army Group Vistula from Heinrich Himmler, he knew he had inherited a likely hopeless situation. Hitler made his job harder by insisting that the Soviets' main objective would be Prague, not Berlin. On April 2nd and 3rd, Hitler, overruling Heinrichsee's objections, transferred almost half of Heinrichsee's armor to the south. Heinrichsee and his operations officer, Colonel Georg Eismann, met with Hitler at the Führer bunker in Berlin during the afternoon of April 4th. Also present were Admiral Dernitz, Bormann, Jodl, Krebs, now chief of the general staff and de facto head of OKH, Himmler and Goering. To partially compensate for the loss of his armor, Heinrichsee wanted permission to abandon Fortress Frankfurt, Frankfurt on the Oder, which would give him 18 additional battalions to deploy. Hitler's reaction was bizarre. At first a lengthy silence, then a quiet acquiescence, followed by an outburst of fury. Screaming that no one understood him, he commanded that Frankfurt be held, while authorizing Heinrichsy to withdraw six battalions. Hitler asked who commanded the fortress. Colonel Bieler, said Heinrichsy. Is he a Gneisenau? Hitler demanded, referring to the Prussian hero of the Napoleonic Wars. Heinrichsy said he thought so. 
He returned to the issue of the six battalions, telling Hitler that his divisions would probably lose a battalion a day against a major Soviet offensive. He needed at least 100,000 replacements. Goering, Dernitz, and Himmler promised that they could provide 100,000 people. There, Hitler exclaimed, there are your people. Heinrich, he said he did not need people, he needed trained divisions. But Hitler was now carried away by the prospect of another 100,000 troops and ordered Heinrich to place them in his second line of defense. They'll simply annihilate the Russians who break through, he exclaimed. Heinrich said he already had too many inexperienced soldiers, and if they were not reinforced with battle-hardened divisions, then I can't guarantee they'll withstand the coming Russian attack, and the lack of proper reserves dangerously lessens my chance of holding off the Russian attack. You have your 100,000 new men, the dictator said quietly. As for holding the line, it's up to you to back up the troops with morale and confidence, and the battle will be won. That was the end of their discussion. General Heinrich, he incidentally, received about 30,000 of the 100,000 reinforcements he was promised. Colonel Ernst Bieler, the commandant of Fortress Frankfurt-Oder, had just recovered from wounds suffered on the Eastern Front, where he had served as acting commander of the 205th Infantry Division. He was selected to defend the fortress because he was familiar with the city and had a family of four children who were available for reprisals if he surrendered too quickly. When he took command on January 25, 1945, he had about 5,000 men, most of whom were artillery trainees. The rest were convalescents, stragglers, and Volkssturm. By the second week of April, he had 30,000 men, half of them positioned east of the Oder and half in training camps on the western side. He had about 100 guns, captured French and Soviet pieces, a few German mortars, and about 40 panthers and assault guns. When he met with Hitler in the Fuhrer bunker on April 6th, the Soviets had advanced north and south of the city, and he advocated withdrawing from Frankfurt and consolidating his forces to the west. Hitler insisted that Frankfurt remain a German fortress. That is a direct command, he announced. No, my Führer, said Bieler. The Führer's entourage was shocked, and Hitler jumped to his feet. Get out of here, he roared, pointing to the door. Bieler picked up his maps and papers and walked out through the emergency exit to the Chancellery Garden. General Krebs followed him, relieved him of his command, and ordered him to report to General Busse. Bieler eventually telephoned Heinrichsy to tell him what happened. The salty East Prussian told him to return to Frankfurt and resume his command. Some senior officers called Heinrichsy the poisonous dwarf, because he was both short and unyielding. Unknown to Bieler, General Burghoff, the chief of the Army Personnel Office, had already informed Heinrichsy that Bieler had been relieved. Heinrichsy demanded that the order be rescinded, and when Burghoff said it was impossible because it was a direct order from the Fuhrer, Heinrichsy repeated his demand, saying it was ridiculous to relieve Bieler, and also demanded that the colonel be awarded the Knight's Cross. When Burghoff again cried that it was impossible, Heinrichsy said that either Bieler stayed or he quit, and hung up. Ernst Friedrich Bieler was reinstated as Commandant of Fortress Frankfurt, decorated with the Knight's Cross, and promoted to Major General on April 20, 1945, Adolf Hitler's 56th birthday. Heinrichsy made his final defensive preparations, planning to make his main stand in the Zelo Heights area, in the zone of Ninth Army, about 45 miles from Fuhrer headquarters. To defend this vital sector, Heinrichsy selected Major General Georg Schultz's 20th Panzer Grenadier Division, a tough veteran formation and one of the best units left in Army Group Vistula, along with the 9th Parachute Division an inexperienced unit of young men and boys with about two weeks of training. Its commander was Luftwaffe Major General Bruno Brauer. 
Brower had distinguished himself as a parachute commander early in the war, but was now an exhausted, worn-out, and dispirited man who had apparently been given this command because of a falling out with Goering. Heinrichsee placed the 20th Panzer Grenadier Division and the 9th Parachute Division under the command of the 56th Panzer Corps, led by the tough and experienced General of Artillery Helmut Weidling, who had led the 41st Panzer Corps on the Eastern Front since 1943, and the 86th Infantry Division before that. He sacked Brower and replaced him with Colonel Harry Hermann, a much younger and more vigorous parachute officer. Heinrichsee's plans included a strategic retreat a few miles to the rear once he knew where the Soviets would strike. His hope was to avoid a massive preliminary Soviet artillery bombardment. If the Soviets proved unstoppable, he planned to maneuver his armies to the west and surrender to the British or the Americans. He did not want to surrender his men to the Russians, and he did not want Berlin to become a battlefield. On April 14th, he met with Speer and Lieutenant General Helmut Rehmann, the Commandant of Berlin since March 6th, and told them his plan. With Hitler's permission, Heinrichs had already stripped combat units from the capital, except for 92 battalions of Volkssturm, two battalions of guard troops, and a few alarm battalions, made up of cooks and clerks. Heinrichs had even designated which bridges Raymond could blow up. None of them carried water pipelines, gas mains, or electric cables that civilians would need after the war. Joseph Stalin desperately wanted the Red Army to capture Berlin. He saw it as vital to his post-war goal of advancing Soviet power and influence. His Western allies seemed willing to accommodate him. On March 28th, U.S. Major General John R. Dean, the chief of the American military mission to Moscow, handed Stalin a telegram from General Eisenhower. It was a remarkable document. Without consulting the combined chiefs of staff, Eisenhower had decided that Berlin had lost its previous strategic significance and estimated that to capture the city would cost him 100,000 men. He therefore informed Stalin that after reducing the Ruhr pocket, the Anglo-American forces would advance to the southeast toward Erfurt, Leipzig, and Dresden. He also intended to advance into the Regensburg-Linz area to prevent the Nazis from occupying their Alpine redoubt in Bavaria and Austria. The capture of Berlin he therefore left to the Soviets. Both Prime Minister Winston Churchill and Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery were surprised when they learned of Eisenhower's telegram. Both objected to it, and Churchill suggested that the general may have overstepped his bounds by assigning himself his own military and political objectives. Neither Sir Winston nor Monty, however, could do anything about it, because the British were now definitely the junior partners in the Western Alliance, and both President Franklin Roosevelt and General George Marshall supported Eisenhower, even though Marshall considered the Alpine Redoubt threat to be a minor one. The remarkable aspect of this sudden change of strategic aim, military historian Albert Seaton noted, is that Roosevelt and the United States Chiefs of Staff should have left this final stage of war to the discretion of a single individual, who, although a soldier of distinction, may at that time have been lacking in political acumen and understanding the aims and methods of the Soviet Union. Military objectives should of necessity have been related to post-war political strategy. Stalin signaled Eisenhower that he generally agreed with his conclusions, especially about Berlin no longer being strategically significant, and his proposals. Stalin said he intended to make his main offensive in the direction of Dresden and Leipzig, and that it would be launched in the second half of May. This, however, was misdirection on Stalin's part. He did not believe that his Anglo-American allies intended to hand him Berlin, and he was determined to get there before them. Three days later, on the afternoon of Easter Sunday, April 1st, he ordered Zhukov and Konev to be ready to attack on April 16th. The Anglo-Americans would not be informed of the date of the offensive until April 15th. 
Until then, Stalin could only watch in alarm as the British and Americans overran Western and Central Germany. Disintegration in the West On March 28th, the day Eisenhower sent his dispatch to Stalin, Patton's Third Army crossed the Rhine at Mainz. And the next day, the French First Army stormed across the river near Germersheim. The northern wing of General Hans von Obstfelder's Seventh Army was now on the verge of disintegration. General of Infantry Gustav Hörner's 89th Corps was overrun. Smilo von Lütwitz's 85th Corps escaped the rapidly moving U.S. armored columns but was practically worthless as a combat formation. General of Infantry Walter Hamm's 82nd Corps was the only intact corps in the Seventh Army, but its three divisional units could not contain the Allied advance through Hanau and Aschaffenburg. Obstfelder tried to restore his line by upgrading General of Artillery Herbert Osterkamp's Wehrkreis 12 to 12th Provisional Corps and ordering it to hold a 35-mile-long front in the center of 7th Army's line. He tried to organize a counterattack, but panzers he hoped to use were dispersed by the U.S. 4th Armored Division. Disaster overtook A.B. Vest all along the line. On March 30th, Heidelberg fell, and the U.S. 6th Armored Division dashed toward Kassel. The next day, two U.S. Armored Divisions pushed into Fulda, which was defended by elements of the 166th Reserve Division, which managed to hold until April 2nd, and the Wehrmacht began its withdrawal from the Western Netherlands. On April 1st, Army Group B was encircled in the Ruhr Pocket, and by the morning of April 3rd, American units had driven the troops of Wehrkreis VI, Westphalia and Rhineland, from the streets of Münster. On all fronts, the litany of disaster continued. On April 3rd, the Russians took Wiener Neustadt, an Austrian manufacturing center, a major producer of Messerschmitt airplane engines, south of Vienna. On April 4th, Bratislava fell to the Red Army, the U.S. 4th Armored Division took Gotha without opposition. The U.S. 80th Infantry Division won the battle for Kassel. The French captured Karlsruhe. The U.S. 4th Armored Division seized Ordruf, the headquarters of O.B. Vest. Field Marshal Kesselring and his staff escaped just ahead of the American tanks. And the U.S. 90th Infantry Division cleared the town of Merkers of German troops. The Americans would soon make a discovery in Merkers. Two American military policemen spotted a woman out after curfew and running down a street. She told them that it was an emergency. She needed to find a midwife. The two MPs, to her obvious surprise, helped her rather than arresting her. In thanks, she pointed them to the Merkers salt mine and said, that's where the bullion is hidden. Before long, 2,100 feet below the surface, the Americans discovered the sealed vaults of the Reichsbank, which contained more than $1 billion in paper money and an estimated $200 million worth of gold. The vault also contained priceless artworks, including those evacuated from the Kaiser Friedrich Museum in Berlin. On April 5th, the U.S. 6th Armored Division took Mulhouse, the U.S. 30th Infantry Division took Hameln on the Vesel, the legendary home of the Pied Piper, and the French First Army began attacking German fortified positions in the Black Forest. The next day, the U.S. 84th Infantry and 2nd Armored Divisions broke the Weser River line near Minden, while Yugoslav partisans seized control of Sarajevo. In the north, the Allied advance severed General Johannes Blaskowitz's Army Group H from OB Vest. OKW therefore removed Army Group H, first parachute army and a few miscellaneous forces, from Kesselring's control, redesignated it OB Northwest, Oberbefehlshaber Nordwest, and placed it under the command of Field Marshal Ernst Busch a veteran Nazi most famous for his mishandling of Army Group Center during the Battle of White Russia, 1944. 
Blaskowitz was named commander of OB Netherlands and placed under the command of Bush, a definite demotion. Bush created the ad hoc Army Blumentritt, incorporating Wehrkreis 6 and 11, plus a few naval battalions in the Bremen sector, to defend a line along the Weser from Hameln to the coast. But it could not hold out for long. Indeed, the line was breached before it was even established. On April 7th, the Americans took Göttingen. On April 8th, they reached Schweinfurt. On April 9th, the Anglo-Americans began their final push in Italy, and British bombers sank the German cruiser Admiral Scheer at Kiel, destroying most of what was left of the German surface fleet. The Americans pushed east beyond the Ruhr into middle Franconia. Resistance was spotty, and more than ever, Nazi Germany turned against itself. More than 26,000 members of the Wehrmacht were sentenced to death for desertion or undermining the war effort, although many were sent to penal battalions instead. From January until May 1945, 4,000 people were executed, and flying court-martials executed 7,000 more. April 7th was a day of cold rain. The Allies approached the town of Alp, about seven miles south of Oceanfurt. While desperate and exhausted German troops tried to stop them, the mayor of a nearby village asked Private Alfred Eck, a 35-year-old deserter, to help him contact the Americans. Eck, in civilian clothes and carrying a white flag, reached U.S. lines and was brought to a senior commander. He gave the Americans the location of German units and the location of a minefield. The American commander promised Eck that the village and the town of Alp would not be destroyed if the German troops withdrew and every house flew a white flag. The Nazis had already decreed that any residents who flew a white flag would be shot. Private Eck tried to reach Alp, but German soldiers intercepted him. Alp was smoldering. It had been pounded by Yabos the day before. It was now under the command of Captain August Busse. Busse was born in 1914. His father had been killed in action in 1915, and his mother died three years later. He grew up in an orphanage. By 1933, he was a fervent member of the Hitler Youth. He served a year in the RAD, Reich Labor Service, and entered the army in June 1935. He underwent officer's training, earned his commission, and fought in Poland, France, and Russia. After being seriously wounded in April 1942, he recovered by spending two years as a training officer at an infantry school. In May 1944, Busse returned to the Eastern Front. He was seriously wounded again in December 1944 and evacuated to the Reich. After three months in the hospital, he was posted to Troop Maneuver Area Grafenwür near Nuremberg. Finally, he was attached to the 79th Volksgrenadier Division, which gave him command of Alb. He had about 600 men, mostly Fahnenjunkers and second lieutenants. Like Busse, they had been in action for several days and were nearly exhausted but most believed in Hitler's promised miracle weapons and still believed Germany could win the war. When Eck was hauled before Busse, the angry captain struck him in the face. He accused Eck of sabotage and treason. The captain quickly formed a court-martial, consisting of himself, his adjutant, and a nearby lance corporal, and accused Eck of approaching American lines without authorization for the purpose of surrendering the village of Baldersheim and giving away German positions which had come under enemy fire. They quickly found Eck guilty and sentenced him to death by hanging. Busse allowed a priest to visit Eck while the captain inspected nearby positions. Someone told Busse that he had seen Eck in uniform several days before. Busse returned to his headquarters and confronted Eck, who confessed that he had burned his military papers. The captain reconvened the court-martial and added desertion to X list of crimes. The private asked either to be shot or to be sent to a penal battalion at the front instead of being hanged. 
Busa rejected the penal battalion request, and the other members of the court-martial indignantly declared that shooting was too good for Eck. He wasn't worth the bullets. Interrupted only by occasional American artillery fire, gallows were hastily constructed in the town square. Eck was hanged about 1 p.m., and Busa ordered that his body remain hanging for 24 hours as a warning to others. A few days later, the Americans captured Alp. Captain Busa escaped with about 50 men. They traveled 15 miles at night through forests and fields without food or water. They collapsed in a haystack where they were surprised by a U.S. patrol. Busa was wounded and captured. He was sent to a prisoner of war compound in France from which he was released in May 1946. After the war, Busa made the mistake of visiting old friends in Alb. Eck's brother had him arrested and brought murder charges against him. Busa was convicted of having set up an illegal court-martial, and he was sentenced to two and a half years' imprisonment. Busa, who considered himself a career officer and a decent man, never believed that he had done anything wrong, and died embittered over the incident. On April 10th, the Americans took Hanover, in Lower Saxony, and Brunswick, Braunschweig, capturing the huge Hermann Goering steelworks, along with 67 large anti-aircraft guns. Coburg fell on April 11th, as did Erfurt and Weimar, the hometown of Schiller, Liszt, and Goethe. In the hills above the city, the Americans liberated the infamous Buchenwald concentration camp, along with 21,000 inmates. In the eight years of its existence, 56,000 of its inmates had been liquidated. The Nordhausen concentration camp was also liberated on April 11th. For the Americans, it was an unbelievably grisly experience. A sergeant from the 329th Medical Battalion reported, Rows upon rows of skin-covered skeletons met our eyes. Men lay as they had starved, discolored and lying in indescribable human filth. Their striped coats and prison numbers hung to their frames as a last token or symbol of those who enslaved and killed them. One girl in particular I noticed. I would say she was about seventeen years old. She lay there where she had fallen, gangrened and naked. In my own thoughts I choked up couldn't quite understand how and why war could do these things. We went downstairs into a filth indescribable, accompanied by a horrible dead rot stench. There in beds of crude wood I saw men too weak to move dead comrades from their side. One hunched down French boy was huddled up against a dead comrade as if to keep warm. There were others in dark cellar rooms, lying in disease and filth, being eaten away by diarrhea and malnutrition. It was like stepping into the dark ages to walk into one of these cellar cells and seek out the living. A few miles away, men of the U.S. 104th Infantry Division discovered a large underground factory which had been used to manufacture Werner von Braun's V-2 rockets. Production had only stopped the day before, when SS General Hans Kammler, the special commissioner of the V-weapons program, fled southward to Oberammergau, along with 500 of his specialists. American scientific teams sent about 100 of the rockets back to the United States for study. Near the factory, they found a slave labor camp which had a capacity of 30,000 prisoners. It was obvious that the Germans intended that none of the laborers would ever leave the factory alive. The crematory ovens could and had handled up to 150 bodies a day. The German defeats continued on April 12th, when Zangerhausen fell, Jena was bypassed, U.S. armored divisions reached the Elbe at Wittenberg, Verben, and Zandau, and the Canadian army began its push on Arnhem. The most important event of the day, however, occurred half a world away at Warm Springs, Georgia. Here at the Little White House, President Franklin D. Roosevelt suffered a cerebral hemorrhage at 1.15 p.m. 
He died at 4.35 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. He was succeeded by Vice President Harry S. Truman. Hitler saw FDR's death as the turning point. It was the miracle he had been waiting for. For some time, Hitler had seen himself as a sort of reincarnation of Frederick the Great. During the Seven Years' War, as the Fuhrer had been telling everyone for months, Prussia seemed defeated by the Allied coalition. Then the Tsarina died, the coalition fell apart, and Frederick and Prussia survived. Now, Hitler and Goebbels declared, history was repeating itself. The death of Roosevelt, they believed, signaled the being of the turning point for Nazi Germany. Paul Josef Goebbels was the first to return to reality. On April 13th, he noticed that Roosevelt's death had no impact on the enemy's operations. The Red Army took Vienna that day. U.S. General Simpson's Ninth Army continued to advance on a wide front, pushing into the rear of the German Eleventh and Twelfth Armies. The Ruhr pocket was obviously collapsing. Patton, unchecked, continued his rampage across central and southern Germany. Sandy Patches, U.S. Seventh Army, made unaccountable headway in Bavaria and Germany's last powder factory had been lost, leaving the Wehrmacht with no more than a month's worth of ammunition. Perhaps fate has again been cruel and made fools of us, Goebbels told members of his staff that evening. Perhaps we counted our chickens before they were hatched. Goebbels's view was confirmed over the next two days. On April 14th, the Ruhr pocket was split in two, Patton captured Chemnitz, and the U.S. 3rd Armored Division advanced 23 miles against weak opposition. That same day, Bayreuth was captured by the Americans. The battle consisted of one Hitler Youth member firing a Panzerfaust at an American Sherman. He missed the tank and hit the side of a house. There were no casualties. The next day, April 15th, the British 49th Infantry Division finally took Arnhem, and the 5th Canadian Armoured Division drove towards the Zyder Zee, Iselmere, to split the German forces in the Netherlands in two. The French 1st Army took Kehl in the Black Forest. The Americans captured the huge IG Farben chemical plant at Leverkusen, and the British liberated the Belsen concentration camp and freed 40,000 prisoners. They also found 10,000 unburied bodies, and the world was again shocked by fresh evidence of the Nazi brutality. Nuremberg, the site of infamous party rallies, fell to the Americans on April 20th, Hitler's last birthday. The Wehrmacht was dying, and its last battle was imminent. Chapter 12 Goethe Demerung on April 12th, the Red Army launched probes against Army Group Vistula and the 4th Panzer Army, on the left wing of Army Group Center. On April 14th, the 20th Panzer Grenadier Division prevented five Soviet divisions, supported by 200 tanks, from storming Zelo Heights west of Kustrin and inflicted heavy losses on the Soviets. But the probes continued. Then, on April 16th, Zhukov launched his main blow, pounding what he assumed to be the German front line with tens of thousands of guns, howitzers, cannons, mortars, airplanes, and multiple tube rocket launchers. Zhukov had so concentrated his batteries that in some areas there were 300 to 400 guns per mile. What Zhukov didn't know was that Heinrichsy had retracted the German front line by an average of a mile or two during the night. The red barrage struck thin air. After a three-hour bombardment and still under cover of darkness, the Russian assault divisions advanced into soggy earth that had been plowed by artillery fire. Heinrichsy's new battle line was completely intact. It cut down wave after wave of Soviet assault troops, and the entire Red Offensive degenerated into a mass of blood, confusion, 
death and disorganization. With the Soviet offensive stalled, Stalin could not resist meddling, and ordered General Vasily Sokolovsky, the chief of staff of the first Ukrainian front, to commit the first and second guards' tank armies to the attack, which added to the tangled mess, as red tanks maneuvered through mud and disorganized infantry. April 17th was another frustrating day for Stalin, Stavka, the Russian high command, Zhukov, and Sokolovsky. They committed the 47th Army of the 1st Belarusian Front's Reserve near Zilo, close to where the 1st and 2nd Guards tank armies had been committed, but Heinrichsy and Busa brought up two of their mobile reserve divisions, the 18th Panzer Grenadier and Panzer Division Münchberg, just in time. The Soviets captured Zilo Heights after the 20th Panzer Grenadier ran out of ammunition and much of the division was slaughtered, but the German second line of defense held, and the Reds were kept to minor gains. The young men of the 9th Parachute Division not only held their line, but knocked out 40 Soviet tanks, despite suffering 30% casualties. On April 18th, Zhukov again tried and failed to break through. Soviet casualties were so heavy that by the end of the day, supply and service troops were thrown into the battle. Zhukov threatened that any soldier failing to advance would be executed. South of Army Group Vistula, however, the Soviets found more success. On April 16th, Konev's 1st Ukrainian Front attacked General Fritz Hubert Grazer's 4th Panzer Army. By nightfall, the Soviets had 37 fixed and pontoon bridges and were operating ferries for infantry across the Nysa River. On April 17th, Konev moved the tanks of the 3rd and 4th Guards tank armies across the river, and on April 18th advanced to the German strong points of Spremberg and Kotbus. He bypassed Spremberg and severed connections between Army Group's center and Vistula, which German counterattacks could not restore. April 18th was a day of optimism at Fuhrer headquarters. Hitler believed that the Soviet offensive had substantially run its course. However, most of this optimism was based on Field Marshal Keitel's dubious rule of thumb that offensives stalled if they did not achieve a major breakthrough within three days. On April 19th, however, the 1st Belarusian Front pushed as far as Münchberg. The 2nd Guards tank army broke through west of Vritzen, and separated the German Ninth Army from the Third Panzer Army, and the Soviet Third and Fourth Guards tank armies pushed towards Zosen and Potsdam. Heinrichsy, with Hitler's permission, moved Berlin's battle-worthy formations to the Ninth Army's front. By now, however, the Third Guards tank army was across the Spree and advancing on Berlin. Field Marshal Ferdinand Schoerner, meanwhile, reinforced the 4th Panzer with four divisions and signaled Berlin that he hoped to halt the Soviets' southern thrust at Bautzen, about a hundred miles south of Berlin. During the night of April 19th to 20th, after a day of very hard fighting, two armies of the 1st Belarusian Front broke through Heinrichsy's third line of defense, and the Second Guards Tank Army reached open country. The offensive was far behind schedule, but Zhukov had at last achieved his breakthrough. The Soviets had been surprised by the tenacity of the defense and had been especially surprised by the courage and stubbornness of the Volkssturm. In the West, these formations were a joke. In the East, however, they were defending their families against the Red Terror which they knew meant the rape and perhaps the murder of their women, forced deportations to Siberia, and slavery or death. Cold, frightened, and lonely in their foxholes, trenches, or bunkers, these civilians in uniform, old men and boys, were tenacious defenders against Soviet infantry and armored units. Grandfathers often occupied the same foxholes as their grandsons. 
Instead of running away or surrendering, as in the West, they clung to their Panzerfausts, the one weapon they had in abundance, let the Russian tanks rumble to within easy range of their positions, and then knocked them out by the hundred. Despite the resistance of the Volkssturm, the Ninth Army had no more mobile reserves, and Zhukov pushed into the northern outskirts of Berlin, reaching Ladeburg and Zepernik by daylight. Konev had done a much better job of controlling his forces than had Zhukov, and on April 20th, his third and fourth guards tank armies pulled away from the left flank of Army Group Center. By the end of the day, he had pushed north of Jüterburg, where he captured probably the largest remaining ammunition depot the Wehrmacht had left, and was closing in on a new German line ten miles south of Zosen. This line was hastily organized by General Raimann, who had been relieved as Commandant of Berlin, but it amounted to no more than a screen and certainly would not hold for long. The twin breakthroughs of Zhukov and Konev isolated Ninth Army. On the morning of April 20th, General Busse reported that the only way he could maintain a solid line east of Berlin was to pull back from the Oder and the area south of Frankfurt. Hitler, however, refused to allow it. Heinrichsy therefore moved SS General Felix Steiner's ad hoc command, Group Steiner, north of Berlin to take command of the weak units on the exposed southern flank of General Manteuffel's 3rd Panzer Army. Three Soviet armies heavily attacked the 3rd Panzer Army in the Mecklenburg sector, but were turned back. On April 20th, 1945, Hitler celebrated his 56th birthday. At the Führer conference that day, General of Flyers Karl Kohler, the chief of the general staff of the Luftwaffe, announced that anyone intending to leave Berlin for Bavaria would have to depart soon, as the city's roads south would soon be in enemy hands. Admiral Dernitz, to whom Hitler had given command of the Reich's northern forces, could not decide whether to leave Berlin. How can I call upon the troops to undertake the decisive battle for Berlin if at the same moment I withdraw myself to safety? He asked Hermann Göring. I shall leave it to fate whether I die in the capital or fly to Obersalzberg at the last moment. By the end of the conference, according to Speer, Göring seemed utterly distraught announcing that he and General Koller had to leave Berlin urgently to deal with matters in the South. Hitler stared at him absently and told him he could leave, but General Koller needed to remain at Führer headquarters. The two shook hands in icy silence, and the fat one departed. They never saw each other again. Himmler also left, heading for Hohenlichen in northern Germany, and Grand Admiral Dönitz left for Plön in Schleswig-Holstein late that night, leaving Vice Admiral Hans Erich Voss as his liaison officer with Führer headquarters. Dönitz was joined two days later by General of Infantry Eberhard Kinzel, the newly appointed Chief of Staff of OKW Command Staff North, and an experienced General Staff Officer. Kinzel was succeeded as Chief of Staff of Army Group Vistula by Major General Ivo Tilo von Trotta, the Chief of the Operations Branch of OKH since late March. Jodl's deputy, Lieutenant General August Winter, who was to be Chief of Staff of OKW Command Staff B, the Southern Command Post, also departed for Bavaria on April 20th, along with most of the essential members of the OKW operations staff and the operations branch of OKH. Field Marshal Kesselring, the OB Vest, was placed in charge of all forces south of Berlin. That night, the 3rd Guards Tank Army captured Zosen, the headquarters of the High Command of the Army since August 1939, the 4th Guards Tank Army advanced west into the area of Luchenwalde, and Konev, with much of the Soviet army still pinned down in heavy fighting at Spremberg and Kotbus, brought up another army, the 28th, to cover gaps in the Soviet offensive. 
The first Russian artillery shells landed in Berlin on April 21st. Hitler, meanwhile, found a new source of hope, Group Steiner. Although it only had about 15,000 men, the Fuhrer quickly magnified it in his imagination into an army-sized command and ordered it to take charge of the 25th Panzer Grenadier, 5th Jaeger, and 4th SS Panzer Grenadier Divisions, all north of the Fino Canal, and the 56th Panzer Corps, east of Berlin, near Werneuchen. He upgraded Group Steiner to Army Detachment Steiner, took it from Army Group Vistula, and placed it directly under the command of OKW, which meant himself, and ordered that it fight its way to the 56th Panzer Corps to seal the gap exploited by Zhukov's forces. To Steiner's orders, he added a personal note. Officers who do not accept this order without reservation are to be arrested and shot instantly. You yourself I make responsible with your head for its execution. Hitler had ordered Steiner to attack with four divisions, but the SS general had only one he could deploy, the weak 4th SS Panzer Grenadier, which had lost most of its heavy equipment in the Battle of Danzig. He had been assigned the 3rd Marine Division, made up of sailors with little training in ground combat, but it had not yet arrived from the coast to relieve the 5th Jaeger and 25th Panzer Grenadier. Since he only had one division for the attack, Steiner wisely decided not to move at all. 4th Panzer Army did advance on April 21st. It was a purely local counterattack northwest of Gerlitz, and it made some progress, but Hitler quickly saw in it the beginnings of a major thrust that would close the gap between army groups Center and Vistula, a chasm now 40 miles wide. He ordered 4th Panzer to continue with the counterattack and instructed 9th Army to attack as well, eliminating the gap between them and cutting off most of the 1st Ukrainian front in the process. In Berlin, Adolf Hitler was oscillating violently between optimism and reality. When Keitel and Jodl visited the Fuhrer bunker that afternoon, they found Hitler in despair. He told his longtime OKW cronies that he now intended to remain in Berlin until the end. If there had to be any negotiating with the enemy, Goering was better suited to do it than he. This time, neither general was able to lift the spirits of the dictator. The Red Army was already in the eastern suburbs of Berlin. Zhukov had crossed the main Autobahn ring north of the city with three armies, and the Third Guards Tank Army had reached Königswusterhausen, well in the rear of Busse's Ninth Army. Still, the Eighth Guards and First Tank Armies were checked east of Berlin and had suffered heavy losses, especially in tanks, in attacks against the Volkssturm. Local counterattacks from regular German infantry units had driven Soviet casualties even higher. Meanwhile, Major General Bieler, the commandant of Fortress Frankfurt, had fully justified Heinrichs' confidence in him and had pinned down two Soviet armies, while the Russian 61st and Polish 1st Communist armies on the northern flank of the 1st Belarusian Army had gained nothing in attacks against Army Detachment Steiner. Jodl told General Koller what Hitler had said about Goering as a negotiator, and Koller immediately assumed that Goering would soon be negotiating peace with the Allies. Tremendously excited, he telephoned Goering at Berchtesgaden and, over a scratchy line, told him this latest development. A few minutes later, Colonel Bernd von Brauchitsch, Goering's chief adjutant instructed Koller to personally report to the Reichsmarshal. Koller drove to Gatto Airfield and that night flew out of the impending encirclement of Berlin, along with several other members of the Fuhrer's entourage, heading for Bavaria. On April 22nd, Hitler again assumed personal command of Berlin's defenses. He named General of Engineers Walter Kunze and Colonel Ernst Ketter, the National Socialist Leadership Officer at OKH, as his deputies. 
While Zhukov's right wing crossed the Hafel at Hennigsdorf and moved south against Potsdam to complete the encirclement of Berlin, Hitler waited impatiently for a report on the progress of the Steiner Offensive. During the afternoon situation conference, he learned that the SS general had not attacked. Hitler snapped, and in a crying rage, he, for the first time, declared that the war was lost, a fact he blamed exclusively on his generals. He intended to remain in Berlin until the end, he declared, and would commit suicide at the last possible moment. He would not let the Russians take him alive. Anyone who wanted to leave for Obersalzberg could do so, he shouted, but he was staying here in Berlin. Keitel and Jodl pledged to stand by him until the last. Others were more pragmatic. Julius Schaub, his longtime personal adjutant, elected to depart, as did Hitler's two stenographers, two of his five secretaries, Admiral von Puttkammer, Major General Eckhart Christian, the chief of operations of the Luftwaffe, and quite a few others. Among those to leave was Dr. Theodor Morell, his personal physician. I don't need drugs to see me through, were Hitler's last words to Morell. Hitler's depression was short-lived, after all. Jodl noted that the 12th Army, facing west on a line southeast of Magdeburg, was not yet fully engaged with the Americans. Hitler saw another glimmer of hope and demanded that the Twelfth Army be brought to Berlin. He would stand or fall in the city. I will never leave Berlin, never, he shouted at Keitel and Bormann later that afternoon. As if to emphasize his decision, Hitler sent for his personal papers, sorted them, and decided which ones to destroy. His personal adjutant Schaub, took them into the chancellery garden, burned them, and then left for Gatto Airfield. Hitler also asked Josef and Magda Goebbels to move into the Führer bunker, along with their six children. They occupied the rooms just vacated by Dr. Morell. The Reds continued to advance. The second Belarusian front against tough opposition from Manteuffel's third panzer army established a bridgehead ten miles long above Stettin. To the south, Konev's armies finally took Kotbus and smashed the Ninth Army's front south of Frankfurt. When Krebs talked with Heinrichsy on the telephone at 9 p.m., the chief of the general staff was full of optimism that General Walter Wenck's Twelfth Army would reach Berlin and save the Reich. Heinrichsy, however, disagreed and was instead looking to preserve the Wehrmacht's strength. He asked permission to pull Ninth Army back at least 20 miles to the west. Three hours later, Hitler authorized Heinrichsy to withdraw the Ninth Army to a line stretching from north of Kotbus to Liberosa, Bisco, and the Spree, a position that he thought would assist his plans for the Twelfth Army. When Hitler made the decision to order Twelfth Army to relieve Berlin, Keitel volunteered to hand deliver the order to Wenck. Jodl left at the same time to set up a new OKW command post at Krampnitz. Krebs remained behind as Hitler's principal military advisor. Early in the morning of April 23rd, Keitel turned up at Wenck's headquarters and ordered the astonished general to leave the Elbe, turn his army around 180 degrees, and head east, toward Uterbolk and Potsdam. This order could have been issued several hours earlier had Keitel remained in Berlin and used the telephone. In any case, Wenck turned his back on General Simpson's U.S. Ninth Army and marched east toward Potsdam and Berlin. Meanwhile, General of Infantry Theodor Busse, commanding the German Ninth Army, signaled General of Artillery Helmut Weidling to use his 56th Panzer Corps to retreat to a line from Königs Wusterhausen to Rangsdorf, about twelve miles south of Berlin, to protect the Ninth Army's left flank as it tried to escape the Soviet juggernaut. But when Hitler learned of the order, he cancelled it. At approximately the same time in Bavaria, Karl Koller arrived at Hermann Göring's house at Berchtesgaden and told the Reichsmarschall that it was time to negotiate with the Allies. Goering was uncertain. 
Bormann is my deadly enemy, he said. He is only waiting to get me. If I act, he will call me a traitor. If I don't, he will accuse me of having failed at the most difficult hour. After some vacillation, he, Hans Lammers, the chief of Hitler's presidential chancellery, and Koller wrote a dispatch which they sent to Berlin. It read, Mein Führer, since you are determined to remain at your post in Fortress Berlin, do you agree that I, as your deputy, in accordance with your decree of 29 June 1941, assume immediately total leadership of the Reich with complete freedom of action at home and abroad? If by 10 p.m. no answer is forthcoming, I shall assume that you have been deprived of your freedom of action. I will then consider the terms of your decree to have come into force and act accordingly for the good of the folk and the fatherland. You must realize what I feel for you in these most difficult hours of my life, and I am quite unable to find words to express it. God bless you and grant you may come here after all as soon as possible. Your most loyal Hermann Goering. When the telegram arrived, it was handed to Martin Bormann, who immediately tried to distort and falsify its meaning. Goering's engaged in treason, he shouted. Hitler, however, was in one of his apathetic moods, and Bormann could not arouse his anger. It took some time, but Bormann succeeded in convincing Hitler that Goering was attempting a coup d'etat when word arrived that Goering had ordered von Ribbentrop to report to Berchtesgaden, if Hitler did not answer Goering's original message by midnight. Hitler threw off his lethargy and, Speer recalled, an outburst of wild fury followed in which feelings of bitterness, helplessness, self-pity, and despair mingled. With flushed face and staring eyes, Hitler ranted, I've known it all along. I know Goering is lazy. He let the Luftwaffe go to pot. He was corrupt. His example made corruption possible in our state. Besides, he's been a drug addict for years. I've known it all along. Then suddenly, like a deflated balloon, he slumped back into a chair. Well, all right, he said, returning to apathy. Let Goering negotiate the surrender. If the war is lost, it doesn't matter who does it. Bormann, however, pressed Hitler, and before 10 p.m., Hitler forbade Goering from negotiating a surrender, charged him with high treason, and dismissed him from his offices. Bormann wanted Goering executed, but Hitler spared him in view of his previous services to the Reich. The next morning, April 24th, Radio Hamburg announced, Reichsmarschall Hermann Goering is suffering from heart disease, which has now reached an acute stage. He has therefore asked to be relieved of the command of the Luftwaffe and resigned all of his offices. The broadcast announced that the Fuhrer had named Robert Ritter von Grime as his successor and had promoted him to the rank of Field Marshal. On April 24th, at the headquarters of the 6th Air Fleet in the Oberführing Freimann section of Munich, Ritter von Grimm received an order instructing him to report to the Führer bunker. At Berchtesgaden, General Koller, now released from SS custody, received a similar telegram. Koller refused to go. He believed it was suicidal to fly to Berlin. Grimm, on the other hand, was a devoted Nazi. He and Hannah Reich, a daredevil test pilot, and one of the few women to hold the Iron Cross, flew to Berlin on April 26th. En route, with Grime at the controls, they flew over and battled Grunewald. A Russian bullet tore through the floorboard of the airplane and struck Grime's right foot, shattering it. Reich then took the controls and landed on a street near the Brandenberger Tor and the Chancellery. They quickly commandeered a passing car and took Grime to the bunker, where he was rushed into surgery. While SS Colonel Dr. Ludwig Stumpfeger dressed Grimes' wound, Hitler came into the room and asked the Colonel General if he knew why he had been summoned. When Grimes said he did not know, Hitler answered, Because Hermann Goering has betrayed both me and his fatherland. Behind my back he has established connections with the enemy. His action was a mark of cowardice. 
He went on to repeat the entire story and handed the offending telegram to Grime, calling it a crass ultimatum. As Grime read the telegram, Hitler threw another fit. Nothing now remains, he screamed. Nothing is spared me. No loyalty is kept, no honor observed. There is no bitterness, no betrayal that has not been heaped upon me. And now this, it is the end. No injury has been left undone. After a pause, Hitler regained his composure and informed the astonished Grime that he had called him to Berlin to appoint him commander-in-chief of the Luftwaffe and promote him to the rank of field marshal. This message, of course, could have easily been sent to him by radio, and then he would not have been lying on his back with a severe wound in doomed Berlin. On the afternoon of April 24th, Hitler summoned General Weidling, commander of the 56th Panzer Corps, to the Führer bunker. He greeted him with the words, Weidling, I will have you shot. He then launched into a vicious tirade against the general, who he said had retreated without permission. Weidling said he had been following General Buse's orders to withdraw. Hitler, who had not been aware of Buse's orders, calmed down, even became friendly, and a short time later named Weidling Commandant of Berlin. When General Krebs told him of his appointment, the tough veteran of the Eastern Front replied that he wished they had shot him instead. What bastards Krebs and Burgdorf are, Weidling snapped to his operations officer. They did not warn me that Hitler was threatening to have me shot. Busse and Burgdorf were brothers-in-law and close friends, which is possibly why Krebs and Burgdorf did not inform Hitler of Busse's order. General Weidling said he would accept the command on one condition. He must be the sole commander. He would not tolerate any interference from Dr. Goebbels, the Gauleiter of Berlin. It was a courageous thing for Weidling to do, his chief of operations recalled because generals simply do not impose conditions on the acceptance of an order from Hitler. But Hitler probably realized that Goebbels would otherwise be a problem for Weidling, and he accepted the condition. He was Berlin's fifth commandant in 1945. The next one would be General Alexander Gorbatov, a Russian. Just after nightfall on April 24th, the 56th Panzer Corps fell back to the east, into Berlin, in accordance with Hitler's orders, which virtually ensured that General Busse's Ninth Army would be encircled. That night, Busse told Heinrichsy that he had no ammunition for his artillery, but that using small arms, his men would attempt a breakout to the west. On April 24th, the 56th Panzer Corps included the remnants of the Panzer Division Münchberg, the 18th Panzer Grenadier Division, the 11th SS Panzer Grenadier Division Nordland, and elements of the 9th Parachute Division. It was also supposed to include the 20th SS Volunteer Grenadier Division Estonia No. 1 and the 20th Panzer Grenadier Division, but the former had gone missing and the latter had been virtually annihilated. Its commander, Major General Georg Scholze, had committed suicide after learning that his wife and children had been killed in an air raid. Already preparing for the defense of Berlin were the 1st Flak Division, which also manned the huge flak towers in the Tiergarten, the Humboldtine and the Friedrichshain, a naval battalion, part of Himmler's personal bodyguard, Oberführer Wilhelm Monke's SS guards, two police battalions, about 30 Volkssturm battalions, and a few labor and Hitler youth detachments. I was shocked when I found the prepared defense ring around Berlin, Major Knappa wrote later. It was empty foxholes and trenches and roadblocks, completely unmanned. Disgustedly, I realized that it was no more than a line on a map. It had been Goebbels' responsibility as defense commissar for Berlin to prepare these defenses, but it was painfully obvious that he had no idea how to do it. So much for Goebbels' ability to assume military command. 
General Heinrichsy, however, had planned for his armies to escape to the west all along, not to be trapped in Berlin. The 3rd Panzer Army did in fact bypass the city to the north, as did the 11th Army. But the 9th Army had been decisively engaged by the Soviets in the Halba sector, and most of it was not able to skirt the city to the south, as Heinrichsy had hoped. So be it, was Heinrichsy's attitude. He was out to save what he could. Heinrichsy and OKW pursued mutually exclusive objectives. Heinrichsy, realizing Berlin was doomed, concentrated on evacuating German soldiers and refugees to the west. Jodl and Keitel, however, blindly determined to defend Berlin as the Fuhrer willed. Early on the morning of April 25th, Weidling took over the headquarters of Wehrkreis III at Hohenzollern Damm in Wilmersdorf, a southwestern suburb of Berlin. The chief of staff of the military district, Lieutenant Colonel Hans Refior, was a general staff officer and an old friend of Weidling's, an officer who knew his way around the political jungle of Berlin and a man who knew how to get things done. Weidling decided to keep both his chiefs of staff, Refior for political matters and Lieutenant Colonel Theodor von Dufing, the chief of staff of the 56th Panzer Corps, for the actual fighting. He was less impressed with Major Sprota, the Wehrkreis operations officer, so he dispatched him to Potsdam. This was perfectly fine with Sprota, who wanted to get out of Berlin as quickly as possible. To turn everything over to me in an orderly manner would have taken several days, Weidling's operations officer recalled, so he showed me his maps and drawings with a sweep of his hand and promptly disappeared. Inside the city, SA and SS commandos and military police had set up flying courts martial. Some were members of General Wilhelm Monke's SS command, while others seemed to have been self-appointed. They grabbed soldiers who were away from the front without proper authorization and operating on the principle of better hang one too many than one too few, hanged or shot them with no regard for justice. Major General of Reserves Werner Mumert, the commander of Panzer Division Münchenberg, turned on these self-anointed executioners and threatened to shoot any of them who dared enter his area of operation. Late on the afternoon of the 24th, Konef and Zhukov linked their forces northwest of Potsdam. Berlin was now surrounded. On April 25th, the Reds completed the encirclement of the German Ninth Army, and the Soviet Fifth Guards Army met patrols of the U.S. First Army near the town of Torgau on the Elbe, 50 miles below Dresden. Germany was now cut in two. That afternoon, General Busse summoned Colonel Baron Hans von Luck, the commander of the 125th Panzer Grenadier Regiment of the veteran 21st Panzer Division, and ordered him to prepare to break out. During the night of April 25th to 26th, Luke was to strike westward across the Dresden-Berlin Highway, with the objective of reaching the Luckenwalde area on the Berlin-Leipzig Autobahn. At first, Luke made good progress, then he ran into Stalin tanks and anti-tank units. Despite assistance from elements of the 35th SS Police Grenadier Division, he was unable to make any further progress and was quickly pinned down by vastly superior Soviet forces. On the morning of April 27th, practically out of ammunition, the 125th Panzer Grenadier was forced to surrender. This was the fate that overtook most of the regiments of the 9th Army over the next several days. Southwest of Berlin, near the Hafel, Soviet artillery and fighter bombers had finally rendered the Gato airfield unusable. Hitler's capital could now be reached via emergency airstrips only. To the north, the 2nd Belarusian Front finally managed to break through the 3rd Panzer Army, and drove towards Prenzlau despite Baron von Manteuffel's desperate efforts to stop it. Senior OKW officers still made strenuous efforts to relieve Berlin and rescue the Fuhrer. 
As military historian Earl Ziemke noted, in Yodel and Keitel, Hitler had ideal collaborators in futility. During the night of April 24th to 25th, Hitler signed an order consolidating his general staffs, with OKW absorbing OKH. Yodel had finally achieved the goal he had pursued for ten years, a unified command of the German ground forces. But it was too late to matter now. For Hitler, the war had narrowed to the battle for Berlin. That evening, he signaled the new OKW command post at Neurofen and ordered it to launch the fastest execution of all relief attacks without regard for flanks and neighbors. Yodel issued a series of utterly unrealistic orders that simplified had the 9th and 12th armies advancing to Fersch, south of Potsdam, where they would join forces and drive to Berlin to rescue the Führer. Army Detachment Steiner was to attack toward Berlin with the 25th Panzer Grenadier, 3rd Marine, and 7th Panzer Divisions. Manteuffel's 3rd Panzer Army was ordered to prevent the Soviets from expanding their Oder bridgehead. On the Western Front, many divisions simply quit fighting. In the West, between April 1st and April 16th, more than 755,000 German troops surrendered. On April 16th, RAF bombers sank the pocket battleship Lützo at Schwinemünde, part of which is now Schwinemünde, Poland, and the U.S. First Army occupied Halle. The next day, the U.S. 30th Infantry Division took Magdeburg. The U.S. 7th Army began closing in on Nuremberg, the symbolic heart of Nazi Germany. The French First Army cut General Erich Brandenberger's 19th Army in two, and the U.S. 6th Corps raced for the Swiss border to block any possible German escape from the Black Forest. Organized resistance in the Ruhr pocket ended on April 18th, the same day that Nuremberg was surrounded, an American patrol entered Czechoslovakia, and the Canadians reached the Zyder Z, cutting Field Marshal Ernst Busch's OB Northwest in two and isolating most of its combat forces in eastern Holland. April 19th saw the British reach the Elbe, and two U.S. infantry divisions took Leipzig. Nuremberg fell on April 20th, and French troops entered Stuttgart, the home of Mercedes-Benz and the administrative heart of the Tsar. Many towns and smaller cities surrendered before the Allies even arrived. The Allied commander would simply learn the name of the Burgermeister of the next community, call him on the telephone, and arrange for a quick capitulation. By nightfall on April 23rd, the British had entered Bremen, the French had reached Lake Constance, Patch's U.S. 7th Army was sweeping along the Danube, and elements of Simpson's 9th U.S. Army had overrun the headquarters of the German 11th Army near Blankenburg and captured General Walter Lucht. Potsdam, the garrison town of Frederick the Great, was besieged by the Russians on April 24th, while the U.S. 1st Army Division took Ulm and the U.S. 7th Army crossed the Danube at Dilligen. On April 25th, Eisenhower ordered the Allied armies not to advance beyond the Elbe and Mulder rivers, effectively taking dozens of Allied divisions out of the battle for Berlin. The last strategic bombing raids of the war in Europe were flown against Pilsen, Vangaruga, Kiel, and Munich, while the former Italian naval base of La Spezia on the Ligurian coast was captured by the Allies. Brandenberger's forces in the Black Forest launched a desperate breakout attempt toward the Bavarian Alps on April 25th, but were checked by April 27th. On April 26th, Marshal Pétain of France was arrested as a collaborator, the last resistance in Bremen ended, and the Red Army captured Stettin and Brno, the capital of Moravia. On April 27th, Hitler signaled Mussolini, the struggle for our survival is at its height, employing great masses and materials Bolshevism and the armies of Jewry allied themselves to join their malignant forces in Europe in order to precipitate chaos in our continent. 
This was to be the last message between the two. Mussolini was captured and shot by Italian partisans the next day. Hitler learned of his death via a radio Stockholm broadcast. The U.S. 7th Army took Ulm on April 27th and Augsburg on April 28th and reached Munich the same day. Hitler, however, hardly took notice of these events. He was too engrossed in the Battle of Berlin and with good reason. By that time, the Russians were within a mile of the Reich Chancellery and the Fuhrer bunker. East and south of the city, Busse's Ninth Army moved from the Spreewald due west to Luckenwalde, suffering heavy losses to Soviet air attacks along the way because the roads were thick with soldiers and refugees. Field Marshal Schirner's southern offensive could not help the Ninth Army because it had stalled after six days, 40 miles south of its objective. To the north, the 25th Panzer Grenadier Division of Group Steiner had crossed the Hafel west of Oranienburg, and the 3rd Marine Division was strung out on the railroads between Oranienburg and the coast. The 7th Panzer Division, which had fought in the Battle of Danzig and had been brought to Schwinnemünde by sea only a few days before, had left its heavy equipment behind, did not have a single tank, and was now stuck in its assembly areas west of Neubrandenburg. Jodl ordered Lieutenant General Rudolf Holster's 41st Panzer Corps of the 12th Army to assist Group Steiner by attacking northeast from Belzig while covering the Elbe River line and defending Brandenburg to hold open the corridor between the Americans and the Russians. This was clearly asking too much of one weak corps that was too far west to help Steiner, but it took Jodl 24 hours to figure that out. Meanwhile, General of Cavalry Karl Erich Kühler's 20th Corps, earmarked to relieve Berlin, was forced to defend the brandenburg belzig wittenberg line to protect its staging areas. The Second Belarusian Front broke through the Third Panzer Army, which had committed its last reserves, late on the afternoon of April 26th and pushed west. That evening, the telephone line connecting OKW with Berlin went dead. Communications were now dependent on a line-of-sight shortwave that received and transmitted messages via a balloon run up near OKW's command post. The Russians contracted their ring around Berlin. They neared the Wehrkreis III building, and from their office windows, Weidling's staff officers could see hand-to-hand -hand fighting in the gardens to the south. Weidling prudently moved his headquarters to the Bendlerstrasse, or at least to what was left of it. By now, the Red Army was subjecting Berlin to almost constant shelling. Major Kanapa recalled how it seemed as if the whole world were exploding around us. Artillery fire, he declared, was much worse in a city than in open terrain, because there was much more flying debris which could be just as fatal as shrapnel. On April 27th, after a week's hard fighting, the armies of Rokossovsky's 2nd Belarusian Front were threatening to cut Manteuffel's 3rd Panzer Army in half. Heinrichsee ordered Manteuffel to withdraw from the exposed coastal area around Schwinnemünde and sent him the 25th Panzer Grenadier Division and part of the 7th Panzer Division. Keitel was horrified to discover that Heinrichsy was conducting an orderly withdrawal without the permission of the Fuhrer or himself. He echoed Hitler's order that the 9th and 12th Armies should unite and relieve Berlin in the battle that would be the decisive turning point of the war. To this, Keitel added, history and the German people will despise everyone who does not do his utmost to save the situation and the Fuhrer. On April 27th, with Rokossovsky's 2nd Belarusian Front threatening the vital communications center of Prenzlau, OKW activated the headquarters of the 21st Army to come to Prenzlau's defense. But the headquarters, under the command of General of Infantry Kurt von Tippelskirch, consisted of only two regiments and the former staff of the 4th Army and could do nothing to stop Rokossovsky's breakthrough. 
With Berlin's defenses crumbling, General Weidling presented Hitler with a plan to break out of the city. Hitler rejected it out of hand. A young general staff officer who had not seen Hitler in years remarked, I was shocked by his appearance. He was stooped and his left arm was bent and shaking. Half of his face drooped as if he'd had a stroke, and his facial muscles on that side no longer worked. Both of his hands shook and one eye was swollen. He looked like a very old man, at least twenty years older than his fifty-six years. It occurred to me then that Hitler was still the living symbol of Germany, but Germany as it was now. In the same six years, the flourishing, aspiring country had become a flaming pile of debris and ruin. The Führer was now suspicious of the SS and had lost faith in Steiner as a commander. He ordered that General Hoste, the commander of the 41st Panzer Corps, assume command of the offensive, which Hoste was in no position to do. Hitler's suspicions then turned to Gruppenführer Hermann Fegelein, the SS liaison officer to Führer headquarters. Hitler suddenly realized he had not seen him for some time. Fegelein was an arrogant, selfish opportunist and a womanizer, typical of the type of man who rose to prominence during the Nazi era. Born in Munich in 1906, he became a groom and then a jockey, working for Christian Weber, a notoriously corrupt friend of Hitler and one of his earliest cronies. By dealing in fraud and horse racing, and sometimes combining the two, Weber amassed a fortune after 1933 and helped his friend Fegelein rise in the world. Weber arranged for him to enter the SS in 1935 and helped him advance, first in the Death's Head SS Cavalry Standarte, and then in the SS Cavalry Brigade, which he commanded on the Eastern Front in 1941 and 1942. Physical courage seems to have been Fegelein's only positive character trait. Later, as an SS lieutenant general, he became Himmler's liaison officer to Führer headquarters. Shortly thereafter, in June 1944, he married Gretel Braun, the sister of Hitler's mistress, thus solidifying his position in the Führer's court. Fegelein then joined forces with Bormann and Burgdorf and began betraying his chief, Himmler, to Hitler on a routine basis. According to SS Major General Friedrich Schellenberg, it was Fegelein who advised Hitler to publicly dishonor the SS divisions that had failed in the Lake Balaton offensive. He also routinely cheated on Gretel. By April 1945, however, he realized that the end was near and, showing an instinct for survival, quietly disappeared from the Führer bunker on April 26th. Hitler did not miss him until late in the afternoon of April 27th. Inquiries were made at once, and one of Hitler's former bodyguards, SS Lieutenant Colonel Peter Hügel of the Reich Security Service, was ordered to find Fegelein. Hügel, accompanied by an armed detachment of SS, tracked Fegelein to his home in Charlottenburg, quietly resting on his bed, in civilian clothes and very drunk. Fegelein told Hergel that he chose survival over death and tried to persuade the SS lieutenant colonel to join him in flying out of Berlin. Though Hergel had a wife and family in Bavaria, he refused. Unruffled, Fegelein picked up the telephone, called Ava Brown, and asked her to smooth things over with the Fuhrer. This Ava apparently tried to do until she learned that Fegelein was planning to abandon Gretel and escape with one of his mistresses. When Hergel returned Fegelein to the Führer bunker, Hitler stripped Fegelein of his decorations, demoted him to the rank of SS private, and had him locked in a servant's room under armed guard. At 10.30 p.m., Baron von Manteuffel reported to Heinrichsy that half of his divisions and his flak artillery, which constituted almost all his remaining guns, had quit fighting and 100,000 men were streaming to the west to surrender. He had never seen anything like it, he said, not even in 1918. He then categorically stated that the war was over. The soldiers had spoken. Heinrichsy did not correct him.
By nightfall, Berlin was a sea of flames. The Russians had succeeded in surrounding Raymond's forces in Potsdam and had pushed Weidling's defenders into a pocket 9.5 miles long, east to west, and one to three miles wide. On the morning of April 28th, Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel set out for the front. To his consternation and dismay, Heinrichs was apparently not following orders. Keitel found the 5th Jaeger Division was backed onto a defensive line on the Hoffel River at Zedenich, 20 miles west of where it should have been. That afternoon, Keitel met with Heinrichs and Manteuffel. By now, Jodl had spoken to Heinrichs and threatened him with the ultimate consequences if he did not execute his orders. Keitel ordered Army Group Vistula to counterattack southeast of Neusterlitz. Heinrichs returned to his headquarters. It took him three hours to cover twenty miles because the roads were so clogged with refugees and retreating soldiers, knowing that his orders were impossible. The troops, he observed, were marching home in columns. To the south, in what became known as the Battle of the Halba Pocket, Ninth Army's breakout attempt failed. Busa signaled that his army was too depleted to make another attempt and could not hold out much longer. Weidling's forces were in no better shape. During the day, 56th Panzer Corps was forced to retreat across the Spree from the southeastern suburbs. Military historian Earl Ziemke has noted that the battle for Berlin was fought mostly outside the city, and what went on in the capital was hardly more than a contested mop-up. The fortress of Berlin had never come into existence. This is true, but the Russians nevertheless suffered very heavy losses inside Berlin. Taking advantage of their knowledge of Berlin's streets, alleyways, byways, sewers, and interconnected basements, enterprising defenders, mostly Hitler youth, kept appearing behind the Soviets, firing Panzerfaust rounds at nearly point-blank range at the back of Russian tanks where the armor was weakest, and then disappearing only to repeat the performance on another street. Konev's divisions alone lost 800 tanks to these tactics, and Zhukov's tank losses must have easily exceeded 1,000. Many Soviet soldiers were already drunk, which added to the casualty lists on both sides. The Red Army committed countless atrocities against the civilian population of Berlin, including untold numbers of rapes and murders. It was later estimated that four out of every ten women in Soviet-occupied Germany were raped, and many contracted venereal diseases as a result. On April 28th, the propaganda ministry informed Hitler of a Reuters report that Himmler wanted to negotiate with the Western powers, using Count Bernadotte of Sweden as an intermediary. Hitler grew even more furious at the SS and the world in general. He raged like a madman, Hannah Reich recalled. To Hitler, this was the last straw. Even der Treue Heinrich, the faithful Heinrich Himmler, leader of the SS, had deserted him. Surely the end had come. That night, he expelled Himmler from the Nazi party and abolished Himmler's claim to be the Fuhrer's successor. Hitler was now convinced that the failure of the Steiner Offensive and Himmler's treachery were connected. Since he could not take his revenge on the absent Reichsfuhrer, he decided to take it on Fegelein. Hitler quickly set up a tribunal to try Fegelein and any other Himmler co-conspirator he might discover. The members of the court included SS Oberfuhrer Wilhelm Monke, the Commandant of the Reich Chancellery, SS Lieutenant General Johann Rottenhuber, Chief of the Reich Security Service, Hitler's personal security forces, Krebs and Burgdorf. Fegelein was condemned in record time. His sentence, death by SS firing squad in the Chancellery Garden. With Fegelein dead, Hitler ordered Ritter von Greim and Hanna Reich to fly out of the Führer bunker. Grime was to arrest Himmler and arrange maximum air support for General Walter Wenck's 12th Army to come to the relief of Berlin. 
Above all, they were to ensure that Himmler did not take control of the country. A traitor must never succeed me as Führer, he cried to Grime and Reich. You must get out to ensure that he will not. After Grime and Reich left the bunker sometime between 1 and 3 a.m. on April 29th, Hitler rewarded Ava Brown for her years of loyalty by marrying her. Bride and groom knew that their marriage would last only a few hours. Following the wedding, Hitler dictated his last will and testament. He again denounced the Jews, exhorted the German people not to give up the struggle, and told them that while National Socialism was temporarily defeated, the seed has been sown that will grow one day into the glorious rebirth of the National Socialist movement in a truly united nation. He appointed Grand Admiral Karl Dönitz, President of the Reich and Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces, and appointed his ministers for him, thus continuing his interference in military affairs from beyond the grave. Among them was Ferdinand Schörner, who was promoted to field marshal and named commander-in-chief of the army. Hitler urged Dernitz to uphold the racial laws to the limit and to resist mercilessly the poisoner of all nations, international Jewry. It was now after 4 a.m. on April 29th, the last Sunday of his life. He went to bed with the Russians less than 600 yards from the Reich Chancellery. Shortly after midnight on April 29th, General Heinrichsee again spoke to Keitel on the telephone. Heinrichsee had been sternly forbidden to retreat, but he made it clear that he had no intention of obeying such an irrational command. The retreat was going to continue, he said. Keitel immediately relieved both Heinrichsee and his chief of staff, von Trotta, of their posts, but it took Keitel and Jodl all day to find a replacement for Heinrichsee. His permanent successor, Colonel General Kurt Student, was in the Netherlands and could not arrive before May 1st at the earliest. Keitel ordered Heinrichsi to have Manteuffel assume command, but Manteuffel refused to accept it, even when ordered by Keitel himself. Keitel then offered General of Infantry Kurt von Tippelskirk the command, but he likewise refused until confronted with a direct order. Thus, Tippelskirk became the commander of Army Group Vistula on the afternoon of April 29th. This formality had no effect on the battlefield. Communications with the Ninth Army and the 56th Panzer Corps had been irrevocably severed, and for all practical purposes, Army Group Vistula consisted of only the 3rd Panzer Army and two regiments of the 21st Army. Moreover, the Führer bunker had temporarily lost contact with OKW, Yodel, and Keitel after the Soviets spotted the communications balloon connecting the OKW command post to Berlin and shot it down. Wenck's 12th Army, meanwhile, made surprising progress on April 29th. In the morning, General of Cavalry Karl Erich Kühler's 20th Corps struck Russian lines near Bielitz. They took the Russians by surprise and quickly smashed the 5th Guard's mechanized corps. Kühler recaptured Bielitz, freed more than 3,000 wounded German soldiers who had been taken prisoner, and by afternoon the Clausewitz, Scharnhorst, and Theodor Kerner divisions of 20th Corps had surged forward 15 miles and reached the tip of Schwilo Lake southwest of Potsdam. Benk, however, realized that to continue the advance to Berlin, twenty miles away, was clearly impossible, so he called a halt to the drive. That night, General Raymond led the Potsdam garrison out of the pocket, crossing Lake Schwilo by rowboat. During the breakout, Major General Gustav Adolf von Wulfen, the city commandant since 1939 and a pour le holder from the First World War, was mortally wounded. Swarms of Soviet fighter bombers kept the Ninth Army from moving during the daylight hours of April 29th. That night, guided by radio transmissions from 20th Corps, 
Several elements of the army infiltrated through weak spots in the Soviet lines and reached the Twelfth Army and safety. Though they brought with them no guns, not a single tank, and some had even thrown away their rifles because they were out of ammunition. Those who did not make it out on the night of April 29th to 30th lay low in the forests the following day and tried to infiltrate to the west during the night of April 30th to May 1st. In all, 30,000 soldiers escaped, along with an unknown number of refugees. Counting the wounded who had already been evacuated, perhaps 40,000 of the Ninth Army's 200,000 men escaped. General Busa was among those to get away, but his chief of staff, Major General Johannes Hutz, was killed, as was SS Colonel Rudiger Pipcorn, the commander of the 35th SS Police Grenadier Division. Except for the 56th Panzer Corps, which was hopelessly surrounded in Berlin, the Ninth Army had ceased to exist. Shortly before midnight on April 29th, Hitler dispatched his last message which consisted of five short questions. One, where are Venk's spearheads? Two, when will they attack again? Three, where is the Ninth Army? Four, where is it breaking through? Five, where are Holster's spearheads? Keitel signaled that, one, Venk was stopped south of Schwilo Lake and facing strong Soviet attacks along his whole eastern flank. Two, Twelfth Army could not fight its way to Berlin. Three, Ninth Army was encircled. Four, one of its panzer groups had broken out to the west, but its location was unknown. Five, Holster had been forced onto the defensive from Brandenburg to Kremen. In short, no attack was progressing toward Berlin at any point. There would be no miracle. Berlin was doomed, and so was the Fuhrer. The Death of a Dictator Hitler's last military conference began at 10 p.m. on the night of April 29th. Present were Hitler, Goebbels, Bormann, Krebs, Burghoff, Ambassador Waltul Hevel, Ribbentrop's liaison officer to Führer headquarters, Admiral Foss, and General Weidling. Weidling gave a briefing on the military situation. The Russians had advanced almost as far as the ruins of the air ministry. They would be in the chancellery by May 1st at the latest. Now, he said, was the last possible moment for the 56th Panzer Corps, the last remaining military unit defending Berlin, to break out of the city. Hitler, however, stated that this was already impossible. As usual, there was no argument. After the conference, Hitler ordered that no one in the bunker was to go to sleep until further word from him. This was taken to mean that the time for farewells was at hand. He instructed his secretary, Traudel Junge, to destroy the papers remaining in his files. He retired to his private quarters until about 2.30 a.m. on April 30th, when he walked into the central dining passage, where about 20 people mostly women, were assembled. Accompanied by Bormann, he shook hands with each person but said nothing or else mumbled inaudibly. Some present suggested that he was drugged and that was probably the case. According to all accounts, there was a certain faraway misty look in his eyes as he approached the edge of eternity. After Hitler returned to his quarters, the tension broke. The staff members went into the canteen in the servants' bunker to smoke, drink, play loud music, and dance. The music grew so loud that a messenger from the Führer bunker arrived to ask them to turn it down. He was ignored. Class distinctions melted away. SS General Rottenhuber, the chief of the SS guards, was seen cordially slapping a tailor on the back and treating him like an old friend. They danced and frolicked until well after dawn. Meanwhile, the Russians had reached the eastern end of the Tiergarten and had pushed into the Potsdamer Platz. They were only one block away. By noon on April 30th, the Soviets had captured the underground railway tunnel in the Friedrichstrasse, 
part of the Vossstrasse, which was very near the Chancellery, and the entire Tiergarten, and had reached the Weidendammer Bridge over the Spree. Hitler received these reports without displaying emotion. At two o'clock p.m., he had lunch. Frau Hitler apparently had no appetite, so Adolf ate his usual two fried eggs and mashed potatoes with two of his secretaries and his cook, as was his custom when not accompanied by Eva. The dictator was unusually quiet, but there was nothing unusual about the conversation. Hitler said nothing to indicate that it was his last meal. He finished his lunch about 2.30 p.m., went into his suite and emerged one last time with Eva Braun. They said their goodbyes to Bergdorf, Krebs, and the rest of the entourage. The Fuhrer and his wife returned to their rooms. A few moments later, a revolver shot rang out. Everyone expected a second shot, but none came. After waiting several minutes, they entered Hitler's quarters. They found Hitler's body sprawled on the sofa, dripping blood. He had shot himself through the mouth. Ava Brown lay at his side. She had swallowed poison and had not used her pistol. It was 3.30 p.m. on Monday, April 30th. Hitler's body and that of his wife were soaked in gasoline and burned in a shell crater in the Chancellery Garden. The mourners, headed by Goebbels and Bormann, retired to the shelter of the emergency exit, stood at attention and raised their right hands in a farewell Nazi salute as the flames consumed the bodies. The ceremony was cut short by a Soviet artillery barrage. The Red Army had stormed the Reichstag, and were about a quarter of a mile from the Führer bunker. Grand Admiral Dönitz, who was in command of all armed forces in northern Germany, received a telegram from Martin Bormann that Hitler had appointed Dönitz his successor, though he did not tell him Hitler was dead. Dönitz was flabbergasted by this completely unexpected development. He had expected Himmler to be the successor. In fact, only two days before, he had visited the Reichsfuhrer SS and offered him his support. Dönitz had absolutely no desire to succeed the Nazi dictator, but orders were orders. Thinking that Hitler was still alive, he sent him a message of acceptance and pledged his unconditional loyalty. Bormann had hoped to escape Berlin and reach Dönitz's headquarters at Plön. But now he and Goebbels hit upon another idea they would negotiate with the Russians. On hand was the perfect representative, General Hans Krebs, the former military attaché to Moscow and a man who spoke fluent Russian. At 1 a.m. on May 1st, Krebs, accompanied by Colonel Theodor von Dufing, the chief of staff of the 56th Panzer Corps, and a Russian-speaking Latvian lieutenant, appeared at General Vasily Chuikov's headquarters under a flag of truce. Krebs did not return to the bunker until noon. He reported that no agreement had been reached. The Soviets demanded a complete capitulation and would not grant an armistice, but would allow Dernitz to return to Berlin and assemble his government. At 3.15 p.m. on May 1st, Goebbels belatedly informed Grand Admiral Dernitz that Hitler was dead. That evening, the Goebbelses sent their children to bed early, and after they fell asleep, Magda murdered all six of them via fatal injection. After helping his wife kill their children, Goebbels shot himself, and Magda bit a poison capsule. An SS guard then pumped a make-sure bullet into each body, and SS men doused the corpses with gasoline. The Goebbels family were hastily and poorly burned. The Russians later found and identified the bodies without difficulty. After the death of Hitler and Goebbels, Wilhelm Monke became the real power in the Führer bunker. He had already ordered that Bormann be shot if he created the slightest difficulty. He didn't. It was Monke who planned and led an unsuccessful breakout during the night of May 1st to 2nd that ended with Monke. SS Major Otto Günther, Hitler's SS adjutant, Ambassador Walter Havel, and a wounded Hans Bauer, Hitler's pilot, hiding in a cellar with four women. 
The Soviets soon found them and forced them to surrender. Bauer was taken to a hospital where his leg was amputated. Havel committed suicide, but Bauer, Monke, and Güncher were imprisoned by the Soviets. Bauer and Monke were finally released in October 1955 and Güncher in May 1956. Sometime around 2 a.m. on May 2nd, Martin Bormann and SS Dr. Ludwig Stumpfeger committed suicide on the Invalidenstrasse Bridge. SS Lieutenant Colonel Peter Hügel, who arrested Fegelein and helped burn Hitler's body, died on May 2nd after he was shot and mortally wounded on the Weidendammer Bridge. The Soviets captured most of the rest of Hitler's entourage, with a few notable exceptions. Generals Krebs and Burgdorf committed suicide. On April 8th, about three weeks before his death, Burgdorf told Krebs, Ever since I took on this job nearly a year ago, I've put all my energy and idealism into it. I've tried every way I know to bring the army and party closer together. In the end, they accused me and the forces of being a traitor to the German officer class, and now I can see that those recriminations were justified, that my work was in vain, my idealism wrong, not only wrong, but naive and stupid. Krebs and Bergdorf probably shot themselves in the servants' bunker below the new chancellery on May 1, 1945. Their bodies were lost in the confusion accompanying the fall of Berlin, and their final resting places are unknown. Major General Erich Berenfinger, the 30-year-old commander of Defense Sector B, also committed suicide. He was a holder of the Knight's Cross with oak leaves and swords. Just after midnight on May 2nd, the Soviets received a Russian-language radio message from the 56th Panzer Corps asking for a ceasefire to negotiate a surrender. Permission was quickly granted. At 5 a.m. that morning, Helmut Weidling crossed the Landwehr Canal on a rope suspension bridge and officially surrendered Berlin and its garrison. About 70,000 exhausted defenders were taken prisoner. Fighting in the city, however, did not end completely until May 4th. Like many of his men, General Weidling spent the rest of his life in captivity. He died in Vladimir Prison, southeast of Moscow, in 1955. Chapter 13 The Surrenders Grand Admiral Karl Dönitz, now the president of Nazi Germany, set up his government, the Flensburg government, at the naval base at Flensburg on May 1st. His only goal was to play for time diplomatically and continue the war against the Soviet Union so that as many German soldiers and refugees as possible could escape to the West. He instructed the Wehrmacht to resist British and American forces only when they interfered with this objective. On May 2nd, Dönitz decided to avoid a general unconditional surrender by negotiating piecemeal army group-level surrenders. As a first step, he dispatched General Admiral Hans-Georg von Friedeburg, who had succeeded him as Commander-in-Chief of the Navy, to negotiate an armistice with Field Marshal Montgomery. Among other things, Friedeburg was instructed to ensure that Hamburg was spared from further Allied attacks. On April 30th, the day Hitler died, Munich fell to the Americans, the nearby concentration camp at Dachau was liberated, and 32,000 prisoners were released. On May 1st, Field Marshal Gert von Rundstedt was captured at Bad Tulz. On May 2nd, the war in Italy ended. Elements of the British Second Army reached the Baltic coast at Lübeck and Wismar. German General Günther Blumentritt, who commanded that sector, ordered no resistance to the British. General Kurt von Tippelskirk surrendered his 21st Army to the Americans and elements of the U.S. Ninth Army pushed east to Ludwigslust and Schweren, where they captured headquarters Army Group Vistula. 
General Student, who had just assumed command, escaped but surrendered a few days later. On May 3rd and 4th, the litany of Allied advances continued. The British captured Hamburg and the Americans took Berchtesgaden, Bavaria, and Innsbruck, Austria, and reached the Brenner Pass on the Austro-Italian border. General Hasso von Manteuffel surrendered his 3rd Panzer Army to the British on May 3rd. On the morning of May 3rd, Admiral von Friedeburg was escorted to Field Marshal Montgomery's headquarters on Lundburger Heide, Heath, about 30 miles southeast of Hamburg, accompanied by General Eberhard Kinzel, Chief of Staff of OKW Command Staff North. After a rather sharp greeting from Montgomery, Friedeburg read him a letter from Field Marshal Keitel offering to surrender Army Group Vistula which was currently engaged with the Russians. Montgomery saw through Friedeburg's game and quickly responded that German troops fighting the Red Army should surrender to the Russians. Of course, he added, any German soldiers who approached his lines with their hands raised would automatically be taken prisoner. Friedeburg did not realize that Monty had thrown him a diplomatic lifeline. Instead, he replied that it was unthinkable to surrender to the Russians. Montgomery retorted that he should have thought of that before June 1941. Montgomery then demanded that Friedeburg surrender all of the German forces in northern Germany, the Netherlands, Friesland, the Frisian Islands, Heligoland, Schleswig-Holstein, and Denmark. The admiral said he lacked the authority to comply with this request, but he was sure that Grand Admiral Dernitz would agree to it. Montgomery sent Friedeburg back to Karl Dernitz with the stipulation that the German surrender must be unconditional, as the Allied powers had agreed in their Casablanca declaration. Joining Dernitz in Flensburg were Speer, Keitel, Jodl, and, to his embarrassment, Himmler. The Reichsfuhrer SS had a large entourage and still commanded forces in northern Germany, so Dernitz tolerated him. But he did not have to tolerate Dr. Arthur Zeisinkwart, the Reichskommissionar of the Netherlands. Ignoring Hitler's appointment of Zeisinkwart as foreign minister, Dernitz appointed the Reich Minister of Finance, Count Lutz Schweren von Krosig, in his place. Schweren von Krosik was a gentleman, a Rhodes scholar, and had a reputation for conservative Christian leanings. He was certainly better suited than was Zeisinkwart, a Nazi politician, to deal with the Allies. Dernitz, of course, had no choice except to agree to Montgomery's demands. He instructed Friedeburg to sign the tactical surrender for northern Germany, Holland, and Denmark and then to meet with General Eisenhower at Reims and discuss the separate surrender of all German forces on the Western Front. When Friedeburg and four of his officers arrived on the Lüneburg Heath late on the afternoon of May 4th, Montgomery let them wait outside his command trailer in the rain while he prepared the surrender documents. Just before 6 p.m., Monty had the dejected admiral escorted into his presence and asked him if he was prepared to sign the surrender. Friedeborg nodded. He and Kinsel were taken to a tent, which had been set up for the ceremony. The instrument of surrender was signed at 6.20 p.m. Under its terms, the roughly one million German soldiers in the Netherlands, northwestern Germany, and Denmark were to lay down their arms at 8 a.m. the next day. Elsewhere, the mass surrenders continued. On May 4th, the U.S. 3rd Infantry Division occupied Salzburg. On May 5th, the Russians captured Schwinnemunde and Peenemunde on the Baltic Sea coast. The U.S. 3rd Army took Linz and closed in on the Czechoslovakian border. General of Infantry Friedrich Schultz surrendered Army Group G, Hermann Furch's 1st and Hans von Obstfelder's 7th Armies, to the Americans at Haar in Bavaria. General Erich Brandenberger surrendered the German 19th Army to the American 6th Corps, and U.S. troops captured Hans Frank, the former Governor General of Poland, 
and liberated a VIP prisoner column in Austria. Among those freed were former French premiers Édouard Daladier, Léon Blum, and Paul Reynaud, French generals Maurice Gamelin and Maxime Begon, Dr. Kurt Schuschnigg, the former Austrian chancellor, and the Reverend Martin Niemöller, the anti-Nazi Protestant church leader and World War I U-boat ace. While in the West, mass surrenders were the norm, in the East, matters could be more desperate. In Prague on May 4th, Czech partisans revolted against the German occupation and were joined by General Andrei Vlasov's Russian Liberation Army, a force of 50,000 men who, ironically, had once been German collaborators. The weak German forces in the city, an SS replacement training battalion, a few Luftwaffe detachments, and Lieutenant General Richard Baltzer's 182nd Infantry, formerly Reserve, division, were no match for them. General Baltzer was killed in the fighting, and most of the German survivors were soon surrounded near the Hradjin Palace or the Prague Rusin airfield. SS Lieutenant Colonel Otto Weidinger, the commander of the 4th SS Panzer Grenadier Regiment Der Fuhrer, part of the 2nd SS Panzer Division, fought his way to the airfield and rescued the garrison there. But on May 9th, before Weidinger could push on to the palace, General of Infantry Rudolf Toussaint, the commander of Wehrkreis Bohemia and Moravia, and the military commandant of Prague, surrendered. Most of his men were subsequently murdered by the partisans. The general himself died in a Czechoslovakian prison in 1968. The Soviets did not care that Andrei Vlasov's Russian Liberation Army had returned to the anti-Nazi fold. They were judged traitors. Vlasov and his men, even those who reached American lines, were rounded up by the Soviets. Vlasov was hanged, and his men were sent to slave labor camps or executed. For the German civilians still in Czechoslovakia, the end was horrible. Many were raped, tortured, and murdered by the partisans. Others were beaten and robbed. And nearly every German was driven from the country, forced to join unarmed refugee columns that were frequently attacked by Czech partisans. One man, a Sudeten German whose family had farmed the land near Zatz since the 16th century, recalled the behavior of the partisans. If we moved while standing in line, we were beaten with sticks or gun butts. Sometimes we were beaten for no reason at all. The girls were taken out and then stripped. Then the rapes began. Not just by one man of one girl, but the multiple rape of one girl by a whole group of men. There were also some of the rapists who had abnormal desires. When the attacks began, we rushed forward to show the partisans that we were determined to protect our women. Bursts of machine gun fire over our heads caused only a slight hesitation, and as we ran on, the Czechs opened fire with machine pistols and killed or wounded about forty of our group. We were flogged back with whips and clubs, and some of the wounded were bayoneted. It was a humiliating experience to be so helpless and to be able to do nothing to help the poor girls. Even now it makes me burn with a sense of outrage and shame. Another German recalled, We were told by loudspeaker that as German swine we were not wanted in Czechoslovakia and that we were to leave the Republic within 24 hours. We were allowed to take nothing with us except what clothes we stood up in. There would be no transport for German swine. Anyone who was left behind by the side of the road would be shot. Anyone found on Czech soil after 24 hours had elapsed would be shot. We were beaten constantly during the trek. When we reached the frontier, there was a whole mass of Czechs waiting. They fell on us like locusts, stealing whatever was left. Lots of them subjected our women to what they termed body searches, to see if they had any jewels concealed. You can guess the nature of those searches. Dernitz wanted to convince Eisenhower that Germans in the East should not be abandoned to communism, 
and that a simultaneous surrender of all fronts was not possible. He asked Yodel to present a new set of proposals to the Shafe commander, which aimed for separate surrenders, but held open the possibility of simultaneous surrenders. As part of this diplomatic offensive, Dönitz distanced his government from the Nazis and their crimes. He dismissed Heinrich Himmler and Josef Goebbels from their government posts, not knowing that Goebbels had already committed suicide. Himmler returned to his headquarters in good humor after being sacked, apparently he had been expecting it, and gave his staff its last order. Dive for cover in the Wehrmacht. This they did. Rudolf Hurs, the infamous commandant of the Auschwitz extermination camp, took on the identity of a bosun's mate at the Naval Intelligence School on the island of Zilt. Adolf Eichmann assumed the identity of a Luftwaffe corporal and peacefully surrendered to a U.S. unit. Later he became SS Lieutenant Otto Eckmann. In 1946 he escaped from prison and ended up in South America, where Israeli intelligence finally unearthed him in 1960. Himmler himself changed his name, put on an army uniform, shaved off his mustache, put a patch over one eye, and disappeared. Two weeks later, he was captured by the British. On May 23rd, he committed suicide, biting down on a cyanide capsule. Albert Yodel landed in Reims on the afternoon of May 6th and was ushered into the presence of U.S. Lieutenant General Walter Beadle Smith, chief of staff of Schaeff, who handled the discussions for Eisenhower. The OKW operations officer quickly realized that the Americans had liberated too many concentration camps to have much sympathy for Germans in the East, and General Smith categorically rejected the idea of a separate peace in the West while the Germans fought on against the Soviets. Smith ended the conference with an ultimatum. Either Yodel signed the instrument of unconditional surrender that day, or negotiations would be broken off, bombing would resume, and Western Allied lines would be closed to German refugees and troops hoping to surrender to the British or the Americans. He gave Yodel thirty minutes to decide. Yodel insisted on one concession, a forty-eight-hour delay between the signing of the instrument of surrender and the termination of hostilities. That would allow German forces and refugees in the East two days to make good their escape. Major General Kenneth Strong, Eisenhower's chief of intelligence, advised Ike to give Yodel the grace period he demanded. Eisenhower agreed. He would give Yodel 48 hours from midnight that night. Hostilities would end at midnight on May 8th to 9th. General Yodel signaled Dernitz, who denounced the terms as sheer extortion. Yodel, a firmer form opponent of unconditional surrender, recommended signing, which convinced Dernitz there was no alternative. At 1.30 a.m. on May 7th, Dernitz signaled Yodel authorization to sign the capitulation, ordered an end to all hostilities against the Western Allies at once, and instructed Generals Scherner, Rendelich, and Lür to rush their army groups to the west. The surrender ceremony took place at 2.30 a.m. on May 7th in the recreation hall of the École Professionnelle et Technique de Garçon, a modern three-story red-brick schoolhouse in Reims. Yodel signed for the Reich and Smith signed for the Americans. General Admiral Friedeburg represented the Navy, and Jodl's Luftwaffe adjutant, Major Wilhelm Oxenius, signed for the Air Force. The ceremony ended at 2.41 a.m. The 48 hours Jodl gained during the Rand's negotiations enabled tens of thousands of Germans to escape the Soviets. Typically, the Soviets insisted upon their own surrender ceremony. This took place in Berlin at 12.28 on the morning of May 8th, in the headquarters of the First Belarusian Front. Zhukov signed for the Russians. The senior German delegate was Field Marshal Keitel. Admiral Friedeburg represented the Navy, and Colonel General Horst Stumpf, 
the commander of Air Fleet Reich, signed for the Luftwaffe. Karl Hilpert's Army Group Courland, of course, did not have the option of surrendering to the Anglo-Americans. Dönitz and Friedeburg sent Hilpert every ship that could be spared and evacuated most of the 14th Panzer and 11th Infantry Divisions, the wounded, and up to 125 men, mostly family men, from each division of the 16th and 18th Armies. About 200,000 men, including SS and Luftwaffe personnel, were surrendered to the Soviets on May 9th. Many of them, like their commander, Colonel General Hilpert, and Luftwaffe Colonel General Kurt Flugbeil, whose Luftwaffe Command Kurland, formerly First Air Fleet, had supported the Army Group since 1941, never made it home, dying in Soviet prisons. Knowing that surrender to the Soviets could be a death sentence, some tried to escape to Sweden by sea and drowned in the Baltic or were captured and given to the Soviets. Some committed suicide rather than face a presumed future of slave labor. Others tried to reach Germany overland but were captured or killed in the Baltic states, like General of Waffen-SS Walter Kruger, the commander of the 6th Latvian SS Volunteer Corps, and a holder of the Knight's Cross with oak leaves and swords, who was killed by Soviet soldiers on May 22, 1945. Most of the Latvian, Estonian, and Lithuanian volunteers who joined the Wehrmacht were executed by the communists after they surrendered. In Poland, as elsewhere, the Soviets exacted a horrible vengeance. The Gauleiter of Breslau, Karl Hanka, had refused to surrender, even though the garrison troops were woefully short of food and ammunition. On May 4th, however, he learned that Hitler had named him Reichsfuhrer SS and chief of the German police and flew out of the city in an experimental helicopter to join an SS unit in Czechoslovakia. Though he had orders from Field Marshal Schirner to fight on, the Breslau Fortress Commander, General of Infantry Hermann Niehoff, took advantage of Hanke's departure to surrender at 2 p.m. on May 5th. If he had hoped for fair treatment, he was to be bitterly disappointed. The Red Army entered the city that same day, bent on revenge, including a vicious campaign of rape. It was as if we women were being punished for Breslau having resisted for so long, one woman recalled. General Niehoff spent the next ten years in solitary confinement in a Soviet prison. His men were sent to prisoner of war or slave labor camps in Siberia. Breslau's women worked clearing rubble for the Russians. The beautiful churches of St. Barbara and Mary Magdalene were razed to the ground. Communist Poland renamed the city Wrocław, and Germans who had not already been sent to Siberia were expelled. The isolated remnants of the Army of East Prussia, formerly the Second Army, had no chance of escaping Russian captivity. General of Panzer Troops Dietrich von Zalken surrendered its 100,000 men on May 9th. Zalken and many of his men spent the next ten and a half years in captivity, in Zalken's case, much of it in solitary confinement. Here he was tortured so badly by the communists that he spent the rest of his life in a wheelchair. On May 7th, Field Marshal Ferdinand Schirner ordered the commanders of Army Group Center to bring their men west and escape if they could. Then, dressed in a traditional Bavarian costume, he packed his briefcase with money and flew off to the Bavarian Alps. Absent his leadership, the Soviets captured much of Army Group Center, consisting of Fritz Hubert Grazer's 4th Panzer Army, Wilhelm Hasse's 17th Army, and Walter Nehring's 1st Panzer Army, and many of its men were massacred by Czech partisans. Schirner's chief of staff, Lieutenant General Oldwig von Natzmer, later testified that Schirner's courage deserted him, and that while he had appealed to Schirner not to flee, the field marshal thought only of himself and sacrificed Army Group Center. 
Lieutenant Helmut Dierning, Scherner's aide-de-camp, told an entirely different story to my friend, the late Theodor Friedrich von Stauffenberg. According to Dierning, Hitler had not only named Scherner commander-in-chief of the army, but had wanted him to assume command of the National Redoubt in the Bavarian Alps, where he would organize the last stand of Nazi Germany. In either case, Scherner never made it to Bavaria. His small airplane crashed in eastern Austria. He survived, but only to be captured later by the Americans and handed over to the Russians who imprisoned him as a war criminal. Released in 1955, he returned to his hometown of Munich. He died in 1973. On May 7th, Field Marshal Kesselring, commanding the German forces in the south, met with Colonel General Dr. Rendulich, Colonel General Lür, Major General Heinz Gedke, Chief of Staff of the Sixth Army, and other senior officers of Army Group Ostmark, formerly South, at the headquarters of General of Mountain Troops Julius Ringo, the commander of Wehrkreis 18 and the ad hoc Corps Ringo. Also present was Gauleiter Siegfried Uberreiter of Graz. Kesselring informed his commanders that a ceasefire with the Americans would take effect at 8 a.m. on May 7th. The Enns River, separating Upper and Lower Austria, had been approved as the demarcation line between the U.S. and Red Armies. Units hoping to escape Soviet captivity, Kesselring said, would have to cross the Enns by 9 a.m. on May 9th. The commanders of Rendelich's four armies, the 8th, 6th, 6th SS Panzer and 2nd Panzer, were to disengage their forces from the Soviets on the evening of May 7th. Army Group Ostmark was fortunate not to have been involved in heavy fighting since the Battle of Vienna and to have had time to prepare its escape. Some units were already thinning their lines. Every army commander's plan was, of course, heavily influenced by local terrain, road networks, and the position and reaction of the Red Army. Most of Rendelich's 430,000 men escaped. General of Artillery Maximilian de Angelis, for example, the commander of Rendelich's 2nd Panzer Army, moved west under a screen of artillery that blasted Soviet lines. It was almost 24 hours before the Russians realized that it had left. In Balk's 6th Army, the mobility of the 4th SS Panzer and 3rd Panzer Corps helped them escape despite poor roads in their sector, but the rear guard, the 1st Mountain and 9th Mountain Divisions, were sacrificed. About half of the 8th Army in northern Austria and the Budweis area of Moravia fell into Soviet hands, but the bulk of Zepp Dietrich's 6th SS Panzer Army reached American lines. Only the Fuhrer Grenadier Division and parts of the 3rd SS Panzer and 10th Parachute Divisions were captured by the Russians. The 180,000 men of Lurs Army Group E had faced a Yugoslavian partisan offensive since April. As Marshal Josip Broz Tito's partisan forces entered Trieste, Gorizia, and Tolmine on May 1st, Lur tried to pull his units back, but was hampered by the mountainous terrain, bad weather, poor roads, and lack of fuel that forced him to abandon 70% of his vehicles. The inexperienced 97th Corps, led by General of Mountain Troops Ludwig Kübler, tried to adopt a moving pocket strategy to avoid being pinned down, but was finally forced to surrender on May 6th. Yugoslav partisans surrounded one surrendered German regiment, and even before the regiment was fully disarmed, the partisan murder squads began shooting its officers. The regiment closed ranks and resumed battle. Eventually, it was able to fight its way across the Mur River and into Austria. When the German surrender took effect on May 9th, the vast majority of Army Group E was still south of the Mur and had to surrender to the Yugoslavians. They were then subjected to what has been called the Murder March or the Starvation March, or the March of Hate. They were forced to trek more than 1,300 miles. Every possession they had was stolen from them. 
They were attacked by thugs, and the guards were brutal. The death march lasted two months, and more than 60% of the Germans subjected to it died before 1945 was out. The communist partisans were equally brutal towards supporters of the independent Croatian government that had allied with the Germans and fielded three divisions for the Wehrmacht. By the end of May, the communists had murdered at least 110,000 Croatians, and as many as 200,000 might have been murdered by the end of 1945. On May 3rd, the Parliament of Slovenia, which had been occupied by Axis forces, met in Ljubljana, declared its independence, and asked King Peter to return from exile. Slovenia's defense force, however, totaled only 12,000 men. Tito sent in 14 partisan divisions to deal with the new republic, which was promptly overwhelmed. 1,500 people were slaughtered in a single atrocity. Colonel General Lure was subjected to what one officer called a flimsy trial and was hanged on February 16, 1947. General of Flyers Heinrich Dankelmann, the military commander in Serbia in 1941, was hanged on October 30, 1947, and General of Flyers Martin Fiebig, the Luftwaffe commander southeast, was hanged a few days later. General Kubler was also executed. General of Panzer Troops Gustav Fein, former commander of the Africa Corps, was simply murdered, as were several others. In the West, surrendering Germans felt reasonably confident that they would be well treated, but there were some exceptions, especially when it came to looting. The Germans, in fact, joked that USA stood for Urein Stelens Auch, watches also stolen. Zeiss Inquart was arrested in Hamburg on May 7th. On May 8th, Göring was captured near Fischhorn, Austria. Also on May 8th, Crown Prince Olaf of Norway, accompanied by British representatives, landed in Oslo to accept the surrender of the German forces in Norway. This mainly involved Franz Burma's 20th Mountain Army, which still controlled five corps, the equivalent of 14 divisions and 400,000 men. Shortly thereafter, Reichskommissar Dr. Josef Treboven went to his command bunker. Inside was the corpse of General of SS Wilhelm Redis, who had shot himself. Trebofen committed suicide by exploding dynamite. Vidkun Quisling, the puppet prime minister, surrendered to the Norwegian police on May 9th and was executed by a firing squad on October 24th. General Burma committed suicide in the Nuremberg prison in May 1947. The war in Europe officially ended at one minute after midnight on May 9, 1945, although some isolated German units in Czechoslovakia continued to resist for several more days. On May 9, after contemplating suicide, Kesselring finally surrendered, and Major General Rudolf Wolf surrendered the Channel Islands and his isolated 319th Infantry Division, which had been trapped behind enemy lines since the Allied invasion of Normandy. Other isolated garrisons at Lorient, Saint-Nazaire, La Rochelle, and Dunkirk also surrendered. The last German warship, the heavy cruiser Prince Eugen, docked at Copenhagen on May 9th and surrendered. It was the only major German warship to survive the war. Launched in 1938, it had seen as much action as any ship in the fleet. It had been bombed, torpedoed, struck with a mine, fought alongside the Bismarck, escaped, and took part in the Channel Dash and in the Baltic evacuations. It was later used as a target ship in the American atomic bomb tests and was finally destroyed near Bikini. The German forces on the Aegean Islands surrendered on May 11th, and the Crete garrison capitulated the next day. Zepp Dietrich was captured on May 12th, and Field Marshal Keitel was arrested at Flensburg on May 13th. He was succeeded as commander-in-chief of OKW by Alfred Jodl. The Allies needed Admiral Dernitz's government only so long as German forces remained at large, and it could help with surrenders and in the distribution of food. 
By the middle of May, its usefulness was coming to an end. During its existence, as many as two million soldiers and refugees had escaped from the east to the west. Jodl and Dönitz tried to extend their usefulness by condemning Nazi concentration and extermination camps. On May 15th, Jodl issued a directive in the name of the High Command of the Armed Forces denouncing the camps, and Dönitz decreed that German courts would try camp guards and administrators who had violated basic morality and justice. Schweren von Krosik sent a copy of the decree to Eisenhower, along with a cover letter asking him to let the Reich courts proceed. Ike did not reply. On the afternoon of May 22nd, the Allied Control Commission telephoned Flensburg and instructed Dernitz, Jodl, and Friedeburg to report to the liner Patria to meet with U.S. Major General Lowell W. Rooks, the chief of the commission, at 9.45 the following morning. Dernitz knew what this order meant and curtly ordered his people to pack their bags. He was right. The meeting was very brief. Rooks told them that Eisenhower had instructed him to call you before me this morning to tell you that he has decided, in concert with the Soviet High Command, that today the acting German government and the German High Command, with the several of its members, shall be taken into custody as prisoners of war. Thereby the acting German government is dissolved. The Germans returned to their quarters to fetch one suitcase of personal belongings for their trip into captivity. Among those arrested were Schweren von Krosik and Albert Speer. Two officers did not join them. General Kinsel, the chief of staff of OKW Command Staff North, and General Admiral Friedeburg, the commander-in-chief of the German Navy, committed suicide. Meanwhile, history turned a page. The Third Reich passed into what was. The war crimes trials were about to begin. This concludes the reading of The Death of Hitler's War Machine, The Final Destruction of the Wehrmacht, by Samuel W. Mitchum, Jr. Copyright 2021 by Samuel W. Mitchum, Jr. This book was read by Grover Gardner. This unabridged recording was published by arrangement with Regnery Publishing and was produced in 2021 by Blackstone Publishing, which holds the copyright. Neither this recording nor any portion of it may be reproduced or used for any purpose without prior written authorization from Blackstone Publishing. If you would like to obtain a monthly update telling you about new releases, call 1-800-SAY-BOOK. That's 1-800-729-2665. For a complete listing of our titles, visit our website at www.downpour.com. Thank you.